You might have heard the terms canonical AMP, native AMP, or AMP first floating around. And it's time to talk about using AMP as your primary development framework. Paul, this is great. Uh, but you are really cutting it close on your flight to Tokyo. Yeah, but it's kind of the whole point, uh, the whole theme of the conference. I mean, we need this video before the conference. You need to get to the conference. All right, that's good. I guess we'll just do it live. <laughs> All right, contrary to popular belief, AMP isn't just a format or channel that somehow is not the web. It's not an SEO thing. It's not a replacement for HTML. It's a web component framework that can and maybe should power your whole site. Reactions to this might go from, you fool to, yeah, right, you Google monkey too. Well, why doesn't it appear in framework comparison tables? And the latter one is actually an interesting one. Why doesn't it appear next to frameworks like React or Angular or Vue? The first reason that AMP isn't a JavaScript framework. It's a framework written in JS, but technically you're authoring the content in HTML, so it's an HTML framework. Now, HTML frameworks are nothing new, but people are not really considering them as a serious alternative yet. The second reason is that many compare AMP to RSS. And the media has positioned it as a competitor to certain other big companies' walled garden media formats. Now, that certainly didn't help. But we, the AMP team, have never told the story that way for what it's worth. Now, the web is already a great distribution format. And AMP just improves upon it by further accelerating delivery via AMP caches and, for instance, by inlining CSS. And third, most sites today are built as paired AMP. That's a technique that we allow that connects an existing non-AMP website with the AMP equivalent of the same site. Now, that really lowers the investment initially, but like packing a bag and then forgetting something that you had to pack later, so you have to add a second bag and then travel with two bags, it's the same with paired AMP. You now have to maintain two versions of the same site, and it was never really meant as an end state to AMP development. So where does that leave us? In the wrong place. Let's turn around. We want AMP to become a natural choice for modern web development, for everything content-related. For you to use AMP as a framework, because it truly makes you more productive. Now, we might not be there yet for everything, but it's our core mission. AMP is the main framework to use what is going on. AMP is the main framework to use the layout, the styling, and the content of the content to use what is going on. 裏で動く JavaScript は我々 AMP チームに任せてください。広報完成を保ちつつ、2週間ごとにアップデートされる最新のライブビューを提供します。Web フロントエンド開発は複雑になりすぎています。重要なのはあなたのユースケースにちょうど良い,いレベルの抽象度とフレキシビリティを持ったフレームワークを選ぶことです。AMP をフレームワークとして利用すると。あなたのカノニカなページもすべてアンプ化され、死にアンプファスなサイトになります。そしてアンプのみは使うことで、その最適化されたパフォーマンスや UX がテストプモバイルなどすべてのプラットフォームに展開されます。もちろん今すぐに既存のサイトをアンプ作り直すことができないケースもあるかと思います。ただアンプは昔と比べて多くの側面で進化を重ねていて、皆さんが何か新しいものを作る。際にはキットを役に立つことでしょう。動的にはステートバインをするアンパインド、リアルタイムなダータを扱うアンプリスト、そしてカスタムジャバスクリプトを実現するアンプスクリプトがある今、その可能性は無限です。そして新たなガバナンスモデルが確立された今、アンプの未来は死にオープンであり、ウェブを愛する皆さんと共に進化していきます。共に進みましょう。アンカンフにようこそ。I'm so glad I made it. All right, I really need to relax a little bit now. I think I need some break here、uh, now. So please welcome on stage Chris and Yusuke, who are going to be your co-hosts, and we'll lead you through the two days. Hi, Hi. Good welcome morning. to Amcon. It's really amazing <laughs> to have you all here. Um, so um, let us let us introduce our, ourselves. Today, I'm really grateful for being here. 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 
article writer at Google, specifically on, you guessed it, the AMP project. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be here today and to be able to work on my passion, the web, and a, a framework that does so well at keeping it open and available for everyone. So, I'm going to talk about the MC, 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 Um, so I'm very excited, Crystal. Um, at the same time, I'm very, really excited that we are able to host this AMP conference, um, the annual AMP event here in Guess Tokyo. Tokyo! Yay! Woo! Oh, look at me! <laughs> ちょっと背景を話すと、2017年から始まったアンプコンフです。一番最初はニューヨークで開催されました。で、そこから大陸を移ってですね、ヨーロッパ、オランダはアムステルダムで去年は開催されました。そして今年はあ絶対にアジアで開催したいというそんな機運が高まってたんですけど、それが東京でこう開催されたということで、まあ私自身はもう本当に東京のオリンピックが決まったよりも全然嬉しく、もう本当に盛り上がっているわけです。はい、えー、ということで、Are you really excited about this? I could seriously Not be more excited.、Um, it is not only、uh, my first time in Japan, it's my first time in Tokyo. It is my first AMP Comp, and it is my first time moderating. So, thank you so much for joining us on all these fantastic firsts. And definitely tweet at me all of your, Jap all of your Japan recommendations. I want to know. It's going to be your day.、Yeah. <laughs> and like, speaking of which, like, you're wearing a, like, a beautiful, traditional Japanese yukata, isn't it? And so are you. And by the way, my first yukata. <laughs> Yay. Thank you so much. So we're very honored to wear this outfit. It was just built for this conference. ということでですね、三重に型紙職人をされているキム兄さんに、今回のこのイベントのためだけに、こちらの衣装を作っていただきました。なので、キム兄さん、本当にありがとうございます。あの本日、本当に気分がもう最高にあの上がった状態でこのカンファレンスを、えー、できるかなというふうに思います。At the same time, I really feel the diverse of this AMP.、Um, it's not just about the webmasters, it's not just about the developers, but like these traditional Yukata designers are also interested in supporting AMP. Isn't that a thing? Absolutely. So I have so many, many favorite things about AMP. It's hard to choose. But one of them is that we don't only reach developers globally, but we are now reaching people in different i n d u s t r y AMP is really becoming something that is for everyone. ということで、えーっとまあ、こういうふうにいろいろなダイバースな人たちに支えられて盛り上がっているアンプっていうのは分かったかなと思うんですけどちょっとここの皆さんのオーディエンスの、えー、多様性みたいなのをちょっと見ていきたいなというふうに思います、えー、皆さんあの今から質問をするのでぜひとも手を挙げてください今日この中でですね、えー、東京から来てる人東京在住の人おおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおえー、東京以外から来られてる方、どのくらいいらっしゃいますでしょうか、えー、私は神奈川から来てるんで、私もこの中入るんですけど、あのその中で沖縄から来られてる方とかいらっしゃいますいますあいないですかあのもし恥ずかしくて手を挙げてないんで、後でちょっといろいろ会話しましょう。Um, at the same time, like, AMP Conf is not just for Japan, of course. Raise your hand if you're from Asia, Pacific, China, India, Southeast Asia, Australia. Today's your day. Please have fun. And then I want to know Europe, Middle East, and Africa. There we go.、Uh, I was expecting more hands than that. Go on. Those are three big continents right there. <laughs> no, thank you so much for joining us. And what about the Americas?、Woo. That's me, San Francisco. Oh,、yeah. oh, fantastic. I want to see your hand if it's North America, South America, Mexico, Brazil. Thank you so much for coming all the way out here. And lastly, anywhere else that includes the Antarctic, North Pole Galaxy, and my mountain viewers. Let me see you. <laughs> There's a lot of mountain viewers here.、Yeah. And of course, we want to give. A very, very, very special shout out to all of you joining us on the live stream today.、Um, when I've joined conferences on the live stream, I don't always believe them when, we're, when they say you're, you're really a part of this. And you truly are. We're going to invite you to participate as much as possible、um, in the conference. We're so excited to have you joining us. Dive Stream, and Mina Sammo, and you're going to say, it's in Yoroshko Negaishimas. To go to the Hontoni, Tayo Nashitachi, Ga, Kono, Kain, Sanka Sarateru, and Ga, Wakaru Katomimas. The Amphua, eh, to. とても強くですね、コードオブコンタクトを
持っていますで、えー、詳しくはですねアンプドットデブのリンクを踏んでいただけたらなというふうに思うんですが、えー、テーマはすごくシンプルです。Be excellent to each other なので互いを尊重しちゃってください一緒にこのアンプコンフを楽しい会にしていきたいなというふうに思っています。This one is so important, we're going to repeat it twice. The code of, content, a code of conduct, be excellent to each other. As we can see from all the different hands being raised, we have a lot of different cultures, a lot of different backgrounds, and it's one of those things that does make AMP so beautiful and make conference like this so wonderful to attend. And we just want to make sure that everybody feels welcome in this environment and has such a great time. So please be as polite as possible, be as forgiving as possible. But if you see anything that just doesn't feel right or makes you uncomfortable or takes away from the wonderful things That is AmpConf. This is the way to let us know about it or come up to any Amper、um, staffing any of the booth, and we're going to address any issues you have. So, thank you very much. そして今回、えー、もう一つ大事なテーマがあります、えー、と language inclusiveness ですで、えー、と今回は、えー、本当に言語の壁を感じさせないようなあ会に、えー、していきたいなというふうに思います。私のように日本語で話している場合はヘッドセットをつけると英語にトランスレートされますし、英語のセッションも多くあります。英語のセッションの場合には、えー、ヘッドセットをつけるとそれが、えー、日本語にトランスレートするようになります。また、アンプのチームは今回ご来場いただいている皆さんと、えー、ぜひとも直接会話をしたいというふうに思っています。もしかしかたらそのアンプのメンバーは英語を主にこう話すものかもしれません。ただ発音などは気にしないでください。積極的に話していきましょう。また私のように日本語や英語両方とも話すものや他の言語を話す人たちもいます。なのでみんなでこのダイバースな楽しい会を作って会話をしていきましょう。So, I don't know if you've noticed, but、um, Yusuke is speaking in Japanese and I'm speaking in English. <laughs> and we have, again, with all these different cultures, that comes with so many different languages. So, please take the time to be patient and communicate with one another and have this language inclusiveness. I don't want anybody to feel embarrassed if、um, you're speaking with somebody who is speaking a different native language than yours.、Uh, one of my favorite things about traveling around with AMP, especially in the AMP road shows, is going to these different places and speaking with different people and really learning what their backgrounds are and learning what their struggles. And what they need to gain from AMP. So please go speak to one another. Please be inclusive about the different languages. It's really worth the extra effort. 一緒に盛り上げていきましょうということで、えー、ちょっと細かい話です、えー、ツイッターは、えー、ハッシュタグアンプコンフでお願いしますあのツイッターのトレンド1位をもうすぐに取れるように皆さんバンバンあのツイートしていただけたらなというふうに思いますはい、そう、in order to be tweeting, you need to be connected to the network. It is, guess what? AmpConf. And it is also on your badges.、Uh, there is no password required. You just have to tap right in. It's just that simple. えー、それであのこのアカデミーヒルズ結構広いです、えっと、ちょっと路地回りを話をさせていただくと今皆さんがいる,いるのがここの7番の会場ですねジェネラルセッションここで全てのセッションが、えー、行われます、えー、昼食やアフターパーティーは8番の一番奥の会場に移動してください、えー、あとはですね3番4番で、えー、デモやチュートリアルを行う部屋もありますし、えー、ここの部屋のちょうど隣ですねにマザーズルームなどもありますのでぜひともご利用ください <laughs> yes, so we were going to have a real life sandbox, but the venue did not allow that. So instead, we are staffing it with demos and tutorials. We will have a Google booth specific to all of your Google questions. Everything else is going to be AMP directed,、um, that's going to answer all of your questions about design and user experience.、Um, Stories is launching a bunch of brand new features. We're going to be so excited to hear about that a little bit later today. Email is live out in the wild. Some of you should have got that AMP email, so please go visit that booth and ask all of the questions there. Um, we're going to have a booth on interactivity and performance. Make sure your pages are engaging for your users and performing to their needs.、Um, one of the most popular questions I get all of the time traveling around the roadshow is analytics. We have a booth for that, and it is staffed by some very, very knowledgeable、um, AMP Core team members. So please go take all of your questions to them. And you can live code AMP today with the tutorial booth. So please, it's just around the corner,、um, as we showed on the map. Go check it out. Go talk to the AMP team. They're so excited to、um, answer all of your questions. そしてちょっとスケジュールのおさらいをしていきたいというふうに思います。今日はですね、我々のオープニングノーツが終わった後に、えー、基調講演があります。キーノートがあります。その後に、えー、午前中は、えー、3つ、えー、トークがあります。そしてお昼を挟んで、午後に8つですね、8個もあるので、本当にあのぎゅうぎゅう詰めなんですけど、ぜひも集中して聞いていっていただけたらと思います。そして1点、ちょっとお,お伝えしておきたいのが、今回のこの、えー、イベントのセッションは、す、え、べ、ー、てですね、えー、YouTube のアンプチャンネルに掲載されます。なので、えー、スライドをこうパシャパシャ取ったりとかっていうのは不要です。あのゆったりとこう、えー、ご覧になっていただけたらなというふうに思います。うん
Um, and after all the excitement from the conference today, we are going to have a party with entertainment featuring live poetry by myself and Yusuke. Woo. Woo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got an actual one. Uh, well, now I feel bad. Just kidding. We're going to be having Day Day Mounds, uh, a wonderful DJ performing tonight. But we're also going to have a bunch of other stuff. There's going to be a party things such as food, drinks. Um, we're going to have a photo booth where you can turn yourself into a GIF right there. Uh, we're going to have Pac-Man Battle Royale. And... We will also be performing poetry upon request. <laughs> but I highly encourage you to uh, take pictures with us uh, once we're wearing these wonderful yukatas. We are much better posers than we are poets. せっかくなので、あの一緒にあの外にうろうろ歩いてるので、ぜひとも一緒に写真を撮っていきましょう。ということで、えー、最後にですね、えー、質問をどしどし、えー、していた,いいただきたいなというふうに思ってます。HTTPS コロンスラスラのスライダーデューっていうプラットフォームを今回は使わせていただきます。イベントコードアンプコンフと入力すると、えー、質問を投稿できるように、えー、なっています。はい。で、えー、っと、アンプコンフに関する一般的な質問ももちろん受け付けてますし、えー、もしくはですね、本日の5時半から TSC パネルっていうパネルがあるんですけど、そのグループに対して何か質問をしたい場合にも、ぜひともご利用ください。Yeah, so a big change from last year's AmpConf is we now have a technical steering committee and a governance model. And we will be featuring、um, the people on the technical steering committee on a panel today. Please submit your questions about anything related to that on sli.do, sli.do. There's also,、um, I'm sure Yusuke just covered it.、Um, uh, An open chat room for general questions, and then there will be a Google specific panel tomorrow that you can already start submitting questions for. ということで、あのオープニングノーツなんですけど、喋りすぎてるような気がするので、shall we?、Oh, yeah, so welcome to AmpConf. Let's go, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, please join me for the moment we've all been waiting for as we welcome Malta to the stage. Hey everyone, my name is Malta and I'm a member of the newly formed Technical Steering Committee for AMP. And I'm also the tech lead for the team at Google that is working on AMP. Welcome, welcome everyone watching on the live stream and of course everyone here in the audience. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're so excited to be in Tokyo this year. We've now had MCOMF in three different regions across the world. And I think it's particularly awesome to be here in Asia and especially Japan because publishers and platform have been incredibly successful with AMP over here. In fact, publishers and e commerce websites based in Asia are some of the strongest users, supporters, and contributors to AMP. We're so excited to have many of those folks here today and actually speaking at AMCONF. Many of the platforms that link out to AMP content are based here in Asia. At the first AMCONF two years ago, we announced that Yahoo Japan, Baidu, and Sogu were bringing AMP to the users. And particularly, Yahoo Japan is a strong supporter of AMP. They launched AMP in their Blue Link search product in 2017, and last year, Yahoo Travel, as well as two additional services within Yahoo, adopted AMP as a publisher. This year, they're working on signed exchanges, which is going to be a big part of this keynote. This past October, we celebrated AMP's third birthday. It's been quite a journey since AMP was born in 2015, so let's take a look back at where we've been and what AMP can do for you.
Wow, that's 852 open source contributors to AMP. A huge thank you from all of us for your help. We would definitely not be where we are today without you. Thank you very much. As we've just seen, AMP has expanded a lot since it was first announced. Or originally, AMP was known for these simplistic pages for publishers, but AMP now powers experiences across the web with stories, ads, and emails. Pinterest is a great example of literally doing all of these things and making up the building blocks for how they approach the open web. They link to AMP pages on their product. They're one of the biggest producers of AMP pages on the planet. They're exploring using AMP stories. And finally, they're one of the first senders of AMP emails. So as you can see, AMP has evolved. It's become so much more than the original accelerated mobile pages name. In fact, we're not just mobile, and we're not just pages. So it doesn't really make sense to use that long, awkward face. That's why moving forward, we're just going to be known as the AMP project. No acronym, just a word that signifies great user experience across the web. The theme that AMP is now more than just pages is also transforming our super freshly launched project website, amp.dev. Because you as a developer are probably not working on ads and emails at the same time. And so the new website is structured across the major themes, making it quicker to find what you're looking for. And the site is not just a new redesign. The new use case section is centered around examples that push the boundary of what is possible with the web. And we're hoping it'll inspire you to do more with AMP as well. While we've shown this before, I feel it's important to revisit the vision and the mission of the AMP project. We're here for a strong, user-first, open web forever. And to achieve that, we're supporting the long-term success of web publishers, merchants, and advertisers. At the core of this mission is the representation of the all stakeholders of the web. And to make be and better reflect those stakeholders, we changed AMP governance model to formally include voices from across the web. So governance is just a fancy word for the rules and groups that decide what happens with the AMP project. It includes the Technical Steering Committee, or TSC, of which I'm a member, the Advisory Committee, which is bringing more perspective into the AMP project leadership, and finally, the working groups. Those groups are the easiest way to contribute to AMP, and we'd love to see many of you bring your ideas to life by joining one of these groups. All of the TSC members, many of the EC members, and many of the working group members are here today. I'd like to recognize them by standing up if there's anyone around. You'll hear more from the TSC later today in our closing panel. All right. When I think of the web platform, I think of three main pillars. There's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And while AMP itself is written in JavaScript, so far, when you build an AMP page, you only had HTML and CSS as your, at your disposal. You could say that AMP was incomplete. But that is changing now. Based on a revolutionary technology called Worker DOM, full JavaScript integration is coming to AMP. So just to make this absolutely perfectly clear, you can now run your own JavaScript in AMP documents. On the surface, what we're doing is we're introducing a new extension called AMP Script. And it allows you to run your own JS inside the document. There's, of course, this being AMP, some rules to keep things sync, safe, and of course, fast. This is a big topic. So check out Chris's talk about AMP Script right after this keynote. All right. Speaking of JavaScript, one of the most popular ways to create AMP pages is through React server-side rendering. For example, Reddit, Pinterest, and Airbnb use this technology. But so far, everyone kind of had to roll their own thing. But that's changing all. We're super excited to announce that Next.js, one of the most popular frameworks for React, is gaining first-class support for AMP. They've put a lot of thought into creating the best possible developer experience, which includes live reloading for AMP documents as you develop them. It's combining the power of React with AMP, and I'm super happy with the result. And because it's always best to eat your own dog food, as of today, the entire Next.js website is itself an AMP website. Cool. Let's now talk about what I think is AMP's number one problem, those google.com slash AMP URLs. Last year, we talked about new experimental web technology called web packaging, or signed exchanges, to fix those URLs. A lot of progress has been made since then, 
and I'm super excited to announce that Sign Exchanges have launched in Chrome Stable, and as of today, Sign Exchange support is launching in Google Search. It will be available to all users that use browsers that support the technology and all of your websites if you're serving Sign Exchanges. So just to repeat myself, you can now get the instant loading for AMP on your own domain. And by the way, on top of just fixing the URLs, this also makes stuff like analytics way more robust, because now everything runs on your domain. Stuff like cookies and storage simply just work. So to participate, a website actually has to make signed exchanges available for itself. And today, there are two ways to do this. There's the do-it-yourself method, where you install a new software called the AMP Packager. But you know, to be honest, it can be a bit difficult to set up. And so I'm even more excited to announce that Cloudflare is launching their server's AMP Real URL that automatically provides signed exchanges for all your AMP pages. To turn it on, literally all you have to do is go in the Cloudflare admin and toggle the feature. That's all you have to do. It's incredibly easy. Now, you probably want to learn more about this and may choose to do it yourself. So check out the talk tomorrow by Greg that dives into the details of signed exchanges and what they mean for AMP. All right. One of the key differentiating elements of AMP is that it's an evergreen JavaScript library. Every day, hundreds of open source contributors and dozens of full-time engineers are working on making AMP better. And those improvements are flowing to all AMP pages on a weekly basis. Thinking about this more, I realized that AMP is more like a software-as-a-service cloud offering than the old kind of shrink-wrapped software model. We believe that web frameworks are going through the same transformation as other software has, and we're calling it AMP as a service. Now, to give you a bit of an idea of what this actually means, let's take a look at a few things. The AMP team is polishing the core format towards the more delightful native-like experiences. As you can see here, images on AMP pages now support the light box by default, and that light box has smooth morphing transitions while supporting dismissal via swipe, just like users expect from native apps, but you don't often get on the web. And finally, because of the speed of light is finite, images may still take a while to load. To improve the instant feeling of AMP, we're soon starting to automatically generate blurry preview images when serving from the AMP cache, which will appear instantly. All of these improvements come to your AMP documents for free and importantly, by default. That's what we mean with AMP as a service. So investing in AMP means that your websites get better every week without you having to invest yourself in those improvements. Recent example of additional improvements are infinite scrolling, auto-resizing text, video docking, protection against slow third-party code, and input masking, just to name a few. All right. We've previously talked about AMP and PWA being best trends. But what if every AMP page on the planet could be a PWA? We're moving toward that vision with our one-line service worker. The one-line service worker is an auto-configuring service worker that turns any AMP page into a PWA. It is pre-configured for AMP, so it does all the right things by default, including network resilience and improved speed right out of the box without any configuration. Diving deeper into this topic, you can hear much more with the AMP as a service talk by Nena. It's right tomorrow morning, so don't miss that. All right. Earlier, we talked about AMP's mission, which includes the part to support the long term success of every web publisher and advertisers. That means, you know, folks need to make money. So let's talk about ads. Back in 2016, we realized that the same performance tech used in AMP pages could be applied to ads as well. And so we set out on a pretty daunting mission, reinvent ads on the web based on user-first technology. AMP HTML ads are fast, but there's just no way they'd find actual adoption if they didn't also have great business outcomes. But it turns out, speeding up display ads contributes directly to publisher revenue and advertiser RI. Here are a few examples. Sonet, which is a Java Japanese demand service platform, has seen huge decreases in ad load time. And this results in major improvements in ad metrics, such as a 
percent improvement in click-through rate, which is absolutely incredible and unheard of. Spanish newspaper Al País and Volkswagen ran an experiment that combined AMP pages, AMP ads, and AMP landing pages. The result was excellent user experience and a 76% conversion lift. Or to put it another way, every single user acquisition got 43% cheaper. Again, absolutely incredible. Putting that together, at Google, we truly believe in the potential for making a better web based on the HTML, uh, HTML ads. And we've made significant progress in putting them into as many places as possible. Earlier this year, we announced that MPHML ads now make up 12% of all display ads served by Google. That includes MPHML served to AMP pages, but also non AMP pages, the entire web. I'm sure you can imagine that adds up to quite a huge number, but of course, being only 12%, there's a long road ahead of us. Changing large ecosystems takes a while, but we're absolutely committed and working on it. All right. Switching gears a little bit, let's talk about AMP page monetization, so you're making money on AMP pages yourself. Over the past year, we launched a number of new features for monetizing AMP pages. As a result, we've seen huge growth in adoption, resulting in 300% more ad requests from publisher AMP pages compared to last year for publishers using Ad Manager and AdSense, both Google products. So 300% in one year, I, you know, I, it's absolutely stunning. I don't know where this is coming from, but it's absolutely stunning. We're also seeing a huge number of case studies where publishers are seeing meaningful business impact across the web. For example, the Times of India, part of India's largest media group, is a great example. Their AMP pages load three times faster, and that improved per page revenue yield by a stunning 50%. You can hear much more about AMP. It's providing value to both users, publishers, and advertisers across the web in Vamsi's and Cat's talk. That's the first one tomorrow morning. Please don't miss that. All right, let's move on to another way to make money, which is for merchants on the web. AMP is a great solution for e-commerce, but not just for individual stores. E-commerce platform Shopify now increasingly support AMP. They are powering 800,000 businesses and support AMP through their Shopify apps platform. Six such apps provide great AMP versions in the, for the Shopify storefront. And more than 20,000 stores have installed these apps to date. And more than 1,000 more are installing them every single month. And in case you're wondering which of those six men's apps you should use, we just published a blog post diving into that pop topic that you can see on the screen behind me. One of these apps is Amplify Me. They work with Simply Carbon Fiber, which is a luxury lifestyle brand from the United States. Simply Carbon Fiber saw so page load speeds decrease for more than six seconds to less than one second with AMP. And the key stat is mobile users went about one page deeper into the website when starting out on an AMP page. Cafe24 is another e-commerce platform betting on AMP. They're enabling their 1.6 million merchants to deploy AMP pages using ready-made templates. You can learn more about their journey to AMP in their talk later today. Speed and user experience is also super important when it comes to conversions, which is why two of the leading platforms for powering conversions via landing pages, Unbounce and Instapage, have decided to go all in on AMP and provide this as a turnkey solution for their users. These services are super relevant because they're very popular with Google Ads. Last year, AMP launched for Google Ads, which you know, was formerly known as, as AdWords, and at roughly the same time, they introduced their speed score that measures landing page performance. Today we're seeing the vast majority, far over 90% of AMP pages receiving the highest possible score, which is 10 over 10. And this translates to real business success. Across those case studies, advertisers improved load times by 4x, bounce rates are cut by half through instant loading, and conversions lift anywhere between 3 and 500%. All right. We talked about AMP websites and monetization. There are two more key fields of AMP that we've introduced at last AMPConf, stories and email. And I want to spend the, spend the rest of this presentation talking about those. Let's start with stories. AMP stories started with a developer preview at last year's AMPConf. 
Since then, we've seen publishers post an amazing set of stunning stories about a wide range of topics. Stories are the first new medium that was truly born on mobile. They feel native on your phone the way nothing else does. And they're everywhere. Invented by Snapchat, they found their way into Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, just to name a few apps. And users love them. That is the Stories ecosystem today. Stories are in many places, but they're also confined to these places. Stories aren't on the web. They're shareable, linkable, and findable. And that is where M Stories come in. They're combining the power of the open web with mobile-first stories, a format that users love. We believe there's distinct value in having stories live on the web that can't be captured otherwise. We can't stress enough that with M Stories, you own the content, you completely control monetization, and you can design and distribute content exactly as you like. There isn't a platform dictating what you have to do. Since the start of the developer preview, M Stories has gained a wide range of crucial features. I want to highlight a few of those um, in the next few slides. The first one are page attachments. You've probably seen that in native apps before. They allow swiping up to dive deeper on a particular topic. The second is the ability to add a sidebar or hamburger menu to your M story. You can use this to link to different parts of your site, and that is a crucial feature because it makes M stories part of your website because M stories are your own and not just pushed into someone else's platform. And the desktop experience can be excellent as well. We've worked with the Washington Post to create full bleed style experience that is now part of the core format, so you can all can use it. And because M stories are on the web, this essentially comes for free by using standard responsive design techniques. Speaking of Washington Post, there was very surprising news yesterday, which I'm incredibly excited about. Just announced yesterday, Washington Post contributor Lorenzo Tugnoli was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for feature photography for his rich, riveting photographers capturing the human toll of the war in Yemen. The award-winning work appeared in the Washington Post AMP story, powered by a combination of Post proprietary technology and tech developed in collaboration with Google. The AMP story presentation was so visually striking that it was submitted to the Pulitzer Committee and won. Incredible. All right, so advertising on stories is still a very much emerging ecosystem. But we wanted to give you an update where things stand with that. The first product for publishers is Story Ads. So you're a publisher who has created a story. You can now directly work with advertisers to serve full screen, beautiful ads. These ads appear just like ads used to do in a paper magazine. The ad only shows if it's loaded by the time users get there. That means users never, ever see a blank ad. And if you don't like the ad as a user, well, you just tap it, and you're on to the next page of the story. Just like in a paper magazine, you would have you know, gone to the next page. We feel this is a great combination of a very attractive advertising space and great user experience. Story ads are now live within Google Ad Manager, so just like a how a publisher would deliver direct sold campaigns to their web pages, they'd be able to do the same on stories. For example, here is a story ad delivered by the Washington Post to a story that the Washington Post created. Later this summer, advertisers will be able to programmatically target and deliver story ads using DV360 across all the publisher stories using Google Ad Manager. This feature is currently in beta. Reach out to us, please, if you'd like to participate. Another way that publishers can monetize stories is using affiliate links. We're adding support to stories for tap targets that allow publishers to provide additional details, like price and the target domain, so that users can directly navigate to the external web page to complete the transaction if they're interested. All right. One thing we've learned is that making stories is a little bit different from creating your plain old web page. Creating a truly good story isn't as easy as just adding a new template to your CMS. Instead, creating st stories requires tools that allow you to express your creativity. And to be perfectly honest, that's something that has been lacking so far. But it's also something that's completely changing now. We're super exci excited about a whole slew of awesome tools for M Stories that are launching as we speak. Make Stories 
is an end-to-end, -end, what you see is what you get tool for making stories with integration into your favorite CSS. The tool is built from the ground up to make, take advantage of the capabilities of the AMP story format. And we're excited to announce that as of today, the tool is coming out of beta and will be free for anyone to use. You can try today on makestories.io, so go check that out and create your first story. It's really incredibly easy. Next is Newsroom Studio, a powerful story creation platform that is specifically engineered for publishers looking to embed tappable format into both editorial and commercial workflows. And for WordPress, launching today in beta is the new M plugin for WordPress. It comes built in with the what you see is what you get editor for M stories. Once this beta becomes the stable versions, all users of the M plugin, and I know that's many of you, will be able to create their own stories with no additional plugin installation. And finally, we're excited to announce that Unfold, one of the top story creation tools out there, has 17, that has 17 million downloads and is used by millions of creators worldwide, is integrating AMP story support. This will be launching in June as part of the new premium version of the product. So keep an eye lookout for that. Besides these tools, we're seeing an emerging trend. Independent story platforms are starting to publish their content to the web as AMP stories. Jump Rope, a platform to discover, create, and share how-tos, as well as Tick Done, are spearheading this trend. And we're super excited to see more of this in the future. All right. So the AMP stories format is gaining features, monetization is coming along, and we have great momentum with more and more tools for story creation launching. But what about Google? Google launched a developer preview for M Story after last MConf. That first phase of the project is ending now, and we're moving on to real consumer launches. Google wants to improve both Google Search and Google Discover by displaying M Stories for the users. You might have spotted sh um, stories showing up in your Discover feed already if you live in the United States. Watch out for more placement of stories in Discover and launches in more countries in the coming months. And it's an extra point. As of last week, Google breaks out stories, traffic, and search console, so you can get detailed metrics for how well you're doing. All right, so this was the Discover product. Next is Google Search. I'm excited to announce that Google is creating a dedicated block for Visual Studio stories on search result pages. In the first phase, we'll start with travel-related stories, and we'll later move on to gaming, movies, TV, and fashion. Stories being a completely new medium this will start as experiments while we're learning how us users respond to stories on search. And we'll keep you posted as this is rolling out. For all of you in the room, we're ho hoping you'll start creating more stories to fill this new block on search with life. And then be sure to check out John and Hong's talk about AMP stories later today and stop by the AMP story booth in the demo, spa demo space just outside this room. All right. Now it's time for the last topic today, email. We announced AMP for email as a preview at AMPConf last year, and it's now ready for business. I did, however, want to take a, f a little bit of time to write some extra context uh, at what AMP for email really means for email. For many of us, email really hasn't changed as a medium in years. I personally can actually still remember the introduction of HTML email. But HTML email isn't really a thing. You write something that's kind of like HTML, but it's an often heavily sanitized to rip out everything that could be remotely unsafe or that the client can render. If you've ever created a sophisticated HTML email, you've probably felt that pain. It's not pleasant. AMP for email relies on the same safety features in AMP that enables privacy-preserving pre-render for the web, and that enables the full fidelity of HTML plus the features of AMP. It opens up a whole new of possibilities for email, stuff like RCPing to events, filling out questionnaires, browsing catalogs, responding comments, and that email can stay up to date, displaying the freshest content from a common thread or the latest recommendation. AMP for email is now available to Gmail and G Suite users, and I'm excited to announce that mail.iu is exiting the beta and is launching to all users this week. Additionally, it is coming to Yahoo Mail and Outlook and hopefully other platforms later this year. 
This having really launched, it's two weeks ago. It's very early days for AMP and Emo. But early adopters, like Indeed, are already seeing a 2x increase in clicks on their job alert emails. And OYO, India's largest hospitality company, saw a 60% conversion lift for visitors coming via AMP emails since launch. Google launched common notifications for Google Doc. I personally used this for a few months and it makes my own life so much better. I definitely never want to go back to plain old and often stale notifications again. And again, we have a detailed talk diving into all things M for email. Check that out tomorrow afternoon. This was everything that we want to talk about today. For websites, AMP is getting better every day and is upgrading every AMP website along the way. This is AMP as a service. We've talked about JavaScript coming to AMP with AMP script and that Next.js is launching first-class support for AMP. With signed exchanges, you can now get instant loading for AMP from your own domain. We've made major progress transforming advertising on the web based on AMP. And publishers are seeing great su success monetizing their AMP websites. Stories are gaining steam and the format is getting more mature. We're seeing great momentum with a whole slew of tools for getting stories. And Google announced their plans for consumer experiments with stories. And then finally, a few weeks ago, and for emails launching, and more is coming later this, this year. Thanks everyone for coming and watching on the live stream. That was all for the keynote, but there's so much more to come at AmpConf. I hope you're all as excited as me about the rest of AmpConf, and I hope to talk to many of you during the breaks and at the after party tonight. Thank you very much. ということでいかがでしたでしょうか、えー、非常に面白い、えー、キーノートだったんじゃないかなというふうに、えー、思いますあのアンプがそのプロダクトである以上、えー、新しいフィーチャーがどんどん出てくるっていうのはすごい自然なことなのかなというふうに私思うんですよねただやっぱり今のキーノート見てすごく印象深いのは、えー、いろいろなあの企業がアンプの新しい最新のテクノロジーを、えー、どんどん率先して使って実際に試してみてそれでアンプのチーム自体にこうフィードバックしているそのいいフィードバックのループっていうのがこの3年間で出てきているっていうところで非常にあのいい健全な形ができているんじゃないかなというふうに思いますであの中で、まあ、ここ日本の方も結構いらっしゃるかと思うので少しお話をさせていただくと。えーまあ、いろいろな事例がありました、ただ、えーまあ、興味深いところで言うと、えー、ヤフージャパンの事例は非常に面白いと思います。えー、サインド HTTP エクスチェンジって呼ばれる新しいウェブのフィーチャーを使って、まあ、ブラウザのフィーチャーですね、を使って、アンプをより、えー、よくユーザーに提供するということをされていますで、そのセッションですね、私、時間もちゃんと覚えてるんですけど、えー、明日の2時半ですね、からのセッションがあるので、ぜひとも楽しみに聞いていてください。かつですねえー、っと確か彼ら、えー、と今週、えー、テックブログを公開しているので、えー、ぜひともそのテックブログを見ると、えー、きれいにこう予習ができるような、そんな形になるかなというふうに思います。そしてですね、えー、ちょっと、えー、次のセッションまでに時間があるので、あ私、10分ぐらい場をつなげというふうに言われていて、えー、皆さんにご協力いただけたらなと思うんですけど、えー、っとあの少しだけ次のセッションの、えー、話をさせていただきます。えー、っと JavaScript をどうやって AMP で使うかと、そういう話になってくるんですけど、やっぱり JavaScript クリプトって、えーまあ、むやみやたらにこう実装してしまうと、えー、ページスピードを害するとか、えー、何かしら不具合を起こすとか、まあ、そういったことがこう考えられますそれをこう抑制するためにアンプというのがあ存在、えー、しているわけなんですけど一方でやっぱり、えー、アンプを使ってない、えーえー、サイトですね、えー、でもしっかりとパフォーマンスのいい JavaScript を実装していきたいという機運は確かにあるんですよね。なのでその一部の流れとしてやっぱりワーカースレッドあのイニシエのワーカースレッドですねイニシエのワーカースレッドをちゃんと使っていこうという機運は高まっています。なのでそういった流れの中でいろいろなライブラリも出ていて例えば Chrome のチームが公開しているもので,でいうとコムリンクとかそういったものもあったりします。コムリンクってコムリンクってコムリンク使ったことある方って言います ?Whoever used Comlinks here?No one?Okay. 
あのコムリンクぜひすごい面白いのでワーカーのをスレッドをあまりこうポストメッセージ、えっとえー、オンメッセージとか意識せずに使うのに非常に面白いというふうに思いますただあの、えー、っと今回の次のセッションで行われるのはまた別のライブラリの話をさせていただいてかつ、えー、非常にアンプに親和性のあるようなものだというふうに思いますそしてまだ We only have, we, 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 we have like 10 minutes Next session? Okay. じゃあ,あの次のセッションを開催し始めたいと思います。So、um, we will move on to the next session.、Um, it will be、um, on、uh, the glory of AMP script.、Um, please welcome Christopher from Google. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited and also extremely nervous to be here today.、Uh, I'm happy to be the one to be、uh, presenting AMP Script, a way to incorporate custom JavaScript into your AMP documents. There are billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of AMP documents available across the web, and they share three key traits that I think are import important and worth calling out. First, instant loading. When you're on an aggregator and you click on a hyperlink to an、uh, AMP document, it feels like it's already there. It、uh, renders almost instantly, and it's a magical feeling that's not expressed across the wider web. The reason for this is item two privacy preserving preloading. So while you're sitting on the news aggregator looking for the content that you would like to click on, we can, in the background, load AMP documents and have them already and available. So when you click, they're there just like that. Now, this doesn't work unless we build in the concepts of preserving privacy during those pre renders all the way into the architectural core of the framework itself. If we preloaded a document and it exposed credentials about a person in advance, it could be used for targeting information. We think that this one piece is one of the reasons why AMP works so well. We make sure that privacy is preserved during that preloading process so that articles and other content appears instantly when you click on it. And third, believe it or not, is a reliance on JavaScript to improve user experience. Yes, that JavaScript. Now, that might seem a little strange because so far we haven't allowed custom JavaScript within AMP documents. But here on the AMP team, we love JavaScript. It's the world's most popular programming language, and it's core to how the web works. Every single AMP component is authored using JavaScript, from AMP image to AMP story. But so far, we've restricted this JavaScript to the growing list of high quality components. This can have unintended consequences over billions and billions of documents, leading to greater similarity and less customization unique to each domain. We'd like to allow developers like you to leverage some of your own JavaScript within those AMP documents without impacting user experience. We believe a little bit of JavaScript, and I mean a little bit, Will allow your documents to express your intent more uniquely. Last year, you might recall that we presented this idea with a bunch of caveats. Here they were. We were very nervous about this project. We just started it when we, we spoke about it last year, and we had a lot to learn about whether it was possible. And over the course of the year of developing this technology, we learned a lot. We were scared often. We were nervous that we made a promise that we couldn't deliver on. Internally, this project became known as the Kraken. The Kraken is a legendary cephalopod that tormented early sailors traveling into the unknown territories. And this is kind of what it felt like to build this specific technology. When you're right at the edge between the known and the unknown, it's easy to start to imagine how hard it can be. To make up mythical sea creatures that are making it impossible for you to achieve your goals. But we're really happy to say that we've tamed this Kraken. We've made it possible, we've worked with it very well, and we're ready to release the technology so you can fare across the seas safely. Let's talk briefly about how this specific technology works. In an AMP document, there are two main pieces to remember the runtime and components themselves. The runtime is shipped normally as v0.js. And this specific runtime prevents the document from loading content that is too far away from the visual viewport. 
A great example is images. Say there's an image at the very end of a document that's 30 pages long. We will not load that image up front until the user gets close enough to where it would, be start, to where it would start to display. And we also give a little bit of buffer room in advance. This means that when you're vi visiting a document that has a lot of images, that you're not using your entire data plan up front, only when you go to interact with those pieces. But it's not just for loading images that we do this. We also use this for our JavaScript as well, ensuring that components that are far down the screen do not start up or perform computationally heavy tasks until they start to get closer to where the user has expressed intent to see them. Because we have this runtime in place, we can ensure that DOM reads and writes are batched. It's a well-known pattern, and all AMP components are considered efficient, and the runtime prevents a number of potential issues. So what happens when we introduce custom JavaScript into this environment? It can't be managed by the AMP runtime. It's not possible. This component may load a number of assets before it's anywhere near the visual viewport, breaking some of our promises about how AMP documents work. Or even worse, it could consume a tremendous amount of CPU, doing something computationally expensive that is relevant to it. This one component could be the bad actor in a complex system, lowering overall performance and unintentionally giving users a poor experience. So how do we solve this? First, we put a sandbox around that custom JavaScript. It's both a security and a performance sandbox. And it prevents that specific JavaScript from abusing system resources in the main thread and also accessing parts of the document outside of its scope. That way, when you put an AMP script on the page, you can feel confident that it's not going to interfere with things outside of it, the AMP script root. Next, we put that specific context in a worker thread. So we transmit that JavaScript over and create a new worker from scratch. But the worker thread, like all jo web workers in uh, JavaScript, does not have access to the document object model. This is an intended design decision. And as a result, JavaScript frameworks and your custom code do not operate in this context the same way that they would in the main thread. This is a pretty large problem. So we, we invented a library called Worker DOM. Worker DOM does exactly like what it says. It creates the DOM, uh, a fake DOM, within the specific context of a worker, allowing you to use all of the DOM mutations and frameworks that use those uh, specific instructions uh, without much change. Then we put your custom JavaScript inside that container. But this also creates another problem. Now that worker thread has a whole set of changes it would like to express the DOM, and it's already done it. It said, I would like to append a node here and remove this one here, add an event handler to this, to this one here and this one there. So we need to be able to transfer those commands back to the main thread and apply them. So let's walk through a simple example. Here we've got two lines of code. The first line, we're going to create an element, a div. And we're going to assign it to a representation that we call div. Afterwards, we're going to take that div element and append it to the document body. Now, this is vanilla JS. However, your frameworks that you also use do these on things under the hood. Let's talk about how we do the creation of elements for a second. This specific command, create element with the first argument of div, is what we're going to achieve with this numerical sequence. This is an array buffer of uint 16 values. The first value, 3, is the persistent reference to this node. When this node is created, it's assigned that identifier and is transmitted between both threads. So now if the worker or the main thread refers to node 3, both of them know what they're talking about. The second node, our second number, tells the main thread what type of DOM node should be created. Because this specific instruction said create element, we're going to use the number 1 here. Now, this is not a made-up number. Uh, the node prototype includes all of the types of nodes you can create. One just happens to be node.element node. The next value is something that we couldn't know in advance, the string div. OK, maybe we could have known about div, but not the text that's in arbitrary nodes. So what we do here is we create a string pool. Every time we encounter a new string, we put it into the string pool. And now we have a persistent reference to that specific string. 
We can use that value on both sides of the bridge, and it, we can get a resulting value from a numerical index. The fourth value is what text would be contained inside of this node. Now, this example is create element, so the text that we're, is inside this node is zero. Zero is a magical constant, and it effectively means that there is no content uh, inside of it. However, as a thought exercise, if this was create text node with a first argument of foo, then what we would need to do is transmit the index value of that foo string inside of, create, uh, inside of this specific uh, reference. The final value in create element is the namespace of the node. So by default, uh, elements created through create element have an HTML namespace. However, if you were creating something like an SVG, you would use create element NS, and you would specify two arguments. The first, tag name. The second, the um, current namespace for that node. So we would need to transmit that namespace as the value here from the string pool. Now we're on to appending that child to the document body. So how do we do that? Again, we're going to rely on an array buffer to transmit this information. Here we've got the number two to begin with. And this number represents the type of operation we're going to be performing. Two indicates appending a child. The next value is the identifier for the parent that we're appending to. Document.body has that unique identifier that was assigned up front of the number two. The third value in this buffer represents the next sibling node. So if you were referring to that next sibling node when you appended this object, we would need to transmit its identifier here to correctly insert the node in the right place in the DOM of the main thread. Same thing goes for previous sibling. If you would have referenced the previous sibling here, we need to transmit it as well. Now here's where things get a little different. The next item is the number of nodes we intend to append to the DOM. But why would we ever need this value to be more than one? You can't append more than one node at a time through this, uh, through this API. Well, really, this, this specific construct is a DOM change list. And what that means is the ability to append and remove multiple children at the same time. So while there may not be a DOM API for that today, this interface would allow us to support future DOM APIs that may allow that in the future. The next value is the number of nodes that we intend to remove. So this structure can be used both for appending and removing nodes. And the final value is a spread of the items that we intend to add with their unique identifiers, followed by the items that we intend to remove. Congratulations. We successfully requested a node to be appended to the document body. And for reference, here are those two array buffer sequences again creation of a node, and leveraging that node as we append it to the document body. This allows worker DOM to send messages quickly and efficiently between threads and apply DOM mutations. So let's build something. That was a little deep. Maybe we can back up and build something and make this a bit more fun. Let's start with the Kraken document. This is an example that I built, and it expresses most of the common functionality that you would need to do within an AMP script component. We start with a valid AMP document. I've omitted a ton of the AMP document code here to try to simple this, uh, bring this example down and simplify it a bit. But really what we're doing first is we're appending a new script tag. That script tag is for the custom element AMP script. Later, we leverage the AMP script custom element itself and we pass into it an attribute that is the URL of the JavaScript that will enhance the, code, uh, enhance the DOM nodes inside of it. And again, we have children inside of it here, uh, a single child that's a div. When the worker starts up, it will have knowledge of this div. It's already there. So frameworks that are more like jQuery type plugins will work successfully. Next, we need to write some JavaScript. That JavaScript will interact with the DOM inside of the AMP script element and uh, treat the root of the AMP script element as the document body. So each AMP script element that you create is a new document and a new document body. This example is using Preact. And all we're doing is creating a div node in our component method. 
that div node inside of it has a class attribute with a style, uh, with the name fill. It's the same thing that you saw on the previous slide. When we go to render that specific uh, element to the screen, uh, the component is uh, put in document.body. Now the third argument here is specific to Preact. Um, what it means is it will merge what was existing in the document before with what you've now specified. Next up, we need to make sure that our server is responding with the correct set of headers. So this is one of the security constraints. Here, AMP access control allow source origin, say that three times fast, will allow you to specify what origins are able to modify, are, are allowed to load JavaScript from. So if you have an AMP document and you load JavaScript, that JavaScript resource needs to make sure this header is present. Now I've hard coded the values in this example, but you should figure out what's best for your serving environment. We're likely better off calling what we just created, not the Kraken document, but really the empty document, because that's all that was in it. So let's add some interactions. The first thing we're gonna do here is insert a logo component. When we do that, we import the component, and then we leverage the logo component within the render method. So now this div is going to have a single child uh, that is the, the logo component. Here is the logo component itself. So an important thing to note here, I've used an, a component called AMP image. Now that is just something that I wrote that actually outputs an AMP dash image. Um, and the content of that is the attributes that you would apply to an AMP image. However, it's important to note that we've added a click event listener to it. So now every time the AMP image is clicked, we're gonna run the method handle click. When handle click is called, we're going to change the state of this React or this Preact component, and it will uh, toggle between the animation. So we'll be able to say, animate this component when you click on it, and when you click again, turn it off, turn off the animation. We need to wire that up to some CSS. So here's the CSS for this example. I have an animate class name, and when it's, when it's applied, it uses a CSS animation to wobble the logo back and forth. Now we've gone from the Kraken document to the wobbling document. Maybe we should go a bit further. Now, for the sake of time, I'm gonna just jump to the end here and show the example and talk through it a bit. Here we've got the click that causes the logo to wobble, and there's a giant Kraken at the bottom. When I click on that, a series of SVG images will start to fall from the top of the screen. Now these SVGs are randomly placed and go in random directions. So if I click on it again, you'll see a different sequence and they go in different patterns. Lastly, I added a touch move event listener onto the document body, which will allow us to see the cursor and the lag time for sending events back and forth between threads. Pretty quick. You can achieve a lot of what you want to do in your custom components using just these pieces. So what's supported? Well, quite a bit is supported, but not everything. We have a handy dandy chart right here that you can go read, and I uh, recommend taking a look at that if you plan to use AMP script. It will tell you the DOM APIs that are supported and what is not supported, and uh, also what is coming soon. An important note to, have, uh, to add as well is that we've built a linter that will analyze your JavaScript code and look for patterns that will work or need replacements and give you hints. Let's talk about the trade-offs and restrictions for a second. Because like all things in computer science, nothing is perfect. You have to make trade-offs in order to keep moving forward. There's a few that I'd like to call out that are important to know as you start to use AMP script. The first one, is 150 kilobytes. That is the maximum size for all JavaScript content on an AMP document. No more than 150 kilobytes, no matter how many AMP script elements you put on a page. And this size is not based off of the compressed size, it's based off of the decompressed size of your JavaScript. It's not a tremendous amount of room, but we think it's plenty to accomplish a ton. So why 150? Well, first off, we're being a bit conservative up front. If we find that this rule is too restrictive through testing, we will be able to loosen it. But that's only if we are absolutely certain it will not impact performance on low-end devices. The second, the internet in general is awash with JavaScript. 
As an industry, we choose this particular tool more frequently than we should. The impact of JavaScript is far greater byte for byte than any other resource type on the web. And left unchecked, the size of scripts will have an adverse impact on the loading performance of AMP script document segments. We're also concerned about parts and evaluation time of this JavaScript. And we want to make sure that those low-end devices continue to have a great experience using AMP. Next number is zero. This is the number of mutations that an AMP script is allowed to make without user interaction. The idea here is, just like in AMP, things will not change unless you as a user click or interact with the document. If this rule is violated in custom JavaScript, if there's an attempt to mutate the document without a user interaction, the JavaScript is shut down and destroyed. The AMP script is left inert in the last state that it was. The intention here is to make sure that AMP script doesn't do things that are unexpected. There is an asterisk, though, and it's an important one. If you have a statically sized object on screen that's an AMP script, and it's of below a certain height, we will allow it to mutate as much as, it'd like, as much as it would like to. The reason for this is that it's perfect for things that use WebSocket connections to update status. We think this is a large use case that's not addressed today within the AMP ecosystem, and we like to make sure that it works correctly. Next number, five seconds. This is how long custom JavaScript is allowed to make mutations after an event has been registered and fired. The reason for this is that we don't want users to have a long wait between their click and the actual change uh, being seen on screen. If you violate this rule again, what happens is the AMP script component is shut down and left in the last state that it was. Again, there is an asterisk. And this one's a fun one. Sometimes when you get a click event, you need to ask the server what to do next. So we recognize that case. And what we do is when a fetch is initiated within this timeline, we will extend the duration of the allowed mutations until the first bytes of that fetch come back plus five seconds. So if you need to fetch something from an event, go ahead. It will work just fine straight out of the box. The next item is asynchronous computed layout. Now, typically, when this term is used, it's called synchronous computed layout. But because this is running in a worker, it's all asynchronous. So what does that mean? Often in JavaScript, you need to know the client rect of an element, its current position, its size, so you can do some calculations to understand what to do with it. In this case, our div is going to ask for its client rect by using the method get bounding client rect. This method doesn't exist in AMP script at all. And here's why. When we're in the main thread and we have a div like this that needs to know its client rect, it asks the browser directly. Now, that information isn't always available right off the bat. Sometimes the browser must, do, must relay out the element to get that data. But it's available very quickly. And as a result, JavaScript code can be pretty much halted and held onto until that value comes back. This is a little bit different when we're in a worker environment. Now we've got the div element inside the worker. And so we're going to request the client rect. When we do that, in order to get the data, we don't know that information in the worker. We don't have access to computed layout. So we need to send a request across the bridge for that information to the div and the main thread. It will find out its layout synchronously, and then afterwards communi communicate it back to our worker and back to the div element. This can take time. It doesn't take much time, but it can. And as a result, we would like to make sure that programs are not reliant on synchronous behavior. So instead of using div.getBoundingClientRect, you just need to change this slightly. Just put in a wait before and ask for the getBoundingClientRect async. GetBoundingClientRect async returns a promise with the client rect. So the moment that promise resolves, you have the same data that you would have had synchronously. Well, that was fun. Let's uh, get to, into something a bit more practical. Let's start with frameworks. We've worked really hard to make sure that Worker DOM is a DOM implementation that's not specific to our needs. And as a result, AMP script can support many popular frameworks. We know that these three in particular, Preact, React, and Vue, work pretty well out of the box. 
And we're working with framework authors to make sure that we're not doing things within AMP script that would break their code. Here's an example. On the left, we have uh, to do, this is Todo MVC implemented in both Vue and Preact. And as you can see, things work as you'd expect. However, all of the custom JavaScript for these experiences is running within the worker. And it just works. It's pretty cool. Next, we partnered with our friends at the Washington Post. The Washington Post does an amazing number of interactive articles with charts that you can click on and data graphs and all sorts of things that were difficult to achieve in, in AMP documents beforehand. So we ported one of the more recent articles. This is, has a bunch of SVG charts. And you can interact with those charts and change, uh, and change the DOM through those interactions. You can also go up to this top selector and change the date that you were, the year that you were born. And when you do that, it will change all of the charts across the entire page. Underneath this chart, as you select, the text values are changing to represent data points that are collected. There's also a video embedded within the page. And when you watch that video, you can use the controls as you would expect. This is a perfect representation of what we think AMP script is great for. It's something that can take documents that were 95% of the way there and get them the final 5%. E-commerce is also a very important part of the web. Many checkout flows on AMP documents are not built using AMP. And we wanted to see if it was possible to implement a checkout flow using AMP on a document. Philip Stannis, a member of the AMP team, worked on this specific demo. Here, we have an inline, multi-step checkout flow. So uh, just pretend for a second that we clicked on something to buy before this started. This would pop up and allow you to actually complete the information and send something to Testy Testerson. And we would be able to complete the entire flow. You can go through, add your, all the information of your address, the name on your card, your CVV, all the kind of things that you would expect a checkout flow to, to need. And this is all running in a valid AMP document. No longer do you have to leave an AMP document to actually achieve these kind of interactions. When I hit verify here, the next thing that will happen, uh, I'm sorry, confirm here, uh, the next thing that will happen is you'll see successful confirmation of the purchase. The next thing is talking about how the web used to be. So, I really loved GeoCities. I thought it was amazing, and I kind of wish it would come back in a way. Uh, and so we have a person on the team named Alan who also feels the same way. And he built a demo that's called bling.cool. And this is a conversion of that specific demo to run an AMP script. Now, the interesting thing about this demo is not just that it, it looks pretty cool, but that it's the same code base that runs in the, the non-AMP version and the AMP version. Both are the same, which means he doesn't he can ship just an AMP-first representation. How fast is this? Right? We're sending messages back and forth between threads. There's a lot of computation going on. It looks like a lot of work, right? It can't be efficient. Well, transferables and array buffers are very efficient. And they're only getting better with continued investment from teams like V8. Here's an example of a popular benchmark called dbmon. And what this does is it flushes a ton of DOM writes as fast as it possibly can to screen. This implementation is running inside of AMP script and has a very steady 60 frames per second. Um, it works very well, and the main thread is using a very small amount of memory. How far could we go? So talked about how fast. We talked about what you could use it for. We've seen lots of really interesting examples that are quite practical and kind of fun, we wanted to see how far it could go to. How far could we push the limits of this technology? So Aaron from the AMP team built an emulator. This emulator runs in AMP script off of the main thread and works. It's playable. It works as you would expect. Um, and it's actually fairly small. Now, this example is not small enough to go on an AMP document. This is invalid AMP to do this. And we think this is beyond the limits of what you'd want to do on an AMP document. But it does demonstrate that the technology is capable of doing far, far more than what we thought initially. So when is this going to be available? It's a lot of work. It's very interesting. Well, Malta talked about this earlier, but it's available today. You can try it out now. 
and I'm very excited to hear your feedback. I think you're probably going to run into things that need to be fixed or need to be addressed. And as a result, we're opening it up today as an origin trial. So you can go to this URL and register yourself for your domain, and we will send you an origin trial token. This will allow you to put AMP script components on pages and try it out. But we really want your feedback. We want to hear what's difficult. We want to hear what's hard. We want to hear what works and what doesn't. And we're looking forward to hearing from you as you try it out. I'm very excited to have been here to talk about AMP script. Thank you so much for having me. に興味深いえ、uh, so that was super, super exciting information. JavaScript is finally available in AMP. Yay. Woo! Ooh. All right. So um, a couple of quick things here. Um, on the slide.do, I do not see any questions coming in, guys. And after all of that, there must be so many questions that yep. you want answered. So please start asking them. But also, we can use the app to ask you questions. And we have one up right now, which is uh, if you could describe AMP in one word, what would it be? So please submit that in the slide.do. Um, so coming up next, we're going to have a coffee break. There's going to be coffee available right out there. But before you go, keep in mind, um, we're going to ding um, a bell like this. Come back, come back. It's hard to do one-handed. <laughs> um, and that's your signal to start coming back in and um, take your seats back here in the main session hall. That way we can keep on time and make sure our live viewers, um, our live stream viewers um, can participate as well. ということで、あの、11時まで、あ、11時まで、え、休憩になりますので、え、ぜひとも、あの、デモブースとかチュートリアルブースとかもあるので、ぜひ、あの、ご利用ください。はい、それでは休憩に入ります。Thank you so much. Oh, please use the sign to check out the booths and tutorials as well. <laughs>
everyone back in their seats. Was the break good? Eh, uh, no, uh, eh, uh, 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 人と話をこうする機会になれればいいかなと思ってます。あともう一つあの今ちょっとツイッターのトレンドをチェックしてたんですけど、えっ、ー、と東京のトレンドの入りをしましたということで皆さんありがとうございます。Uh, it was hashtag #amconf was in the Tokyo trend,、uh, in the Twitter Tokyo trend. So thank you so much for、uh, doing that. えー、っと私の話はちょっとあ短めにしたいと思います。もうどんどん次のセッションに、えー、移っていきます。ということでですね、えー、続いてはですね。えーアダプティングアンプ、ノー、サーリー、イワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイワーイ Hi, mom and dad.、Uh, and I'm going to be sharing with you today about、um, a mindset that I call AMP Core.、Uh, it's a mindset that my team has developed、uh, at the Washington Post on our ARC publishing tools. And we use it when we go into clients and build their new sites on top of our tools. So,、uh, we've heard a little bit about the Washington Post today already, so no pressure.、Um, you have heard from Malta that the Post recently、uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for content that was published via AMP Stories using some of the Post's proprietary technology. And that technology is our ARC publishing software, and that's the team that I work on. Arc Publishing is an award winning, state of the art set of digital tools for modern publishers.、Uh, and I've been on the team for about three and a half years. Specifically, I work on our professional services team, so that means I get the honor of going into other publications and working with their stakeholders to bring new experiences to life on the Arc platform. Over the course of the last three and a half years, I've had the opportunity to work on implementing、um, some of the greatest websites、uh, for publishers on ARC. And it's been a real honor, both big and small clients,、um, in moving them over to ARC. Now,、um, I didn't start out as a technical architect. I started out as a boot camp graduate、uh, when I got my offer from the Washington Post. It was in October 2015. And it was to the day, coincidentally,、uh, tied to the same day that I got my offer, was the day that the AMP project was announced. So, you can imagine my,、uh, my kind of trepidation knowing that I was going to be working for a media company and learning about this new project that the Post was part of at the very beginning and learning that the skills、um, that I had spent the last few months learning would not even be part of the AMP spec with JavaScript, very limited CSS. And so, I saw this as kind of a, a Potential point of frustration. But as I've started to work with AMP in projects over the last couple of years, I've been really excited to come around to this mindset that AMP is more than just limitations. It's actually aligned with some of the best practices for software engineering. Chances are you've been on a project that sounds a little bit like this. You get a set of requirements, and you're told that the site has to do X, it has to do Y, it has to do Z, and it also has to be AMP compliant. And in this kind of waterfall delivery style, AMP is often an afterthought in requirements. It's not something that's up front and center yet. And so, what happens when AMP is an afterthought is that we build a default or a non AMP experience, and then at the very last minute, kind of come back and be like, oh, yeah, the AMP part. And then we dive straight into the technical spec. And that's a reasonable thing to do as engineers to go and read the documentation. But when we go straight into the technical limitations of AMP, we miss the bigger picture in starting to see what AMP can offer us as engineers. So, what happens most of the time when AMP is an afterthought is that we end up maintaining two different sets of code. This is something that Paul mentioned in his intro that you have your non AMP and your AMP experience,、uh, and pushing more people to go AMP first. And we've seen this shift from mobile first. 
or as Mobile First has grown, uh, We've gone from having a desktop version of our site and a mobile version, your dub 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 and your m dot, to just having one version that's responsive. And that puts some constraints on the chaos of requirements a little bit, but I still have issues with mobile first because it's not very well defined. And so that's why I've started calling my mindset AMP Core. The AMP core mindset is one that's based on AMP's design principles. What you heard from Malta earlier was a little bit about the mission and the values of AMP project. And under the hood, AMP also has guiding design principles that help them make consistent decisions. In the AMP core mindset, you use these design principles to help you align with stakeholders across teams at the very beginning of the project. And then the downstream impact is that you see performance benefits on both your AMP and your non-AMP renderings. But before I go any further, I do want to clarify that AMP core, as I'll present it, is not the same as the AMP first mindset that you've heard about already today. In AMP first, your AMP rendering is your only rendering. It is the canonical version of your site. But on my team, and I suspect at many other organizations at the moment, having a canonical AMP experience is not really uh, an option at the moment. And that's where I think that AMP core is really powerful. It lets you take all of the guiding principles of AMP and distill it into a mindset that can inform your development for your paired sites. I've developed this mindset in the projects where we've had paired sites, so AMP and non-AMP. And that's not necessarily a limitation of the ARC platform, but just the state of the requirements for the projects we worked on. So, the AMP core mindset starts out with a process that I call AMP design thinking. If you're familiar with the concept of design thinking, it starts out with uh, a period of empathy and learning what matters in a project. I think of it a little bit like this marble. When you have so many different competing priorities, they all get blended together. And it's hard to suss out what really matters on a project. With the design thinking process, you can work with your stakeholders across teams, so not just your engineering managers, but people from product and marketing and advertising, and get everyone to buy in at the beginning. Once you get stakeholder buy-in on the principles and priorities for a project, it tends to limit the scope a little bit. But at this point, you should still be thinking much more in the abstract, not even looking at the technical limitations, because stakeholders don't actually care about the technical aspects. They care about what it means in a language they can understand. And that's why the design principles are so valuable. They communicate the things that you care about as an engineer to your stakeholders in terms that they care about. Once your stakeholders have bought in, that's when you can get down into the technical specifics. I'll talk a little bit more about what this looks like for us at ARC and how we've gotten here. Uh, but the first thing I want to kind of dig into is the idea of design principles. Design principles are a way of capturing the guiding light and vision for a project in language that everyone can understand. Typically, they're going to be able to express the authorial intent for a project for the people who are involved from the beginning so that they can inform future decision making on a project. Uh, this is not exactly a new concept within software engineering as a whole. If you think about the Zen of Python, those are design principles. And if you think about maybe Ruby on Rails, the idea of convention over configuration or the model view controller mindset, those are design principles within software engineering uh, that we use to make internally consistent decisions. Now, that's a phrase I've used a couple of times, and I actually borrowed it from our friends at Google, because when I was Digging around for information on software engineering design principles, I kept coming back to this quote from Google. It's on their AMP website under the values and mission section. And it says, the design principles guide the ongoing design and development of AMP. They should help us to make internally consistent decisions. 
to me, this was a light bulb moment, and I just went, oh my God, because I realized that I was really frustrated on projects that did not have internally consistent decisions. I realized that the vast majority of projects I was on did not have clear priorities, and it didn't have those uh, design principles there to guide when things got tough. So I realized that all of the projects that frustrated me were the ones that had very erratic decision making when the priorities changed from day to day or like hour to hour. <laughs> So the design principles are meant to be the underpinning for all of the decisions on a project. And so when I think about design principles within software engineering, I want to get really vague. I'm not talking about limits on CSS or limits on JavaScript, but really kind of the core things that we think of as priorities as software engineers. Now, I'm a front-end engineer, so I'll speak specifically to my experience. But these are some of the things I think of as software engineering uh, principles. I like to remember uh, the user experience and keep in mind who is going to be using my product. I also uh, remind myself time and time again to keep things simple and to not repeat myself. From a performance perspective, perspective, I like to remember that things should be efficient, that my code should be clean, and that if something fails, I shouldn't break the whole application. So unsurprisingly, the AMP design principles line up almost one to one with things that we would consider engineering best practices. AMP has design principles that say the user experience is greater than the developer experience, that we should design for the browsers we have, not for a hypothetical future faster browser. Uh, they say it's important to not break the web and render things on the right layer. Those are all things that matter to us as engineers, but expressed in terms that matter to stakeholders. They don't mention any particular language or any size limits. They're a common way for us to express our priorities to stakeholders across teams. So I didn't just magically end up at this mindset. Uh, it's been quite a journey over my time at ARC. So like I said, I started out as a very junior web developer and have uh, worked up through um, the levels at the post to where I am today. Uh, and over those years, I've gotten to work on some pretty awesome projects and helped develop this mindset. We started out uh, with our very first implementation of AMP on our client Infobuy. Infobuy is a publisher in Argentina that is a huge success story. They've more than doubled their traffic on all platforms since moving to AMP. We built their non-AMP site first, and then afterward, they came to us and asked for an AMP implementation. So right from the get-go, we knew that it was going to have to be paired and that there would be two sets of components. But a funny thing happened as we started to dig into the technical spec for the first time we realized that in the absence of any other requirements, we could build a very, very fast website for them uh, that wasn't necessarily AMP compatible. That wasn't what they wanted, because they wanted AMP specifically. But that was the light bulb for me. That AMP was something that we could use as leverage in conversations with stakeholders. It's a common framework that's already in production that has all of the things they want and gives me the things that I want, speed on the site and performance benefits. So I knew that I wanted to be able to take this idea a step further. And I got my chance when we worked on the Tribune Interactive projects. Tribune Interactive has many different publish publications in the US, uh, including the New York Daily News, shown here. And right from the beginning, we wanted to take uh, AMP as a priority. So we wanted to take it seriously. And so we did that by going into our discovery process with the design team and establishing what some of their priorities were. Their priority, in this case, was a consistent brand experience across all rendering tiers for them. 
So in order to accomplish that priority, we sat down with their design team and decided that we were going to follow a design system. The design system would have the guidelines for us to implement against, but then we also got to walk away and say we were going to impose a technical limit on that. In order to have consistent branding, we needed to be able to use the design system across both the default and the AMP, or the non-AMP and the AMP version of the site. So we built that accountability into our build process with a Webpack size limiter, and that was very helpful down the road when we encountered things in the design system that just needed a little tweak or maybe just added a little CSS. The size limiter gave us a really concrete way to say, no, this one tweak or one extra thing actually violates one of the principles that we set out at the beginning. And so the conversations we were able to have with their design team were so much more fruitful and productive throughout the project because we agreed on those things up front. Now, with this project, we still ended up creating two sets of components, one for the non-AMP rendering and one for the AMP rendering. So we still had a little bit of a ways to go in order to really kind of flesh out AMP at the core as a mindset. We got that opportunity uh, with our client in Germany, RTL, uh, last year. RTL is one of Germany's largest broadcasters, and they came to us to launch a new experience uh, for their users on the web. We had a really tight timeline, but we knew that AMP was a priority up front, and we knew that we wanted to AMP launch AMP at the same time as the default or the non-AMP experience. So what we ended up doing was taking the design system idea from Tribune and pairing it with this idea that all of our components should, by default, be AMP compatible, and only certain components, like the video player, which you can see it looks a little bit different between the non-AMP and the AMP versions, only the components that need to be switched out should even have a duplicate rendering in our code base. This led to, to us being able to launch the AMP experience at the exact same time as the non-AMP one, and also makes it easier for us to maintain in the code long term. So we're not at the point with any of our projects where we're doing a canonical AMP or an AMP first implementation, but that's what I think makes AMP core so valuable. It's the logical extreme of AMP first for any client or any organization that isn't able to take advantage of AMP first. Instead, we're able to take advantage of the guiding principles for the AMP project as a whole. So what I want to leave you with is um, some concrete steps that you could follow uh, to implement the AMP core mindset at your organization. I'll use the example of a, um, a hypothetical uh, publication needing to redesign or re-platform their website uh, with um, a certain set of priorities. So it might look like this. We would start out by gathering a cross-functional group of stakeholders where we get together and discuss the actual principles and things that matter to us. This might be different from a, uh, a different perspective for product. It might be the design and the branding. For advertising, it might be um, the speed with which their ads load. But as the discussion unfolds, you'll want to make sure that you're not actually getting into the technical specifics yet. This should really be the high level what matters to us in this project. Then. Once you have uh, some kind of um, coalescing around certain principles, you'll want to lay them out as the ones that are your project's design principles. Specifically, you'll need to frame them in the way that works for your organization. I like to go back and revisit the AMP design principles at this point and figure out which ones we're gravitating toward. So in the example of a publication that's doing a redesign project, one of the priorities or principles they might agree on is that the pages should load quickly. 
that would be the most abstract way to say the site should be fast. Uh, and then you might get a little bit more specific and say pages should load in one second. You could even get more specific than that without getting technical and say pages should load in one second for first time visitors or for repeat visitors or pick a specific metric that you could measure, whether that's time to first paint or like DOM complete. Whatever it is for your organization, make sure it's framed in a way that everyone can get on board with. And again, that's not just everyone who's an engineer. That's everyone from every department that has a say in the project. Only at that point should you walk away from the table as engineers and determine exactly which technical guidelines you'll need to follow. At this point, this would be where you would say, if we want pages to Oh, oh, here we go. <laughs> if we want pages to load in one second, here's exactly the performance budget we can afford. Here's the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript that we can afford to send to the browser on that first load. And then bring that back to the larger group so that you can make sure that everyone is still on board with what that means. It's really easy to be on board, of course, with saying my pages should load in one second. It's a little bit um, trickier when you realize that you only have a certain amount of HTML and CSS and JavaScript to work with in order to achieve that goal. But if you've already aligned on the goals up front, it should be much easier to get that buy-in from people across teams. The last step, and arguably the hardest, is keeping everyone accountable. I think that the easiest way to do this is to build the accountability into your regular processes. For us, that means imposing a size limiter on our design system for the CSS, like I mentioned. This, is part, this runs as part of our Webpack build process in our CICD servers, and so we're never able to just like scoot around it or like ignore it just this once. It's something we're constantly thinking of. We also like to bring it up at regular stakeholder meetings, making sure that everyone is still aligned with the things that we agreed on. And when it comes, or when push comes to shove and things get a little bit uh, tricky to deal with, we can always go back to the most abstract version of the principles and remind everyone that we're on the same team and that we all agreed on these things at the beginning of the project. Now, the AMP core mindset might look a little bit different at your organization, and it may not feel like the right thing uh, for your team. What I can tell you, though, is that with the AMP core mindset, you'll have the best chances of keeping yourselves aligned with everything that AMP stands for, which is software engineering best practices in general. So I'd like to thank you guys for taking the time to listen to me today. Feel free to find me at the conference and chat about ARC, about AMP Core, or about anything else. I really appreciate the time. <laughs>Thank you so, so, so much, Melissa, for that wonderful talk. And uh, when I first met Melissa and heard her story, um, I immediately felt this little bit of a, of a kindred spirit because it started to sound really familiar to me. Uh, little known fact, I have a background in journalism, um, which is a lot of people usually laugh at that because it's like, how do you wind up working for a web components framework um, at Google? And it, it does have a similar journey, it is I, I started writing and getting more involved and being on the web and getting extremely interested on what's going on out there and realizing that this is such an amazing platform for how people are able to communicate with each other. And I started working at a nonprofit in uh, San Francisco. And this nonprofit had a really great mission and it was to help other nonprofits meet their technology needs. Sounds great, right? Because um, often people working at nonprofits have low budgets. They're not involved. Um, they don't have a lot of technical people on hand. 
And so we were there to help them figure out what it is they needed to get that nonprofit running. And we had a website that worked as their hub where they could come and see everything that was available and pick out what it was that they needed for their use. And this was um, intended to give them more time and more focus on doing what they really wanted to do. So a lot of them were child shelters. A lot of them were homeless shelters. And some of my favorites, uh, uh, animal rescue nonprofits. And so we really wanted to give them that ease of technology that enabled them to follow their mission. And my job was answering the phones. And every day I got the same, phone, I got the same questions over and over and over. And they were always frustrations with our website. I can't figure out how to reset my password. <laughs> um, I don't know how this navigation works. Yeah. Uh, I can't figure out what it is I'm looking for on this website. And I started getting a list of all of these questions and realizing that this isn't the fault of our users. Our website is confusing. And that's when I decided this is how we're going to help people get where they need to go, by making the web easy and accessible, and particularly this website. So just like Melissa, I went to a boot camp and learned web development. And finding out about AMP was so inspiring for me because it's such a great way to enable these great features that just make your websites work in fantastic ways. Um, so I think we're coming up on time. Um, and we're going to, so speaking of people and the web and AMP, um, I would really, I'm really excited to introduce this next talk. Um, it's going to be by Andrew, our resident AMP designer, and about how we combined, um, about how we balance the developer's experience and the end user's experience on, with AMP and how it works. So please join me as we welcome Andrew to the stage. Hey folks, uh, so my name's Andrew Watterson. I'm a product designer with the AMP Project, and I'm really excited today to talk about making AMP a great experience for everyone. So I just kind of want to start with the statement that AMP is here to improve the quality of web users' daily experience. And so you've heard about a lot of stuff today. There's more stuff to come. But it all kind of rolls up into this goal. And we actually even have one of our design principles uh, that talks about this. And it says that the user experience is valued over the developer experience. And then both of those things are valued over the contributor experience. And so if you kind of read this uh, diagram backwards, it means that we, as the contributors, are making stuff for developers and users. And as developers, you should be making stuff for your users. So everything really sort of contributes back to that, uh, that great user experience. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Um, I want to talk about how we design for the user experience. Um, I want to talk about how we design for the developer experience. Um, and then I don't want to talk about the implementer experience. Um, I want to talk about how you can help, because this is really uh, important for you, for you as well. Um, but before I do that, I just want to sort of set the tone for how we even think about design in the first place. So if you kind of look at the two sort of ends of our process, right? one end is that AMP makes stuff. Um, and then the other end is that people have a better experience. Um, and it's not quite that simple, obviously, uh, but that's kind of what we're going for. Um, but one of those things is that in order for people to have a better experience, we really need to go talk to real people, right? There's all kinds of different people um, you know, that all have, you know, even from, from minute to minute, different uh, attitudes towards things. Uh, they're very messy. There's different folk, uh, types of folks in the world. Um, and so we do a lot of uh, our UX work out of Google. Um, and you can see here, this is actually just uh, a Google tent that's set up on the street. And uh, you can just tap folks on the shoulder and ask them to sort of tell you about how they use the internet um, and kind of what their, what their experience has been. And that really informs a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, so like I said before, this is like a little bit wrong. This is a little bit too simplistic. Um, so I want to sort of propose a different diagram, um, which is that we really have these three steps, right? And one thing you'll notice about this diagram is that it's a cycle, right? We don't just sort of make stuff and then put it out there and then walk away and you know, whatever's out there is, is you know, what you get. Um, we really want to constantly be refining and, and improving the stuff that we're making. Um, and so sort of the three design steps that we want to follow are, number one, we want to identify um, a problem, right? We want to identify a user experience that could be better. And then we want to make something that improves it, right? We want to solve that problem. 
Uh, and then we want to measure. We actually have to make sure we actually improved it. Because again, uh, it's very difficult to kind of uh, understand whether or not you've made uh, you know, real changes that actually improve the lives of the people that you're trying to, uh, trying to improve. And so we kind of need to go through uh, all three of these steps. And the reason that this is so important um, is because AMP is opinionated, right? Unlike some other frameworks, we're not just sort of a pile of parts on the floor that you can sort of pick up and, and you know, make a website. We actually have very specific ideas about what you should and should not do um, when you're implementing experiences for your users. Um, so AMP is opinionated, so we really need to um, make sure that these opinions are not wrong, right? Opinions can be wrong, and so we constantly need to be very curious um, and always testing to make sure that we're doing things the right way. Um, so yeah, be curious and set yourself up to learn. And that's kind of the guiding principle that we approach all of the design work we do um, on AMP with. So let's talk about the user experience, right? All these users that we've been talking about, um, what are they all about? Uh, so user experience answers the question, how does it work, right? At a very, you know, so I mentioned before, you want to uh, find a, an experience that you think could be better. Um, and then you have to figure out, like, what's even our strategy for how to solve this, right? What are we even going to make? Um, and it turns out we're web developers, and so more often than not, the thing we're going to make is a web app. Um, surprise. And that web app often consists of, you know, screens uh, that, that we want to uh, sort of guide folks through in a particular order, right? We want to uh, give them a flow. And then on those screens, we've got buttons, we've got inputs, we've got all these different things. So the user experience design um, of, of any product, really, um, answers the question, how does it work from a very high level? Like, what, what are we even going to make? What's our strategy? All the way down to, like, what color should this button be? Um, and one thing that's really interesting about AMP is in order to have these good user experience ideas, we can't just have, like, you know, a, an idea about how to solve one particular problem, and then we just go solve it, right? AMP is on a million pages. Um, so we really have to, to constantly be uh, optimizing for as many different use cases as possible. We're actually solving uh, you know, thousands or millions of, of user experience problems at once, and then we have to sort of take all that and like boil it down into this single set of components that works um, as, as easily as possible across all these different experiences. So I'll give an example. Um, we're right now rethinking the way that AMP Carousel works. Um, how many folks in this room have, have actually interacted with AMP Carousel? Yeah. Um, so this is, I, th I think, sort of one of our more popular components. Um, and it's basically just a gallery. You know, if you're not familiar with a carousel, it's a gallery of media. Um, so you can see here we've got this photo, and then we've got these little like arrow buttons. You can swipe or page to different photos. Um, and when we started this project, uh, the engineer that I'm working with came to me and was like, you know, I figured it out, right? I like thought really hard about how to do all the carousel customizations. You can like show different numbers of slides. We could have arrow buttons or not. We could like, you know, position the the media if it's like different sizes in different ways. Um, you can have different interactions. And like he had all these ideas immediately about how to implement these things. And I was really excited. Um, as a designer, it's really great to have engineers who who can actually implement the stuff that you want to make. Um, but if you sort of start at this at this like really abstract level, right? If you sort of imagine like, you know, what does it even mean to be all possible carousels at once? Um, you risk not solving a human problem, right? Um, and so you always want to focus on what you can do, right? What you can do and what you can implement is is very important. But you never want that to distract from what you should do, right? You never want that to distract from what is the user experience that we're actually trying to enable here. And so. Uh, we actually sort of tried to focus on specific use cases. We wanted to brainstorm what are the user experiences that we're trying to enable um, with AMP Carousel. So uh, one is we have a lot of AMP publishing sites, obviously. Um, often on a news article, you'll have uh, a gallery of media that you want to be able to get through. Um, just home pages, right? If you're being introduced to a new company, a lot of times uh, companies will have a gallery of uh, featured products or deals or events that they've, they've put on. Um, related products, if you're on a shopping site uh, and you sort of uh, go through an item and it's not quite exactly what you were looking for, uh, you might be looking to like look at related products. What else can I see on this site? Um, and then recipes. We actually haven't seen this uh, quite as often on the web, but we were thinking, well, hey, you've got a gallery of media. You can page through it step by step. Um, that sounds sort of like doing a recipe. So uh, we wanted to support all these use cases, and we wanted to imagine, you know, like, OK, what if we did have a carousel that supported recipes? What, what would that kind of look like? Um, and then for all these others as well. And so you can kind of see we were able to draw out what we thought um, a pretty good uh, version of all these different carousels would be. They all kind of look a little bit different. They have different layout choices um, and all that. But then, of course, 
we want to do better than imagine, right? It's not enough for us to sit in our office and like draw out different carousels um, all day. And so we wanted to go talk to real people. Um, and so we did this. We actually went to a coffee shop and tapped folks on the shoulder and said, hey, can we, can we talk to you about how you use the internet um, for 15 minutes? And, uh, and people are actually always really cooperative when, when you do this. It's fun. Uh, and so what we had done is we had taken, uh, we found a list of carousels that we really liked on other people's websites um, that were sort of similar to like what we were sort of imagining for our, our AMP version. And so then we were able to go to people um, and just sort of watch them use these websites and not even talk about the carousel, right? Just be like, hey, you're on this shopping website. What do you notice? Um, and see sort of how they react, and especially once they hit the part um, of the interaction with the carousel, what are they doing? What are they noticing? How, you know, are, how, are, how much are they enjoying it? How much are they able to actually solve whatever you know, problem, whatever user problem we set out to solve? Um, and if you've never done this, by the way, if you've never like, gone out and watched someone use uh, your product or some other product, like not in a sales um, or demo setting, it's super awesome. right? You always learn stuff from talking to people. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of an introvert. I don't actually like talking to people that much. Um, but I always get back from these days, and I'm like, man, we learned so much stuff. Now we know what to do next. Um, so it's really exciting. Um, and you sort of learn two categories of things. right? One category is that you learn what you wanted to know. right? You, you have these questions. Um, about like what's you know what's good and bad about my product, you kind of wonder about this stuff when you're making it, um, and you can learn what you wanted to know. So in our case, uh, we were wondering if people would be able to find a carousel in the first place, right? You've got this image, but there's more stuff hiding behind the image. There's more images that you can page through or get to, and so we really wanted to make sure uh, that people would be able to understand that something was a carousel. And it turned out from, from these studies that we ran, no one has any problem with this. Um, people have been using carousels, particularly in the use cases that I mentioned before, um, all over the internet. They're, they're there. Uh, they do not need help finding a carousel. We didn't have to like, make the arrow buttons really, really big. We didn't have to do some like, cool animation that was like, oh, hey, there's more content here. Um, we didn't have to do any of that stuff. So that was great, right? We could sort of cross that off of our list um, based on the feedback we got from users. And we could actually just like sort of cut off what had been you know, hours and hours of discussion about like how big do we want the arrow buttons to be um, by, by having those conversations directly with real people. Um, the more exciting uh, category of stuff, though, that you learn is you learn what you never would have asked about in the first place, right? Stuff that we were not wondering about in our office actually came up in these user research studies. Um, so in this example, it was that as folks were navigating through carousels, they'd be like, oh, man, I really wish I understood where in the carousel I was, like how many more slides there are. Uh, we had one participant went so far as to say, uh, if I'm going through all these different slides and I can't tell how many are left, I feel tricked into like, consuming more and more content. Right? And that's a red flag for us. Um, users feeling tricked is not typically uh, one of the things that we're trying to go for. Um, we don't have a design principle about that, but I, I think it's safe to say that we, we don't want that. Um, and so that was actually something we had to put on our radar. We had to go back and we had to see, like, OK, great. What is our story about how to, um, how to make sure that people always know where they are in a carousel? Um, oh, sorry. There's some Japanese here, too. Um, and then you sort of take all these insights back to your office, um, and you turn them into a user experience design. I don't want to talk about this um, too much today, but there are sort of more, more of the technical um, aspects to this process. Uh, but I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about designing for the developer experience. So I said this before, um, AMP makes stuff, and then users have a better experience. Um, but we are at a developer conference, essentially. So you may notice that there's uh, something missing from, from this diagram. Uh, who knows what it is? No, nope, nobody. We're at a developer conference. What's missing? It's developers. Man, we are sleepy. Everyone wants lunch. Um, so, so AMP cares a lot about users, right? But we're not actually really a user-facing product, right? None of the users that actually consume um, any of the AMP sites out there know that they're using AMP, and we like it that way, right? We don't want them to know that they're using AMP because that's a technical detail that they don't need to care about. Um, AMP is making stuff for developers to implement a user experience, which means that everything I just said about uh, designing for the user experience and understanding um, sort of what the problems are and how we're going to solve them and making sure we actually solve them successfully, um, that applies to developers too. And so really, we're here for you. Uh, we, we need to make sure that the uh, experience of actually using AMP, of developing with AMP, is just as good as this user experience that we're trying to, um, 
trying to accomplish. Because really, we could make all, you know, all these cool components that have like really, a really fantastic user experience. Um, and if developers are not successfully using them in their sites, it doesn't really help us. We have not uh, improved the user experience of the web at all by making uh, components that, that developers can't use. So how do we do this? Um, we're not brand new to this problem. Uh, we have road shows. Uh, we actually go all over the world. Uh, and it's particularly interesting to go to places that don't have a strong tech community. Uh, and we're able to talk to engineers and developers who are using AMP about how, how that's going for them and what their sort of unique, um, unique is issues are. Uh, we also have a GitHub. Uh, you've heard earlier today that uh, AMP is an open source project. And so a lot of our planning, right? What are the features that folks are asking for? What are the bugs that folks are reporting? Um, and how do we feel about them? Are we going to fix them? Are we not going to fix them? Um, all that discussion sort of happens out in the open on our GitHub. Um, and then we also have a Stack Overflow page. And this is actually one that I think is particularly interesting, um, because this is where developers come and they say, I'm trying to implement a thing, uh, and I'm trying to use AMP to do it, and I can't figure out how to do that. Uh, and this gives us insight into, into two things. One is uh, it's actually really hard for us to know what people are trying to make with AMP. Right? We can go through like, the whole AMP cache and like, look at all the URLs that, that are already um, on AMP and see what people did make with AMP. Uh, but it's very difficult for us to know like, what are people trying to make with AMP and are not able to make with AMP. And so on Stack Overflow, that's kind of the best um, way that we have to figure this out right now, where uh, if someone's sort of trying to make something and can't figure out how to do it, then either it's because we don't have that feature yet, and we can then have a discussion about, like, oh, do we want to add this feature so that this person can make, uh, this developer can make this user experience? Um, or it's because we just haven't explained how to use AMP to make that thing well enough. Um, and it turns out the explanation is really important as well. Um, so I want to modify the sort of statement I made before uh, that AMP is here to improve the user experience of the web. That's still true. Um, but from the developer side, AMP is really here to allow developers to get to that good user experience uh, faster. We really want to increase the speed um, that, that you guys can get to your, uh, you know, your sort of final goal. Because nothing about AMP is magic, right? Like, AMP is just sort of a JavaScript library. Like, if you put in a lot of time, you could probably go home and write it yourself. Um, but, but we don't want that, right? We want to build these tools so that you don't have to write it yourself, so that you can actually focus on the user experience that you're trying to deliver to your users. So I want to come back here, and I want to, I want to just sort of reiterate that all these steps also apply to the developer experience, right? So what's an experience that you have while coding that could be better, right? We want to identify those things. We want to be very aware of what that is. Then we want to make something that improves it. Um, hopefully, the AMP library as a whole um, you know, makes that a little bit better right now. Uh, otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. Uh, but then we also want to sort of make sure that we actually improve this. And then we want to keep doing that over and over again um, until using AMP is, is you know, literally the best coding experience you could possibly have. That sounds a little hyperbolic, but that's actually our goal. So let's talk about sort of what we need to know in order to sort of figure, figure that out and to make that happen. So the first thing we need to know um, is what are you trying to build, right? Like, so there's sort of this diagram where there's stuff AMP is good at, and then there's stuff you care about. And we really hope that there's like something in the middle of this diagram. So AMP has always been really focused on uh, speed. And when we started with AMP, we uh, supported publishing websites. That was sort of our main focus. And so you know, two years ago, if you were a publishing website that really wanted to be fast, uh, AMP, AMP was great for you. Um, and we've sort of since then expanded into e-commerce. Um, and so this is, we're sort of going around and pitching folks and trying to even get into the conversation. Like, are, we, are you even considering using AMP? Does AMP even sort of help solve any of the things that are important to you? Um, that's something we really need to, to kind of keep tabs on. Um, and actually, a really interesting anecdote about this. Uh, we had some folks from Google go out and talk to like the 1,000 biggest websites in the US um, and say, like, hey, you know, use AMP, and it's fast, and it's you know, great at all these things. Um, and many of them actually have really large engineering teams that have figured out uh, have, have figured out performance and have really made an investment in performance. And they were kind of like, eh, our, our website's plenty fast. Like, we, don't, we don't really need that. And I think that was really interesting. I would not have expected there to be a lot of uh, particularly large companies that were sort of like done with, uh, done with website performance. Uh, but that really just sort of reiterates that we need to constantly be making sure that we're, um, we're solving the problems that folks want to have solved. So that's kind of the strategy question, right? Did we get our strategy right? Is AMP even in the conversation uh, to begin with? So the second thing is, is more just what's, once, you, once you sort of have decided to use AMP, what's standing in the way of you building the thing you're trying to build with AMP? 
So I mentioned these use cases before. If you're building a news gallery, if you're building a related products gallery, we're here for you. Like we've, we've got this, it's on our radar, um, and we're gonna make this. And so we have this other sort of similar diagram, which is stuff that AMP provides and then stuff, you know, components you need. Um, and up until like an hour ago when you saw the, the AMP script talk, it was very difficult to uh, integrate external code, integrate anything that AMP didn't already make for you into your AMP page. And so we really need to make sure we have as full coverage as possible um, in this diagram, right? We need to make all of the components, all of the pieces of your page uh, that are important, we need to make sure we have components that support that. Um, and so one uh, example of this is we recently released docking in AMP video. And so we sort of went out there and we thought about like, what are the experiences that's sort of hard to, uh, hard to implement right now? Uh, and one of them was this thing that you've probably seen where uh, you know, you're playing a video, maybe you're making a recipe, um, you're trying to grill some eggplant. And then that, as you scroll up and down the page, uh, that video can actually stay with you. And it can, it can sort of like shrink itself um, and you can still watch it as you're, as you're using this recipe. So we saw, we noticed that there was really no way to do this in AMP. Um, and so we had to go out and, and sort of add support for this to the AMP video component. Um, and we launched this, I think, about a month ago. So new stuff all the time. Uh, and that's kind of the detail, the detail level question, right? What is standing in the way of you building uh, you know, whatever design you've come up with with AMP? Um, well, it's components. And if we don't have the components that you need, then we need to figure out um, how to make them. Um, and the third question, and the question I'm sort of proudest of us for asking, is what makes developing an AMP a pleasure or a pain, right? We don't want to stop at, you know, are we even in the conversation? And we don't even want to stop at, like, is this technically possible? We want to stop at, like, yeah, AMP is a really great experience. Um, and so if you sort of look, think about like all these different customizations, right? We need to be able to explain these well, and we need to, to implement them with the syntax that sort of kind of makes sense, that isn't leaving you, you know, scrolling through like 15 pages of documentation and scratching your head try to trying to figure out how to make the carousel do the thing that you want it to do. Um, and so uh, the, the sort of example here is that we recently added uh, infinite scroll to AMP list. Um, so you can kind of see here, scrolling down this list, and then when I hit the bottom, it sort of automatically uh, loads new options, and you can see the sort of scroll bar is, is constantly um, you know, becoming a different size. And we actually worked really closely. This, uh, this website right here is AliExpress. And we worked really closely with them to figure out how can we make this component like, really work, right? Not just sort of meet the minimum bar of functionality, but actually do all the things that you need it to do in the real world. Um, so we actually uh, were working with them really closely while we were implementing this component. And they were sending us feedback nearly every day um, that affected everything from the syntax choices we made up until some, up to sort of some edge cases that we hadn't initially anticipated. Uh, so working really closely with developers to make sure that this actually works for real folks when they're at their keyboards coding is a really, really important part of our process. So we've got these sort of two folks here, right? We've got the AMP team. Uh, we're the web development experts and the user experience experts, and we really want to help you build this stuff. And then we have you, who are your own, uh, the, the experts on your own product and business, uh, who need to be able to decide what to build. And in order to have this conversation, right, to where you tell us what you want to build, and we sort of uh, tell you how we think you should, you should build it, um, we need to be able to communicate about these things. And this is the biggest thing I want to highlight today, right? So if you're thinking about talking to the AMP team, we want to talk to you. We actually have a booth that's right, uh, I don't know, somewhere over there. I don't know what direction it's in. Uh, and we're, we're going to be standing there uh, for the next two days. And we would really love to hear about what your experience with AMP has been. What are the good things? What are the bad things? What are you trying to build? And what have you not been able to build? And how can we help enable that in the future? Um, if you cannot uh, talk to us these next few days, we're actually also taking signups um, at this bit.ly link or over at our booth um, to just kind of leave your contact information, and we'd love to get in touch with you um, later. We are, like I said before, we're really here for you, and this is, this is a very important part of, um, of the job that we do in making AMP. Um, and this is so important, I'm actually going to turn, uh, turn this slide green. If anyone's asleep, like, this is it. Come talk to us, please. Um, and then uh, the sort of second part is, how does the AMP team talk to you, right? How does the AMP team uh, make, uh, communicate about how we think that you should actually be building these, uh, building these user experiences that you're trying to build? The first thing is documentation. 
I kind of alluded to this before, right? But if we made all the best components um, that had all of, the, uh, all of the greatest user experience, that wouldn't actually help us that much unless developers are able to use them to implement these websites. And so we, you know, if you ask people what the AMP project makes, they might say a framework, they might say components. Um, but really, uh, the documentation is, is, is as important a part of our product as any of the other stuff that we make. Because we really need to be able to, to show you, uh, for a given design, how to make that, right? What components to use, and then how to successfully implement those components. But the second way we can communicate is using the component APIs themselves. Um, so again, if we think back to these customizations, Let's imagine that there's like eight, eight of these customizations, right? So we're building a new AMP carousel. We have eight different things we want to be able to customize. Um, and just for the sake of argument, we'll say that each of those things is just true false, right? There's eight binary uh, attributes on, on this component. So that gives us 64 possible carousels that we can make with this new component we're making. Um, and that's great, right? Some of those are going to be a really great user experience. And those are the ones we kind of want to push you toward. We want to sort of encourage you to um, implement those carousels on your page. Uh, some of them are going to be a fine user experience. They might be uh, appropriate in some contexts. Um, and some of them, just because the, the options don't always sort of match up that well, right? Some of them are just going to be a bad user experience. And we don't want uh, folks to, to kind of implement on those pages. But just because of the way that the component design has worked, uh, they may be possible. So we want to steer you away from the red and sort of steer you toward the green. So how do we do that? Um, one way is we can provide strong defaults, right? We don't want there to be a huge ramp up, right? We don't want you to kind of like, you know, pour out the Lego set of AMP Carousel and have to like kind of stare at the instructions or stare at all these pieces to figure out how to like get the thing that you want, right? We want you to just open the box and have like this Lego Jeep just sort of come right out. Um, and it's important to notice that the, the, the Jeep on the right is not actually any less flexible than the thing on the left. It's just already built for you. And so if you want to customize it, if you want to build it a different way, then you can sort of take it apart um, and do a new different thing. And so it's really important that when we um, have attributes in our, in our components, that uh, whatever you sort of, when you just type in, like, I want an AMP carousel, we can actually get you to a reasonable experience that then you can sort of decide how you want to customize as quickly as possible. The other thing I would say um, is that if we want developers to move faster, right, which is what we said we wanted before. Um, that often means making things simpler. And making things simpler means fewer options. And fewer options sounds scary, right? Nobody wants fewer options, um, particularly not engineers. Um, but let's talk about how this might look in, in sort of a component, uh, you know, in a component framework. So uh, I've used this sort of, these are the attributes uh, picture a million times. So these are the, the sort of customizations we want to go, go for. And let's imagine that we're, we're making a component uh, that's called AMP Base Carousel. Um, and it's pretty focused, right? It's focused on making carousels. Um, it's got all these customizations. Uh, and it takes some learning, right? Because it has so many different customizations, you have to sort of do some figuring out to get the carousel you want. Um, and this sort of like silly dot diagram at the bottom shows you that you can get good carousels, and you can get medium carousels, and you can get bad carousels. And this is kind of the way that we've approached component making in the past. Um, but as we were designing AMP Carousel, we actually made this observation that there are really sort of two, you know, we went through all these use cases. We, we, we really thought about what uh, user experiences we were trying to enable. And we realized that there's basically two different types of carousels. Right? There's one uh, type that we're calling AMP Inline Gallery that's sort of focused on one piece of content at once. Right? It's like the, the home page slide or the news gallery slide. And there's a second one that sort of gives you a stream of different options that you can more leisurely sort of um, you know, swipe through and sort of choose what you want. And I mentioned strong defaults before. It's very difficult to um, make a carousel component that has both of these sort of like, you know, ready to go by default. It's very difficult so to kind of make a component uh, that has options that uh, sort of are, are easy to understand that sort of enable both of these use cases. And so if we actually break these out into two different components, right, then we have two very focused components that each have some customizations, um, but they're much easier to learn. Because in choosing the component you want to use, you've already told us a lot about the experience that you're trying to make. And so we can sort of hold your hand and guide you through making that experience uh, much more easily. And again, you can see this dot diagram on the bottom. Um, it, it enables many fewer bad use cases, right? Because there aren't as many conflicting options um, while still uh, sort of enabling all the good use cases. 
And then I think this, uh, this sort of continuum wouldn't be complete unless we talked about you know, just all possible JavaScript, right? And now with AMP script, this is much more possible than it ever was before. Um, and in contrast to sort of the two components that I've mentioned, uh, all possible JavaScript has no focus, right? You can, you can make you know, pretty much literally anything. Um, it's got infinite flexibility, but it takes a really long time to make those things, right? It's very difficult to, to sort of learn and to develop and to debug and doing all these different things. Um, but what's interesting about this is from a developer perspective, all three of these options are now actually available in AMP. Well, sorry, uh, AMP Inline Gallery and Stream Gallery are coming in a few months. Um, so they will be soon. Uh, and so we're actually very interested. You know, we've made, I mentioned before AMP is opinionated. We have opinions um, about how you should do web development. We think that actually using the simplest possible component that's relatively opinionated about sort of uh, how to implement a great user experience is a, is a great way. But we give you all this flexibility to either use the even more flexible but harder to learn uh, base carousel or to just roll your own carousel in AMP script. And we're really, really excited to see how developers are going to sort of uh, interact with these things and whether or not um, the sort of simpler components are going to lead to sort of the fastest, the fastest road to a great user experience. So I want to end with just sort of how you can help. Um, and I mentioned before that like it's much more difficult than you might think for us to understand what it is you're trying to make um, and how the decisions that we make in AMP affect you. And so the more you talk to us, um, the more our opinions going forward will be better for you. Right? This is a win-win for everybody. Um, and so like I said before, uh, we have a booth. Please come and chat with us. Um, we'll be, we'll be you know, standing over there for the next two days. Um, please sign up to chat with us afterwards. Um, we have a ton of questions. Right? We've been sitting in our offices wondering about uh, you know, what frustrates you, and how do you work, and where do you find answers when you're lost, and all these different things. How do you even pick what component you want to use? Um, but also, like, we want to hear whatever you want to tell us. It's always the stuff that you don't anticipate. It's always the questions that you didn't have um, that are the most interesting in user experience. So uh, please sign up. Again, this is the bit.ly link again. Um, and I was, I was thinking about like, how you could sort of identify us um, at our booth. And I really wanted to make these, these badges that say, do you hate AMP? Tell me why. Um, and my manager didn't, didn't really like that idea very much. Um, so yeah, just uh, look for me. Uh, and we have some other folk, members of the UX team here. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, and to reiterate, if you take away anything from this talk, it is to go talk with Andrew and the design team over at the user experience booth. And that is in the room just behind us. It's labeled demos and tutorials. Um, Andrew will be there, so you can speak with him face to face. Um, so a couple of things before uh, we let you go to lunch. Uh, I see some really great questions coming in. but all of them seem to be in English. So, 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 えっと、なので2時半にここに戻ってくるような形で、えっと、今からお昼休憩に入ります。えっと、ランチは一番奥のえ、場所にですね、え、ランチボックスを取るところがあるんで、ぜひとも使ってください。それ以外にもランもしあ
to learn from you as much as um, you're here to learn from us. So thank you, enjoy. See you back here at 2.30 in this room. There's gonna be a live coding session. It's gonna be awesome. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
午後のセッションが始まります皆さんどうでしょうか、えー、ちゃんとお昼ご飯食べれましたでしょうかちょっとあの一点伺いたいんですけど、えー、とアンプチームと誰でもいいのでどんな形でもいいので話したっていう人どのくらいいらっしゃいますでしょうか Please, please raise your hand if you talk to the AMP team directly. Oh, yeah, we have like, what, 50% of the people? The other 50%, please、uh, leverage the、uh, breaks.、Uh, we'll be ha- more than happy to、um, sync up, meet up with you. ということで、えー、次はですね、えー、AMP.dev Live ですね、えー、これ、ライブコーディングになります。あの皆さん、ライブコーディングってされたことあるのかちょっと分かんないんですけど、私も結構、ライブコーディングしたりするんですけど、成功するものもあれば、えー、失敗するケースも結構あったりするんですね。ただなんですけど、そのなんかスリルみたいのが多分面白くて、実際にこう、えー、ライブで行われて実装がちゃんと動くのかみたいなそんな話を、えー、ちゃんと見ていただけると面白いのかなというふうに思います。えー、それではじゃあもう行っていきましょうか。So、um, let's move on to the next session, Amp Dev Live. Please welcome Crystal and Sebastian. Hi everyone, I'm Sebastian. I work at Google and、uh, we're going to do some live coding today. And I'm super excited that Crystal has agreed to help me out here because. Because friends don't let friends live code alone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I happen to be wearing a code mono today. <laughs> so we're going to show you a、yes. few of the. <laughs> Cool new features that AMP offers, but I also want to show off a few of the oldies but goldies under the AMP components. Yep, how a little bit of old world AMP meets new world AMP, and how it all exists together in the AMP ecosystem. So, what, am, what are we going to build? So,、um, as we've all been noticing, it is a conference today, and I am all about it in a kimono. I am in the session, and I would love to live code something that can give us a central hub of the conference. Okay, so、I、how about we build an AMP conference page? So, we've prepared something. So, this is, this is what we have so far. This is what we're going to start with. So, we have a really nice blue header and the agenda. And、But、it's super boring because this already exists on amp.dev. <laughs> and it looks better. <laughs> so,、uh, yeah, we want to, to make this more interactive, more engaging.、Uh, for example, we want to show live tweets about AntConf that are happening right now. Mm-hmm. We want to know、uh, what you're saying about all these sessions, but I also want to know what other people are seeing, what's going out in Tokyo and what's happening at AntConf today. So, do you think we can get some photos from the AMP team up here? We totally should get some photos from the, of the, that the AMP team made up here. So let's get started.、Uh, oh, and of course, the agenda needs also a little bit of improvement here. So we'll see what that's about. So let's take a look at the code. Oh, before we start, so we kind of have three different, our, our app has going to have three different parts. So we have the agenda, tweets, and photos. So, In order to, to be able to navigate, navigate between these two, we're going to use like a bottom toolbar. So、uh, I think that pattern works really well in mobile, and that's what we're going to focus on in, in this session. So, because it's so easy to reach with your thumb. So, and probably most of us attending are carrying our phones around, but not always our laptops. So, we're going to focus on mobile here today. So,、uh, A few words about our setup. So, we have a Node.js server running in the background, and、uh, it's serving this file here. And we also use a, a template engine to, to render this, this page. So, we have here at the top the, the AMP boilerplate code that every one of you pro- should already know. And then we have some basic styling for the header and so on, fonts. And then here we are rendering the, the, the agenda. So, it looks a bit weird, but this, these are mustache templates. And we, the server passes in the gender object that we render here. And I'm using the square brackets instead of the curly ones in order to not conflict with the,、uh, with the normal mustache templates inside of Amblist. So, what we want to do is we want to split this into, into three sections. And before we start, I'm quickly going to remove the gender. And so th- that it's easier to understand what's, what's going on. So we want to have three sections. First one is the agenda. And the second one is going to be tweets. And the third one is going to be photos.、Woo. 
So far, so good. And then we want to, to have three buttons, and each button selects a different tab. So whenever you hear select an app, you should think amp selector. It's a very useful little component that keeps you uh, the burden of having to maintain the selection state away from you. Very useful. You definitely should, should check it out. So let's add an amp selector component here. And I'm, go I'm going to add a class because we, we are going to have to style it later. So, so in here, I'm going to add three options. So the thing is... Uh, Everything that's inside an, an AMP selector and has the option attribute is going to be selectable. And we, we are going to have three elements. So it's the agenda, tweets, and photos. So here we go. No, that was a little bit too much. <laughs> and option two. Huh? So, oh, and of course, I forgot one thing. Initially, the gender should be selected. I mean, we can we can take a quick quick look on what it looks like. Pretty much like nothing. So first <laughs> of all, let's let's uh, style the the selector a bit. I'm gonna reuse our our uh, navbar class, and I'm gonna put it to the bottom. So that's the first thing. So let's check it out. Looks a little bit better, but still the buttons need a little bit of, little bit of styling. So and I have the feeling that. Uh, the flex layout is going to work just fine here. So I'm going to use display flex. And uh, then we have to, so this means the buttons are all in one column. And then we need to evenly distribute the bottoms. And we can use this using justify content and then uh, space around. And when I was new to CSS, um, Flexbox was a real lifesaver for spacing. So if you don't know much about it. Check it out. Here we go. So uh, it doesn't work because yes, <laughs> <laughs> the secret to AMP is always remembering to import the script for the component you are using. So here I'm going to include the AMP select element, and we see now we ah, can actually yeah. select now elements. You notice as we are the small outline that get gets added by default. So let's style this. So again, first I'm going to use opacity to to style the uh, currently active element. So by default, all children of toolbar have an opacity of 0.5. And uh, the selected one should have uh, an opacity of 1. So the good thing about uh, M selector is that you can easily target the, the selected element using by uh, via CSS using the selected attribute. And here, we're going to set the opacity to 1. And we're also going to set the outline to none, as we're not going to use it here. So let's take a look. Ooh. Yeah. So the opacity is looking good, but that outline is still there. Uh, damn it, too bad. So, But the reason <laughs> is, so uh, the outline is added by default in the AMP selector. And so we have to override this rule. Of the, and we have to just make them a little bit more pr precise by adding the AMP selector element here in our, our rule. And so. Outline ah. is gone, and we can switch between our beautiful buttons. Can we see so what the, it looks like with the agenda in there? Yeah. yeah. No, first we have oh, to actually implement the tabs. <laughs> so, uh, and there are different ways you can implement uh, tabs and amps. So the way I'm going to choose is to use amp bind. And the idea is to use a variable called tabs, which keep track of the current, current uh, selected tab. So uh, the first thing we do is we hide the photos and the tweets tab initially. And then we're going to add a binding to the hidden attribute, which means uh, this, will the value, this attribute will appear or disappear depending on the value. So if uh, tabs is not equal null, then the agenda will be hidden. And uh, we're going to copy this and add it to the others as well. We just change the index of each of the tabs. There's a one subtle bug, bug in here. So we see that uh, initially the agenda should be shown. However, M state or M bind, uh, M state variables are not initialized on page load. Only after an inter uh, like after a user interaction. So this means initially tabs is null. So if M state changes anything on the page, un even unrelated to the tab value, 
this basically taps is going to evaluate to null. And null is not equal to zero, which means the agenda will be hidden. So that's something really to watch out. The correct way to do this is to add an AMP state statement and then initialize the uh, AMP state using like a JSON string, or use this really dirty hack <laughs> which I'm doing by just simply checking if tabs is larger than, than zero. And null is larger than zero. OK, so the next thing we have to do is to actually change this, uh, the, the tabs variable. And we're going to do this by listening to the select element uh, event on the AMP selector class. So on select, we're going to update the AMP state. So now we're going to set the state. And we're going to set the tabs variable to the value that's passed in via the event. Here we go. And this looks pretty good, I would say. Mm -hmm. The only thing we've forgotten is to actually import AMP bind. So there's a funny little thing about AMP bind. It is the only AMP component that will not throw you a validation error if you don't import the script. I have lost way too much time to debugging <laughs> that and sent way too many emails to Sebastian no, about that, it. No, but that definitely happens to everyone. Yeah. So don't feel bad if it happens yeah. to you, but... but I always remember to import the component before you start working on it. Not like, I, not, not like I'm doing. So anyway, <laughs> while tabs are working, I can successfully switch between the different tabs. Now we have to... Uh, now I'm going to re-add our agenda back in. So let me quickly grab this from here. And yeah, let's see, let's see how it looks. So agenda is here. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And so great. Now um, it looks like we're having something set up. We have some sort of navigation. But all of this is taking up a lot of my screen space. And I'm really here to engage with the content. So I want to see what we can do about freeing up some of the space from the header and the navigation bar. And this is something I'm really excited to um, show all of you today, because it was implemented from a feature request I made when trying to um, develop some, sort, um, some guidelines around animations in AMP. And something that's really common that a lot of people ask for is these scroll away headers. And it's something that's really, really hard to do in AMP, and it's really, really hard to do even in pages that don't use AMP. But now that it's been implemented through um, one of my favorite components, which is the AMP FX collection. It is just so easy to do. So now that I've imported it, um, the AMP FX collection works by adding a cute little attribute to whatever other component you want to have an effect um, or a transition to. And that is AMP FX. And I'm going to give it a value of float in top, and that's it. Let's see if it does anything. No, but wait. <laughs> Just like that. And here's what's so cool about it, too, is it tracks which direction your users are scrolling in. And often when users are scrolling down, it's because they're engaging with your content. And when they start to scroll back up, it's because um, often the navigation is up at the top of the bar. And if you have a hamburger menu up there, we know that our users are scrolling up, and they're probably looking for that. And it just floats right in. And here's the thing. I also have my nav bar at the bottom. My users don't need to use that while they're engaging with my content. So um, I'm going to copy this, although it's such a short bit of code. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> and I'm just going to copy it on the navigation bar at the bottom. And just going to tweak something really quick, because guess what? It's at the bottom. All right, let's take a quick look, see if it did anything here. And voila, my page is now pure content and now pure navigation. So now that I can see all this lovely content, I think it's time to add a little bit more to it. Yeah, definitely. So let's do live tweets. So uh, the idea is we want to show all the tweets that are happening at the moment about AmpConf. And yeah, we want to display them inside the Tweets tab, but they should be updated in real time. So when there are new tweets coming up, I want to see a little bit telling me, hey, they're new tweets. You want to read them? And when you click on them, they should appear. 
And in M, there's this fantastic little component which people should be using more. It's called AMP Live List, which does exactly this. And the cool thing about it, it is it's super easy to implement because it, you don't need to do anything in your backend. You don't have to do warp sockets or whatever. You just surf your page, page and AMP runtime takes care of basically checking with your backend whether there are any changes and if there are, merging them into, into the current page. So let's, let's take a look how it, how it works. So let's close this one here, and we're going to now work And you guys can help us out by getting some tweets ready, but don't send them out yet. Hang yeah. in there with us. <laughs> So I'm going to use the AMP live list. So it requires a little bit of configuration. So the first thing is uh, how many items I want to display per page. So there's built-in pagination support. We don't worry about it too much at the moment. Let's just go with 50. We need an ID. And we need an ID because there's an update button that is required that is going to be displayed if there's new con con content. And that ID links the um, on tap action, which is um, put through AMP Actions and Event. So was the select one. Um, so we highly recommend reading the guide on AMP Actions and Event. It's what really opens the doors to all that engagement and um, interaction on your pages. Cool. And then here comes the important part. There's a diff with the items attribute. And everything, every child of this diff can be auto updated. So and uh, each child needs an ID and a data sort time, which is just a way to, which is a timestamp that helps M runtime to, to correctly sort the items. So now I'm going to use uh, server side templating. So our backend before it serves a page is going to make a request to the Twitter API, gets the latest tweets for AMCONF, and then going to feed them into to this template so we can access the uh, tweets array in here. And the tweets array uh, contains, it's just a pure list of tweets. And each tweet is going to have an ID that we use here. And you see I'm already mixing up yeah. <laughs> the normal mustache templates with, with my custom ones. The sort time is just a timestamp. And we should slash that hash under the last tweets. Oh, yes. Yeah. That thanks. That would have been a Copy mark slash later. that hash. It's mine. So, and then in here, we're going to print the text of the tweet. OK. I think that's that's it. Nope, nope, it's not. Nope, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> this is why friends don't let friends code alone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, I, of course, need to import the lifeless <laughs> component. But let's give this a try. So here's our page. We see tweets. Uh, they look really ugly. <laughs> give me a moment. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm quickly going to reuse the same cards class we, we use for the uh, for the agenda. So no, it's still ugly, but at least readable. Send your tweets now. Yeah. So send your tweets, and the M Live List will gonna gonna check every 15 seconds. And the easy way to to debug this is in the Chrome Dev Tools. Whoa! Ooh, there are tweets. We have new Excellent. tweets. You guys, thank you. <laughs> Great instruction follow. So let's see. Yeah, something about FX collection. So you see. Mm -hmm. Live updates inside an AMP page. It was super easy to implement because, yeah, you don't need to do anything more or less. Just use the, the component. It's already there. Yeah. OK, so now we can see what sessions are going on. Um, we know what people are saying about them. And thank you for saying so many kind <laughs> things, everyone. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and see what people have to say about it. Look at that. Look, ah, so many tweets. Ah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get some visuals up here. So let me go ahead and close some of these so that we can see what's happening. All right, so in the photo section, I'm going to use a component that is similar in name but different in use, and that is AMP list. And it's going to do this really cool thing where it also uses AMP mustache. AMP list and AMP mustache are best friends. They love each other. You should always be importing them together. Um, and I'm going to use a fixed height layout. Um, but I'm going to give the height um, a value of 80 view heights. That way, the height of the list can adjust to all of my users' screen size, um, but also give me an idea of how large my list is. And my source code is going to be, or my source URL, <laughs> <is> <laughs> all, all of this is our source code, <laughs> is going to be slash photos. All right. 
and this has come together really well. Um, and then because I want my amp list to render a bunch of photos from my JSON backend at slash photos, um, inside of the templating, I need to uh, use a photo, um, an image tag. Now, AMP does require some specific replacements to classic HTML tag, and any AMP developer can tell you AMP image is one of those. So let me go ahead and put it in. And AMP image has a couple extra requirements. It requires a layout, and I'm going to make mine responsive. And then it requires a width. And from my JSON object, I don't have to know exactly what the width and height is, um, I can just add it in here. Which conveniently our backend provides. Yes, yes, thank you. And then responsive needs an S, thank you. Thanks. That would have taken me ages to see. Yeah, responsive. Yeah, I like the live coding hands. <laughs> They're basically jazz hands up here. They're trying to type. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and for my source URL, can we guess what's going in there? That's right, URL, and not SRC. <laughs> All right, so what's so cool about AMP list and why um, we want to use it, especially for photos, is it has this amazing, amazing ability to do infinite scroll because it renders on the client side. And it's so easy to implement. We just add this real quick attribute, which what does infinite list uh, do? It loads more, and I'm going to set it to auto. And what auto does is it means as my user is scrolling through whatever it is I've put in, in, into my AMP list JSON, it knows what the next set of objects is coming up and makes a customized request for those objects to come up. It is so easy to do. Uh, from this side. From the, yeah. <laughs> Your backend, of course, needs to support like pagination. So basically, uh, AMP uh, list will tell your backend, like, now give me page one, now give me page two, now give me page three, which is pretty straightforward to implement. And before I forget to do it, I am going to import the scripts for these two things. So import custom element AMP list. And then we're going to do import custom template, and it's going to auto do it to AMP Mustache. Since AMP Mustache is currently the only custom, um, the only AMP templating system we have available. All right, so uh, let's see what lovely photos our uh, AMP team has provided us with. And look at that, wonderful photos of Tokyo. Oh, see more? Yeah, Should we go? I totally want to see more. Oh, <laughs> this one I think is our favorite one. This is Ben. He's on the same team as Sebastian and I, and he's running the tutorials over there. So please um, go talk to him. He's as fun as he looks. <laughs> so these photos look really great. I'm so excited to see that I can scroll forever. But I think we can make them look just a little bit better. And since I've already imported the AMP FX collection, I should really utilize another option. And since I'm scrolling into the unknown abyss, I think I would like my photos to fade in. And it's just as easy as that float in top and float in bottom. That is AMP FX. And I'm going to do fade in. And let's see if um, what a difference that makes. And it does. Oh, here they are fading in. And oh, that just makes beautiful. it look so much nicer. And the AMP FX collection has just so many things that are easy to implement. You can have them fade in and out depending on which way your user scrolls. They can fly in from the top, the bottom, the side, the left, the right. Everything on your page can fly in. We don't recommend doing it, but you can. Um, and you can customize um, at the rate the effects do it. One of the uh, engineers on the core team, Kathy, um, wrote a really great document on it on our examples guide in amp.dev. Please go check it out. And just one last thing to highlight is you can your users can scroll forever and ever and ever. And because we've added that float in top and float in bottom, they don't have to scroll all the way back to the top to access your thing. <laughs> all right. So we're looking really good. We have a lot of great things to look at. We have a lot of great things to read. But I think yeah, this the agenda is still a little, definitely needs a, yeah. a little bit more work. So I mean, it says at the top, I'm conf live. But I mean, this agenda is as static as it gets. So uh, 
Instead, what I want to do is basically at least have a little banner at the top that tells me which session is currently going on. And the question is, how do we implement this in AMP? So one approach would be using AMP Live List. So it pulls uh, periodically for an updated session, but that feels wrong because it means it's what waste users spend with. And that's something that you could easily calculate on the client. Unfortunately, AMP Bind doesn't really support these kind of date-based calculations yet. However, thankfully, today we learned about AMP script, and you can run your own JavaScript inside of your AMP page. And I think this is a pretty good use case for this. <laughs> so let's, let's use AMP script. So we're going to go uh, to our agenda. And here I'm going to add the AMP script element. So th it supports two layout modes. I'm going to use the, the fixed height layout. And I think a height of 64 for a pixel is going to work just fine. And uh, so the advantage of the fixed high layout is because it uh, avoids that the script is going to change its height. So we can mo modify, uh, mutate the DOM on page load, which is exactly what we want to do. So basically, page loads, we calculate the current sections and we'll, we'll display it here. So And then, of course, we have to uh, provide a JavaScript file. Inside our <laughs> file, it's crazy. So uh, that we're going to implement that later. One thing you should add is a placeholder, and I'm going to give it an ID. Let's call it session, and I'm also going to add a little bit of styling. I'm going to use our style card, but I'll make the color pop out a little bit more. And uh, Sebastian is adding inline style right now, which is not super new in AMP, but it is new to this AMP comp. This was not available last AMP comp. So we have a couple of exciting things happening right now. We have inline styling happening inside of AMP script. It's an exciting moment. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and our placeholder is not going to do anything except like display loading. So the next step is to actually implement our JavaScript file. So I'm going to put it into the right folder. I hopefully going to give it the right name. I know y'all are looking out for us. So, <laughs> so and inside here, basically, we can use uh, the normal uh, DOM APIs as you uh, would do as like if your JavaScript would be run inside the browser. So we can get our label, like from the document using get element by ID, and I call it session. So and then, for example, we can we can modify it because and this is possible because we are in the fixed height mode. So I'm gonna just gonna say because we have nothing more to say except loading. But <laughs> we can say this time, AMP script loads this. So and this part is called hydration. So there's an uh, initially an element rendered server side that's being displayed, and then our JavaScript runs, which then kind of takes. Uh, swaps this element out by the element that's generated by our AMP script here. So let's take no, let's not take a look. First, I have to import <laughs> import AMP script. Okay, I feel better. So and we see, I don't know, it, it happened quite quickly at the top. So you see first loading and then AMP script, and this means the hydration is finished and AMP script has taken over control of our label. So we just witnessed Java, JavaScript in an AMP file. So that's an AMP document. That's pretty exciting. So now let's do the last bit. And uh, real quick, so now we have to get uh, our, uh, our session. So I'm going to implement a little function called update session, which uh, it's just going to calculate the current section. And the cool thing is you can do fetch requests inside your AMP script. So I'm going to get the response, and it's going to be asynchronous. So uh, I need to use the wait keyword here. And the only downside at the moment of AMP script is that you uh, have to use absolute URLs. Hopefully, that's going to change soon. And I can get the sessions from, from, no, from this JSON endpoint. And then I can get the actual sessions array from by unpacking the JSON response from our element. And now we can calculate the, the current session by getting the current time. This is just a new date. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get the new time. And a session is an array. We can, uh, so now we want to get the current session. 
we're going to find it inside an hour of our array, hopefully. So then we're going to have a session. Uh, here we go. And then the session is the active one. If the t current time is bigger than the start date of the session, and if the time is smaller than the end date of the session. Okay? So, and once we have this, we can update our label. And we say, okay, the session might be null if mconf is over. So we have to check that first. And if it's not null, we say, okay, it's a title. Otherwise, it says no active session. Sorry. <laughs> and, and that's it. And let's take a look. So we load our page. And it and looks <laughs> like it is time for next generation. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Oh, we went so. over time. Oh, I'm sorry about <laughs> that. Anyway, <laughs> we hope we could show you a few cool things about what you can do with AMP. And yeah, hope to get you uh, excited about trying more of the new features that we've just released. Yes. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Did it go well? I'm, I'm yes. watching the live stream. <laughs> I'm watching the live stream. Live stream, I'm watching the live stream. 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 ページを作るってことは可能になってきたんですけどやっぱりウェブに携わってる人たちって、えー、デベロッパーだけじゃないんですよね。コード書けない人とかっていうのも当然ウェブサイトを開きたいかもしれないしストアを開きたいかもしれないそういう人たちのためにやっぱり CMS っていうものがありますということでですね次のセッションは日本が誇るですねオープンソースの CMS の EC キューブからのセッションになります So the next session will be all in Japanese So if you could put on your mic it will be translated into English So if you could do that, that would be great um, so let's move on to the next section. Now, the next session will be Next Generation UX of EC Cube powered by AMP. Please welcome Kiyotaka from EC Cube and Mitsu from Sunday Systems. ちょっと受けましたね。ありがとうございます。それではここからは私、ECCUBEの奥清高とサンデーシステムズの長沼がECCUBEの約3万店舗のEC サイトがECキューブで構築され、現在も稼働しています。昨年の10月にはECキューブのメジャーバージョンアップである このようにEC-Cube は成長を続けているのですが、これまでは EC-Cube、バックエンドの開発と最適化に注力してきました。EC-Cube4のリリースに伴い、次のステップとしてよりよいユーザー体験のためにフロントエンドを改善したい、そうい
軽く機能を紹介しておきますとプラグインを入れることで通常ページよりもパフォーマンスの高いアンプページを提供することができますまたアンプページはレスポンシブルに対応していますのでデスクトップ版でもモバイル版でも同じようなユーザー体験を提供することができますホー,ムページホーム画面に追加することでネイティブアプリのような振る舞いを提供することも可能ですここからはプラグインの詳細な実装について長沼さんの方に紹介していただきたいと思います、はい、では EC キューブアンププラグインの実装詳細ということでアンププラグインがどういった形でアンプテンプレートを生成しているかまたこのプラグインがどういった役割を担っているかなどについてお話しさせていただきますまずプラグインの大きな役割として、えー、次のようなものがありますまず一つ目ですが従来の EC キューブが持つツイグテンプレートこちらをアンプに対応したツイグテンプレートとして、えー、追加することですこれはサイトのトップ商品一覧商品詳細といったページそしてブロックと呼ばれる、えー、検索ボックスなどのページの構成要素が該当しますそして2つ目、フロント側で実行されるアンプの処理、その設定などに関する部分を管理インターフェースと連携させる機能の追加です。例えば、アンプオプティマ,アンプオプティマイザーと呼ばれるツールを使って、最適化処理を行ったアンプページを自身のサーバーから配信するといった設定、こういった部分を管理インターフェースを通じて実現していきます。ちなみにこちらのオプティマイザーの設定はあくまでオプションという位置づけになりますので最適化を行わず Google アンプキャッシュを通じてサイトを配信することは可能ですそして3つ目 Web アプリマニフェストとサービスワーカーを自動で追加しインストールするだけでシンプルな PWA 化を実現することこれら3つがアンププラグインの持つ大きな役割となりますそれではまず一つ目に挙げた役割アンプ対応したツイグテンプレートに関してお話しさせていただきます EC キューブをアンプ化する際プラグインインストール時に追加されたアンプテンプレートはすでにいくつかのアンプコンポーネントが組み込まれておりインタラクティブな UI を実現しています元のツイグファイルの構造をベースにコンポーネントを組み込んでいるんですが組み込みの際にいくつか考慮しておくべきポイントがありますそれは従来の EC キューブ,ーーキューブページが持つインタラクションそれをアンプ対応した際も実現する必要性があることですここで EC キューブの商品詳細ページを例にとってお話しさせていただきます表示しているスマートフォンのアニメーションセレクトボックスの操作に応じて商品金額や商品コードが変更されているのが見て取れるかと思います EC キューブの商品詳細ページではサイズカラーといった任意で設定できる商品規格がセレクトボックスとして実装されておりこれらのセレクトボックスの変更を通じて次のようなインタラクションが発生します目に見えるところでは商品の金額やコードの変更在庫有無を判定してボタンのデザインの変更そして目に見えないところではフォーム内体の変更といったものですこちらは EC キューブのツイグテンプレート内に記述されている JavaScript のコードの一部です既存の EC キューブではフォーム周りの挙動を JQuery ベースで実装されていますが当然アンプページでは使用できませんですのでインタラクションの部分はアンプコンポーネントを使って実現していきます先ほどご覧いただいたセレクトボックスを操作しその操作に応じた動的な挙動を実現するにはアンプリストアンプバインドアンプマスタッシュといったアンプコンポーネントが必要になりますこちらは実装部分のソースコードです大まかな流れとしてはアンプリストで JSON ファイルを取得アンプマスタッシュで取得した JSON ファイル内のデータをアンプリスト内にレンダリングその後アンプバインドでセレクトボックスの変更をトリガーとして動的な挙動を実現するというものになりますまずアンプリストタグに記述している SRC 属性バックエンド側で生成した JSON ファイルを読み込んでいる点を確認していただけるかと思いますそしてテンプレートタグ内に記述されている箇所読み込んだ JSON データの内容に応じてマスタッシュ記法で表示する内容を変えています次にセレクトタグに注目していただくと
本属性に設定したチェンジイベントがインタラクションのトリガーとなっていることがわかるかと思いますこのようなインタラクションは商品詳細ページ以外にも実装されておりアンプ対応時には代替の手法となる機能をアンプコンポーネントを使って適宜組み込み元の EC キューブと変わらないインタラクションを実現するというところがポイントとなります続きましてプラグインの役割の2つ目アンププラグインを導入することによって管理インターフェース側で拡張される機能そしてそれがフロント側とどういった連携を行っているかについてお話しさせていただきます EC キューブは CMS ですのでアンプ化に伴うさまざまな設定は当然管理インターフェースを通じて容易に行えることが求められますアンププラグインを導入することによってサイトのアンプ構成をどうするかといった選択やソースコードや CSS の編集ができるようになりますプラグインのインストールが完了すると管理インターフェースのプラグイン一覧というところからその内容を確認していただけますプラグイン一覧の画面から先に進んでいただくとまずペアアンプアンプファーストの設定に関する項目が出てきますペアアンプでは通常の HTML ページとアンプページがペアで作成されますアンプファーストはアンプページのみが存在する構成となりどちらも Google アンプキャッシュを通じてページを配信することができますそして次に最適化項目として最適化処理 URL を入力する箇所がありますこれは登録項目でアンプファーストを選択した時,選択した時のみに利用できる箇所でアンプオプティマイザーを利用して自己,自己最適化処理を可能にする連携機能です例えば GCP 上のクラウドファンクションズこちらにアンプオプティマイザーによる最適化を行う API を作成しそちらと連携させたとします管理インターフェースより最適化の指示を出し EC キューブサーバーから追具テンプレートを API に投げ最適化されたアンプページを再度 EC キューブサーバーで受け取ってそのデータを元の EC キューブサーバーから最適化したアンプとして配信するということを可能にしていますご存知の方も多いかと思いますがアンプオプティマイザーは次のような処理を行ってくれますこれにより Google アンプキャッシュによって実行されるパフォーマンスの最適化を自身のサイト上で行うことが可能となりますアンププラグインでは最適化したアンプドキュメントを追具のテンプレートとして利用している点が特徴的なのではないかと思います次にアンプ対応したページの CSS に関してですがこちらは各ページのスタイルを管理インターフェースを介して各々を挿入することができます CSS 登録項目では入力内容の容量を表示する形になっており大元のアンプ設定ページの CSS そして各ペ,ージの各ページで設定した CSS の合算を表示するようになっています CSS の総容量が 50kB を超えないように留意することができるというところです例えばアンプ設定ページはノーマライズ CSS などを設定しそして各ページでデザインに即した CSS を設定するということが可能ですそしてプラグインの役割として挙げた3つ目 PWA 化について触れておきたいと思いますアンププラグインはインストール時点で Web アプリマニフェストとサービスワーカーを自動で追加し PWA 化したサイトとして動作しますこれによりホーム画面から起動リソースの先読みといった PWA の機能が利用できます現段階での PWA の機能は非常にシンプルなものですが今後、サイト運用者がアプリ的機能を実装することを検討できると、そのベースとして活用していただけるのではないかと思います。そして、サービスワーカーの生成にはワークボックスライブラリを使用しています。CMS ベンダーがデザインカスタマイズを行った際などには、改めて実情に即したサービスワーカーを生成して、AMP プラグインに登録していただくことが可能です。なお、ウェブアプリマニフェストについては、管理画面より改変が可能となっています。先にご紹介した管理インターフェースのアンプ設定ページ、こちらよりドキュメントを登録することが可能です。では最後に、このプラグインを使った事例をご紹介させていただきたいと思います。こちらはサングラスやメガネを取り扱う EC サイトでして、トップ、商品一覧、商品詳細ページは、アンプファーストな設定として運用しています。ご覧いただいているようにサイトをホーム画面から起動することが可能です
そしてユーザーが検索から AMP 対応しているページに訪問しその後 PWA 化したページに移動する際すでに先読みしたリソースをサービスワーカーから受け取って高速なユーザー体験を提供できるという形になっていますありがとうございますそれでは最後に今後の我々の展望をお話しさせていただきたいと思いますえー、より多くのユーザーに、えー、アンプを体験していただくため、えー、我々の持つ ECCube.co というプラットフォームを通じてアンプを利用しやすい環境を目指していきたいと思いますまたプラグインの方も改善していき、えー、無限スクロールの実装であったり、えー、アンプサービスウォーカーの対応、えー、サインド HTTP エクスチェンジなどさまざまな機能に対応していきたいと思いますそして何より、えー、今日一つ事例を紹介していただきましたがさせていただきましたがもっとより多くの事例を作っていきたいと思いますえー、皆さんと一緒にアンプを普及していきたいと思いますもし必要であれば我々にお声かけください以上ありがとうございましたありがとうございました Awesome awesome Thank you so much for such a great presentation about how AMP is working with CMSs and I really love hearing about how AMP can enable people without um, such a great background in web development um, so that they can still have great performing interactive pages. And after seeing that merchant site, I'm thinking I might need to get a new pair of shades. It's a little bright up here on the stage. Um, well, coming up next, we're going to um, have a talk called Embracing a Mobile First Approach and how retail giants can shifting um, using AMP into um, embracing this mobile first platform. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Perry. Hello, everybody. How are we all doing? I hope we're doing wonderful. Um, my name is Perry Lally. I am one of the senior product owners for George.com, uh, based out in the United Kingdom, uh, more specifically in Leicester. I know some of you guys may have heard of Leicester. Uh, we are honored to have uh, Japanese international Shinji Okazaki representing our city, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about how George.com have embraced a mobile first approach, putting everything that you've heard today into context, uh, into a real life scenario. Uh, this will include our initial problem statement, some data to back that up, Uh, the adoption of AMP, and actually some of the problems that we faced on the way, because not everything is, uh, is rosy. So, out of interest, who here knows who Walmart is? Hands up. Keep your hands up if you know who Asda are. And then finally, George.com. So we went down every time, as expected. But hopefully, after the next slide, uh, everybody will know a little bit about George.com. So we were founded in 1990 by a man called George Davis. Uh, he also founded UK retailer Next, whom some of you may have heard of. Uh, so I've got the clicker in my pocket. So in 1999, Walmart acquired Asda to invest into the UK market, which actually included George.com fashion and home branding. Then. In 2008, the George.com website went online and fully transactional, which is currently equating to 10% of total revenue, which is fairly significant. As you can see, we have 540 stores in the United Kingdom, of which George Clothing and Home is present in every single one of them. We are currently live in 26 countries across Europe, and we have plans this year to launch our Rest of the World project, which will see us go into over 70 countries worldwide, planning the takeover. So, There's been a lot of change in the last 11 years since we launched online. Specifically, the biggest change that we have seen is customers visiting from their, mobile, from their desktop devices to their mobile devices. So, the huge shift in e commerce puts mobile at the top of the game. And this slide behind me really brings that to life. This is the George.com trending traffic over the last four years. So, our customers. Are mobile, and that means that we must be mobile too. To do this, we had to focus on three key things. First of all, we had to shift our colleague mindset. So, colleagues are sat at their desks every day working on their laptops, looking at the desktop site, because this is what's built into their brains. This is the easiest thing to do. But our customers are not doing that. We needed to encourage our colleagues to get their personal phones out of their pockets at work, check the mobile website, test the mobile website to make sure that it is working for the customer. 
there was still the traditional awkward feeling of colleagues getting their personal device out at work because maybe their manager would think that they're texting or WhatsApping or not doing what they should. And we needed to break this barrier. We needed to shift the colleague mindset to embrace a mobile first approach. Secondly, the adaptive website. So we actually launched our desktop site onto the mobile phones. There's not enough real estate for the customers to navigate or use it. It's, it's a terrible experience and that needed changing. So with that, we launched our mobile friendly adaptive website, which today is our PWA. And then finally, and last but not least, site speed. So it's all well and good having a great user experience on mobile, the best in the whole world. But if it takes 10 seconds to load, what's the point? Customers can do a lot of things in 10 seconds. They can go and put the kettle on. They can start to read a book. One thing they will not do is wait for your web, web page to load. They'll simply go elsewhere. They can click into the URL bar, search for another brand, and off they are into another shop. So four years ago, our site was loading at eight seconds. Horrendous. Uh, and four years on, after 20% of our total capacity investment into site speed, we were loading at two seconds, which was a huge achievement for us. But people ask why. The board, the managers, why invest so much time, so much money into site speed? Why is it so important? Well, to put it simply, customers expect, customers demand a fast loading website. Or as I mentioned, that it's so easy for them to go elsewhere, they will do that, they will leave. We discovered on George.com that one second of site speed could be worth up to 5% of revenue for your business. This is an opportunity we simply cannot miss. So in summary, speed is king. So we are now loading at two seconds on average. We've optimized as much as we possibly can without stripping away functionality, without making our images one pixel so they can't even be seen. We needed something else. AMP was the next logical step for us. We were the first major retailer in the United Kingdom to launch AMP on our site. We looked at AMP as a way to complement our mobile website, to increase our page load time, to give customers the experience that they deserve. But the question was, was this the right thing to do? There was no research available for us of other retailers who had um, adapted AMP onto their website. So we really needed to be bold. We needed to take a risk and go for it. So we launched a two-month experiment to measure a guaranteed fast first impression from, George, from Google search results to George.com. We launched 250,000 AMP pages. We, we were certainly bold. We have our home page, category landing page, product listings page, and category listings pages. Uh, that we're seeing AMP. I've gone backwards. So it was critical that we had the AMP pages had feature parity with a non-AMP site. In no way were we going to compromise our user experience for site speed. We set out to do both, world-class speed and world-class functionality. In order to do this, we required a couple of AMP components, as you've heard about today, such as AMP bind to create our interactive color and size selectors, as you can see on the slide behind me, and also AMP list to load dynamic prices and determine product availability. But to power Amplist, we needed an API and a system to manage the AMP cache to ensure that our products, prices, and availability were always correct in the AMP cache to avoid a mismatch from our site and the canonical. So we turned to Want Mobile, our AMP partner, for assistance here. And a special shout out to Madison and Rob, who are here in the audience today. Please talk to them if you have the time. They are great guys. So, several times per day, the George CMS pushes product data into the Want Mobile platform. The data is used in populating AMP templates and in the API that powers the AMP list components. The WAMP system manages the AMP cache using Google's AMP Update API when necessary to ensure that fresh AMP pages are displayed to our customers. When customers add to cart, perform a search, or log in, the AMP pages integrate with the existing George CMS to handle that transaction. From an analytics perspective, we are both using Adobe Analytics and Google Analytics, 
which makes measurement relatively easy. But I'll come on to that soon. So what did we find out? We had our problem statement. We had a plan. We had the build complete. But what did we see? Well, speed made all the difference. Our users are both responding to and valuing speed, as I've mentioned earlier to you guys. We saw 75% faster page loads across our AMP pages versus the canonicals, with the majority of pages loading in less than one second. This visual comparison brings that to life. So using web page test, we, we were able to measure the canonical on a 3G connection, loading visually complete in five seconds. The AMP page, served from the Google cache, is visually complete, ready to interact with in just one second at phenomenal speed. We also saw a 12% click-through rate improvement from Google search results. Customers are identifying and relating to the AMP icon in their journey. They know what it means, they know the page will load fast, and they're more likely to interact with it. However, with an increase in traffic, you're not necessarily guaranteed an increase in conversion. You're not guaranteed strong converting traffic. Therefore, you could expect an increase in bounce rate too. However, with AMP, we saw a 14% decrease in bounce rate, and that simply has to be put down to the speed of the pages. We saw a huge 56% increase in pages per visit for customers in their AMP journey. Customers who are on a mission, they know what they want to get, and they want it fast. If our search result is present in the customer search, and they interact, the chances have doubled for a customer likely to carry on shopping and browse more pages on your website. So I mentioned earlier that George.com were the first major retailer in the UK to enable AMP. We were also the first major retailer in the UK to turn off AMP. We saw great numbers, hugely in favor of AMP. However, the method of measurability was not ideal. Usually, for new features or initiatives, A-B testing is the best approach. You A-B test to decide on the key metrics to see what is better, the control or the variant. However, you cannot A-B test AMP being enabled or disabled on any given page, meaning we were, able to, we were having to use the before and after approach to measure. George.com is seasonal. We see peaks throughout the year in different metrics. For example, uh, Easter or Christmas, but then there's also things that we do not plan for, such as uh, Love Island on TV, or a tweet that's gone viral can really spike our metrics. So it was really hard to absolutely knuckle down what AMP did versus other growth around the business. So we decided to reverse test this. We measured before and after, but what about after, after? So we disabled AMP for four months, for a fair test, to split out those numbers to really determine what AMP did versus the natural growth of the business. So as you can see on the slides, the numbers were as expected. They flipped. We saw the increase with the online of AMP, and we saw the decrease in our key metrics with the turn off of AMP. For example, a 6.6% .6 lower click-through rate, 17% worse balance rate. The numbers made sense. And this is where our decision was made that AMP was successful for George.com. One of the challenges we faced are when the AMP pages are viewed, we are still on Google.com. We load Adobe Analytics using the native config, which loads the analytics scripts in an iframe. And the source of that iframe is Asda.com. Because the analytics scripts are running from Asda.com, and we are on Google.com, Apple's intelligent tracking prevention considers our analytics a third party and disregards cookies for new users. So because our analytics tracking cookies do not stick, in Adobe, our new iOS users show an artificial 100% bounce rate. Many other metrics are correct, but for metrics such as bounce rate, we only look at Android users. However, Google Analytics has solved this problem with the AMP Client ID API. So we also use Google Analytics. This gives us two data sets to use and compare against each other. We are currently working on signed exchanges, and we're excited to see that technology move into production. Signed exchanges will allow our AMP pages to be served from the Google cache 
while also retaining our URL in the URL bar, allowing our analytics and cookies to work correctly. So we had a problem. We had AMP. We had no AMP. What's next? George.com have just launched a React-based website and, so, and with a complete change in user experience. So now we've had the trial of switching off AMP. We want to re-enable AMP on our new website as soon as possible, and we're aiming to get 250,000 pages live by the end of June. But following that, the next logical step is for George to build a PWAMP, a great word. I don't know how that will translate. but So using AMP pages in our PWA is the best way to leverage our investment in AMP and leverage everything we've learned so far. The AMP pages, the AMP patterns, and the AMP way to guaranteeing speed. A unified, fast mobile experience for search results and main site. So I'm not expecting you all to remember everything I've said today, uh, but if you are going to take anything away, do not forget, you do not give up functionality to gain speed. You want both. And also be brave. We have to take calculated risks to see the rewards. With AMP, it was a big risk, and our board were not too sure about it because there was no research. It was not a strong enough business case at that point. But we took the risk, and we saw the reward. So that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm about for the next couple of days. If you want, if you want to ask any questions, uh, please just grab me, and I'll be happy to talk to you guys. Thank you very much. えー、いかがでしたでしょうか、モバイルファーストの話も出てきました、パフォーマンスの話も出てきました、非常に面白かったかなと思います、国内でも、えー、っと、まあ、Google サーチのクエリーがこうデスクトップからモバイルに移って、モバイルの方が多くなってきたのが、まあ、ここ最近だと思うんですけど、何年,何年ぐらいでしたっけ、なんなはい、はい、はい。はい、2015年5月あの、えーと、ウェブマスターですごく有名なあの、えー、トップコンティビューターの,あの鈴木健さんがここにいるのでせっかくなので聞いてみました、な2015年ぐらいからやっぱり国内でもです、ね、モバイルのトラフィックがすごく、えー、伸びているという話なので、まあ、大事かなと思いますし、えー、私、よく使うデータとしては、まあ、皆さん聞いたこともあるかもしれませんが、53% のユーザーは3秒時間、あのペイスピードが遅れると離脱してしまうという話もあるので、まあ、そこでアンプを使っていくというのは、まあ、すごく、えー、至極、えー、真っ当な話なのかなというふうに思います。さて、あのー、次はです、ね、ずいぶんガラッとテーマが変わります、えー、新しいウェブのフォーマットっていうところで、えー、ちょっとですね私も本当に楽しみに、えー、していますなんか、えー、ビジネスサイドの人も聞いてもすごく面白いんじゃないかなと思いますはいということで、えー、早速次のセッションに、えー、移っていきましょう Let's,、uh, Let's move on to the next session AMP Stories 2019 Please welcome John and Hong Hi, my name is John, and I'm the lead developer for AMP Stories. Hello, everyone. My name is Hong. I'm the lead interaction designer working on AMP Story format and also AMP Story on Google Services. We're super excited to be here today to walk you through what's new for AMP Stories in 2019. So, let's start it with something we use every day. We do a diverse range of activities with our mobile phones on a daily basis. Like chatting with your friend, ordering food, navigating to new places, watching TV, movie shows, playing games. Beyond all those basic activities, we also found ourselves spending more time discovering or consuming content directly from the mobile devices. A lot of the traditional content channels, like newspapers or magazines, have been converted from the print media to the digital media. But we see that most of the digital content are designed for desktop access instead of following a good usability guidance on mobile. So, therefore, we often face challenges when we read content on mobile screens. Your desktop size decreases from this big to this, but the amount of the content you need to consume stays the same, right? I know. It's really painful because you get less time to read the content. And you have to keep moving your page to the other part of the content instead of simply just glancing everything at one place. It's also hard to track the reading and manage the reading time. 
For myself, I often find myself opening a bunch of articles on mobile screen every day, but I don't find myself finishing reading them that often. Because of the suffering to read traditional, long-form articles on mobile screens, we're hoping for more visual forms of storytelling and a better content-consuming experience that designed for mobile first. We see that the visually rich content format are getting more and more popular in the native world. But visually rich content on web is still real because it's difficult and expensive to create. So to create a better open form for visual storytelling on the mobile web, we launched the developer preview for AMP Stories last year in February. With AMP Stories, we deliver mobile-first bite-sized content to users and then immerse them with fast-loading full-screen experience. We also start allowing publisher to do easy visual-driven visual narratives with engaging motions and tappable interactions. What's even more awesome, the AMP Story format is free and it's part of the open web. So it's open for anyone who wants to try on their own site. And it's also easy to be shared or embedded across the whole web instead of being locked into a closed ecosystem or platform. In the past one year, we're excited to see publishers creating a lot of great AMP stories on a diverse of topics, each with their own unique design on storytelling. We see great stories made for news, lifestyle content, politics, science, TV shows, visual essays, celebrity stories, game reviews, sports, and many other cool topics. We're also working hard to make the AMP story format even better. So now I'm going to hand off to John to walk you through the exciting AMP story format updates. Thanks, Hong. During AMP Story's origin trial, we saw that there was real interest in this type of content. Publishers of all sorts joined us for our origin trial, and they were able to build real stories with the format, some of which you just saw. But the origin trial was limited in scope and only focused on a small number of use cases. So we on the core AMP Stories team have been hard at work expanding the capabilities of the format uh, so that it can work for everyone. So let's walk through a few of the features that we've added to help out here. First is localization. When we launched the origin trial and developer preview last year, last February, it was in English only. We now support 21 different locales, but more importantly, we've built a generalizable framework around localization in AMP so that AMP Stories uh, system-provided user interfaces can be translated into any language easily. The framework not only includes the ability to add these new translations, but also includes the ability to flip the user interface for right-to-left languages, like Arabic. To, new, to use new languages, you can simply set the lang attribute on the HTML tag of the document with your story to the locale code for the, the language that your locale you would like to use. Um, and if you want to enable right to left support, then you can set the DIR, which stands for direction, attribute of the HTML tag to RTL. As an example, Rakuten is a major internet company based right here in Tokyo, actually. They run one of the largest recipe sites in Japan, Rakuten Recipe, which has over one and a half million recipes for you to enjoy for free. Rakuten Recipe is experimenting with publishing AMP stories, and you see one here, which is, I believe, the top 10 most popular sweets, which they all look pretty good, I think. Uh, but as we, uh, as we get to the end of the story, we see what we call the templated bookend UI, um, which provides links, related articles, sharing options, and so forth. Um, and this templated, I, templated UI is partially specified by the publisher, but also partially contains strings that are defined by AMP Story itself. The strings provided by AMP Story itself can be translated into Japanese with this new localization feature, providing a consistent user experience for the users.
Next, we wanted to provide a richer, more customizable experience for desktop displays. When we launched AMP Stories to its developer preview last year, we included a default desktop user interface. And I, I want to emphasize that this user interface is, is good, but the reason that we implemented this user interface is because it is actually easier for publishers. Right? As a publisher, you can simply create your story for mobile and have this automatically transformed to work on landscape, dis on landscape displays as well. But what we've heard from some publishers is that they're willing, in, they're willing to put in a little bit more work to make their experiences better um, on landscape displays. And so earlier this year, we launched a feature that allows publishers to bring the full bleed nature of stories on desktop or on mobile to desktop as well. On a laptop or a desktop computer or even a giant projection screen, this feels a lot more natural and it also brings this sort of immer this feeling of immersion that you have on stories in, on mobile to desktop. Although it requires a little bit more work from the publisher to get this experience just right, um, in a, a particularly in finding the right art direction, um, the flexibility it affords publishers and the benefits to the user experience are tremendous. This experience was designed and developed in collaboration with the top global news publisher, The Washington Post, whose story you see here. They worked closely with us to run an experiment on their properties uh, where they essentially set up a few test stories to determine the effectiveness of this new experience. Once we were able to determine the effectiveness and the value that this truly brought to users, uh, we were able to implement and productionize this feature to ship it as a core part of the AMP Stories format. The Washington Post has continued to publish a, a number of great stories using this, this experience, uh, but the benefit of implementing this into AMP Story itself is that now all publishers can benefit from this experience as well. And we've seen some publishers start to do that since launching this publicly. For example, the top national publisher, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, um, has started publishing in this new landscape experience as well. So now you're all probably wondering, how do you enable this experience for your stories as well? The short answer is uh, just add this one attribute. Uh, if you add the supports landscape attribute to your story, then it will automatically enable the landscape support for your story. But um, the slightly longer answer is that when you do that, things might not look quite right. Right? The, the top screen here, you can see that the assets are not cropped perfectly. Um, and so this is because we, for both portrait and landscape orientations, we actually do a center crop where we just take the centermost portion of the asset and keep that in display. So to correct this, we actually recommend manually specifying a crop. And you can do that by specifying the object position attribute on your images and videos. So here, the, so the object position attribute works by essentially setting a focal point on the images and videos that should stay as close to the center of the screen as possible. Here we set the focal point to 75% along the x-axis and 40% on the y-axis, which is roughly the most important part of this photo. The browser will then shift the media over so that this focal point, again, is as close to the center of the screen as possible, giving you a much better crop. You may notice that the landscape version of this remains unchanged, and that is because, well, the landscape version of the asset and the landscape orientation of the screen are roughly the same size, and so the, the asset does not need to be moved over. And Actually, the focal point here cannot be moved any closer to the center of the screen while leaving the image uh, still covering the whole story. Support for the object position attribute will be rolling out over the next few weeks. Another piece of feedback that we've heard from publishers is that they want to have more control over navigation to other places from the story. So 
uh, on a traditional site, right, you would have a navigational menu, and they would like to bring that to Stories as well. And so we've ju done just that by enabling support for AMP sidebar, which works much like it does on a regular AMP website. This lets you provide navigational affordances and treat your story more like a part of your site. To use AMP sidebar is relatively straightforward. You just use the AMP sidebar tag as a direct child of the AMP story tag in your story. And it works just like embedding a, a sidebar in a regular AMP document with one exception, which is that um, stories will automatically add the templated UI to open the sidebar, this, this hamburger menu icon that you see in the top right corner here. Another thing that we've heard from publishers is that sometimes you want to make the editorial decision to um, allow users to explore content only if they want to, right? So like maybe, if you, maybe you have a video that's very long and you're not convinced that all of your users would like to watch the whole video. Or maybe you want to optionally allow users to get a deeper dive on a particular topic that you've covered in your story. This is where attachments come into play. To open an attachment, a user can simply swipe up from the bottom of a page containing an attachment, and they will get this sort of scrollable pane. As a publisher, you control the content of the attachment and can embed any content that you like. Attachments are often used in story, in story formats to provide exactly this, an, an additional set of content that isn't critical to the story, but we've added this now into AMP Stories for you to use as well. Just like Sidebar, the AMP Story page attachment tag acts as a container for the additional content. And it also automatically adds the UI affordance to the story. So for the Sidebar, it was the hamburger menu icon in the top right. For the page attachments, it's this arrow with the learn more text on the bottom. For AMP Story page attachment, you can embed it into your story by setting the AMP Story page attachment tag as a direct child of your AMP Story page. But not all interactive content should be hidden away in an attachment. Sometimes you want to showcase the content directly in, as part of your story. This is why we're adding embeds to stories, the ability to embed content directly within the story page. When a user clicks on an interactive embed, they'll be shown a tooltip that allows them to bring the component into full focus. This allows the user to interact with the content fully without breaking the navigational flow through the story. Each of the embeds that we support is an AMP component. So embedding them in your story is as simple as using an AMP component. So in this example, we're embedding a tweet and so like on any other AMP page, all we do is use the AMP Twitter tag. Support for AMP Twitter is live today. Um, but much like the localization feature that I mentioned earlier, the exciting thing here isn't specifically the use of AMP Twitter. It's the fact that we've built a generalizable framework around embedding content. We can expand this framework to support many different content types. And we plan to do just that as we roll these components out individually over the next few months. We're pretty excited about these new features and hope that you'll feel the same way. Now I'll hand it back to Hong to talk more to you about what Google is doing to surface AMP stories. Thanks, John. I can't wait to see upcoming AMP stories with all those cool features. So now I'm going to put on my Google hat and then talk about AMP Stories on Google Surfaces. So after you building all these amazing AMP Stories, the main question you might ask is, how can users see them? Well, the great thing about AMP in general is that those are just regular web pages and are accessible through publisher site, through social channels, or of course, they're available through search engines like Google. So AMP stories today can show up on Google search in the web results and top stories. In order to make a search experience more visual and more interactive, we're working on a dedicated placement for AMP stories on search, 
for queries in specific categories. So let's use travel as an example and all get on a visual search journey together. Let's imagine ourselves searching for things to do in Tokyo. Here we have the search result page. You start scrolling and exploring the content, and then you find this beautiful blog serving you cool travel visual stories. Tapping on any of this cover will brought you right into the story, and now you can start enjoying reading the story by simply just tap through the pages. If you want to browse something else, you can just simply swipe to the next. Now you can get this analyst discovery experience by continuously swiping to the next content. And of course, this is just a teaser. There's so many cool places to go around the world. And by adding this new experience to the Google search, users will start getting more and more immersive travel stories. We start with the travel because looking at the rich content experience like this can really help users get a better understanding of the travel destinations. And then you can engage more before you're even physically being there. Also, the AMP travel stories are tend to be evergreen. So they will be still relevant monthly after being published. We also know that the story format works really well with all other types of content categories. So after travel, we experiment with gaming, fashion, recipe, movies, TV shows, and even more categories. So beyond the regular search experience, Google also offers you a browse forward experience in the Google Discover feed for all times users without having a query in mind. So a quick reminder on what's Google Discover. Discover is a feature within Google Search that helps users stay up to date on all their favorite topics without needing a query. Users can get to their Discover experience through the Google Search app, go to the google.com mobile homepage, or simply swipe right from the home screen on the Pixel phones. It has gone significantly and now helps more than 800 million monthly active user get inspired and explore cool content. The exciting news is that in the past six months, we have been featuring great AMP stories in the Google Discover feed as well. We served many high-quality AMP stories based on a diverse range of topics, and we saw great user engagement. We believe that story fits really well with the user mindset in Discover feed and then plan on focusing even more on this platform moving forward. So beyond bringing more stories to users through Google services, we also want to make it easier for you to produce high-quality stories. So we updated our story best practice on amp.dev to help you easily understand what makes a good story. We have, to, we have talked to a number of great story creation tools that allow you to have easier process to create stories. We now also offer you good monetization options to let you easier monetize your content. So let's start with best practice. What makes a good story? We all know that story is a new and a unique content format. So if you're looking for ideas or inspirations, trying to figure out how to start making delightful stories, you can reference or follow the best story practice on the amp.dev to ensure your story quality. So let's take a look at some detailed examples. When you make a story, always make sure that your story is complete and self-contained. You should keep your readers engaged within the story. Don't require them to click links to go to other websites to get essential information. Always use text in a clear and concise way. Try to keep your audience engaged by avoiding putting large blocks of text on the page. Story is a visually driven format. Try to use rich media to tell your story and add text info to enhance it. Make sure your text is always legible. Always using high contrast to make the words easy to see on every single page. You should always take advantage of the full bleed screen. Always use full bleed assets 
as much as possible. Try to create a compelling and more immersive content reading experience by using the vertical assets. Another good thing about using vertical-based assets is that it crop out the unimportant information on your page. So it will let your user easily focus on one key subject. We all know that motion plays an important role in the storytelling. So be creative with your animation usage. You can always bring your static image to life with proper animations. Keep in mind that animation should always enhance the visual, but not distract the visual. On the example on the left, animating different elements separately to the stage will make the whole visual experience more engaging and playful. On the example on the right, the animation effects on the background image is nice and subtle, and plays a nice balance with the text overlay together. Hope you find all those examples helpful. If you want to learn more, please go to amp.dev and check the full amp story best practice. To make creating stories easier without having to dive into the HTML, we've worked with a number of partners to release creation tools for AMP Stories. Make Stories is a WYSIWYG editor that allows you to create a story by dragging and dropping. It comes with a library of templates, GIFs, icons, and illustrations that you can, and you can add your own videos and images as well. And the best part is that, as we heard in the keynote earlier, Make Stories is launching for free. And so check out makestories.io for more details. Next is Unfold, a story creation tool that launched at the beginning of last year and already has 17 million downloads. They offer easy story creation directly from your Android or iOS device with a number of beautiful templates and themes. And they're announcing that their app will support AMP Stories as part of a premium version of Unfold coming this June. Newsroom Studio is a powerful story creation platform specifically engineered for publishers looking to embed tappable formats into their editorial and commercial workflows. The platform includes a turnkey monetization solution, recommendations engine, and provides unrestricted access to the entire Getty Images library. We're also starting to see platforms publish stories to the web. Jump Rope is a platform to discover and share how to do anything in stories. Tick Done is a platform aimed at teaching a million people a billion new skills. And both are publishing to the web in the AMP Stories format today. We're excited to see more platforms provide ways for end users to publish content to the web in the story format. And lastly, we on the AMP team have been working to get stories support added in CMSs, starting with building support for stories into the WordPress AMP plugin. I'm sure m many or most of you know about WordPress, but if you don't, um, WordPress holds 60% of the CMS market share and powers a third of all websites. We've been working jointly with the agency XWP to add a WYSIWYG story e Stories editor to the WordPress AMP plugin to help bring more AMP stories to the open web. To hear more about our efforts to bring stories to WordPress, among other WordPress things, uh, check out the AMP, AMP Experiences in WordPress, the WordPress Way talk tomorrow afternoon. As Hong mentioned, we've been trying to make it easier for publishers to monetize their stories by providing a wide array of monetization options. From the new story ads format to affiliate linking to sponsored stories, there are a number of ways to get started with monetizing stories. And for more information on that, Vamsi will give a talk tomorrow, first thing tomorrow morning, uh, uh, the advertising and AMP talk. So this has been a whirlwind tour of what we've been up to for the past year. Uh, it's not everything, but it's a few highlights. But where are we going from here? Well, to name a few, we're going to continue to roll out support for additional embeds, as I mentioned earlier. We want to make creating animations easier so that, well, by, two, by doing two things. We want to make animations easier by expanding the existing preset library of animations, as well as adding support for 
functionality that will make creating more robust animations within stories. We also want to support reactions, which are quick actions to provide social feedback on a story to let the story's author, as well as other users, know how users feel about a story. And lastly, we've been experimenting with a feature that we call branching, which allows you as a publisher to control the user's flow through the story. With the ability to jump from page to page, share a story starting from a specific page of interest, create a table of contents, or even create short quizzes, this feature really amps up the interactivity options in Stories. So if you're interested in getting started, you can check out the Stories landing page on amp.dev. This has documentation for Stories as well as Story ads. Another great resource to check out is the full Stories Best Practices Guide on amp.dev at go.amp.dev slash stories best practices. And lastly, if you're here at AmpConf with us today or tomorrow, you can come and check us out in the demos booth or the tutorials room. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. That was, and, and John said that was just a few of the things, and I felt like that was just jam-packed full of so many cool features coming to AMP Stories. Personally, I'm so excited about that travel embed in the Google search results. That would have been so useful for my time here at AMPCOM. あの、すごい、すごいなと思いました。あの、いろんなユースケースがどんどん増えていくし、あの、今年の後半私これで忙しくなりそうだなってすごく思いました。何かあったらお声掛けください。So we're going to have a break. Yep, so uh, next up is a 30-minute break, but we have a lot more content coming back here at 4.30. So we'll be back in these seats at 4.30, um, and we'll be ending today with that Technical Steering Committee panel. Thank you.
しい時間もあ,のあっという間に過ぎて最後の休憩をもう終えてしまいました皆さんいかがでしょうか、えー、っとこれから最後の4セッションをやらせていただきます、えー、最初のものはですね先ほどあった EC キューブ日本の事例としてすごく面白いものかなというふうに思うんですけれどももちろん CMS 日本の事例もありますし海外の事例もたくさんあります次はですねお隣韓国のカフェ24がそのアンプとの関わりの事例を話していただきます最近日本にも国内国内展開もしたりするので非常に面白い話が聞けるんじゃないかなというふうに思います OK so let's move on to the next session So, the next session will be providing AMP service to tens of thousands of e commerce sites. Please welcome Jin Yang and Tommy. Hello, everyone.、Um, I'm so excited to be here today and have、um, been able to meet all of you. My name is Jin Yang Kil, and I'm working as a project manager in Cafe 24. My job is to work closely with our partner to build user friendly marketing platform integration for helping our customer growth in business. Firstly, I'd like to start by telling you of who we are and what we do. Does anyone know of Cafe 24 here? No? <laughs> Good, now I have more to tell you then. How about BTS, EXO, Blackpink, and maybe Sai Gangnam Style? K Wave may have started from K pop and K drama, but it definitely affected and opened up a new market for K fashion and beauty. And it has been booming all around the world. Many of our Korean fashion、uh, beauty sellers chose Cafe 24 as of our business partner. And to tell you why, let me show you some statistics of Cafe 24. With 1.6 million online shopping stores, And more than 5 million registered users are using Cafe 24 service. We support throughout more than eight global offices to connect Korean sellers with global markets. And now, more than 76,000 shopping mall stores have expanded globally through Cafe 24's e commerce platform. We strive to offer an exceptional global services through our technology to provide merchants with easy and convenient selling methods. While offering global customers a fast and simple purchasing experience. Moving on, let's talk about AMP from an e commerce platform perspective. This is a process of how e commerce works. E commerce platform providers have a two user side with merchants who interact mostly with our、uh, back office admin and customers who interact mostly with our front side store. From one end to another, service shall be running smoothly without any interference to meet satisfaction for both sides. And this requires a consistent investment and development for both backend and front service. And I said 1.6 million online mall shopping mall,、uh, stores using it. So we need to satisfy them, including their hundreds and thousands of customers at the same time. Merchant side is more towards e commerce driven area, w i t h most of interactions are still done via PC based by operators. Meaning that from small to medium business to large entity, operators can be anyone and have all different levels of profici、um, proficiency on using our service. So, to fulfill merchant side needs, Platform should provide back office admin with simple and flexible functions to support their various selling activities. Whereas customer side is more towards marketing driven area, where most of the interactions are depending on customers and constantly changing. Meaning that with market trend shifting and technology continues to evolve, New services and channels are coming in every day, and it costs fortune to keep up with this if doing manually. So, to fulfill、uh, customer side needs, it is important that、um, front side store t o provide user friendly functions to support their various shopping behaviors and engagement throughout different channels. It is important that shopping content should maintain. Merchant or brand image, but simultaneously delivered in optimized format for each channel to bring positive shopping experience. Who doesn't know that? 
But unfortunately, market, uh, most of the marketing channels to reach new customers are paid media. And it isn't the idea for every business owners to have such kind of um, to such of things due to their different business volume and daily task priority and maybe limited marketing budgets and etc. And this is where AMP comes in. In recent shopping trends shows that mobile traffic is growing faster than ever, with search engine optimization plays a huge role in driving organic traffic growth. And our internal research also shows that most of the 49% um, of mobile shopping users are using search engine to find something new. And our merchants are spending up to 10 to 15% of their total revenue to reach new customers to maintain their business volume. AMP enables merchants to start receiving search engine benefits given to AMP pages in mobile search research to reach more potential customers at lower cost. In our case, it's free of charge. Finally here, let's talk about how we could bring positive business change for Cafe24. We are happy to announce that Cafe24 launched the AMP service last week and already have more than 20 merchants using AMP service for their mobile shopping sites. We focus on our platform integration with AMP in relation to our customer growth point to ensure that merchants have the ability to provide the best user experience in simple steps, but to bring out higher performance and conversions at lower cost in a highly competitive e-commerce market. AMP service work will work as an enabler for our merchants' global business in following three steps. Firstly, not only, pro, uh, not only keeping the global standard of your contents, but also customizing your AMP pages to match your brand for your global targets. Secondly, delivering same AMP experiences uh, regardless of your customer's given network, inf network infrastructures or various device specification. And lastly, providing an opportunity to acquire new users and improve mobile conversions with AMP pages. It can help you grow your business, whether you're a smaller uh, store or larger marketplace. To continue a more interesting story of Cafe 24's practical AMP implementation, let me introduce our next presenter, Tommy Kang, who is the head of development of Cafe 24. Oh, thanks, Jin. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tommy Kang. I'm the head of Cafe 24 e-commerce development team. I'm so glad to be here to share how we amplified over 1.6 million online stores. Before we dive into amplifying on GAP24, let's take a closer look at how easy to customize the design of online store on GAP24 e-commerce platform. Our merchants want to reflect their personality to their online stores. And we also believe that it's one of the most important thing the customers to be able to feel the color of online store. So we offer high flexibility to design and customize your online store using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with no restrictions. Um, uh, and we also believe it's one of the most important thing, customers to be able to feel the color of the online store. So we offer high flexibility to design and customize your online store, store using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with no, rest with no restrictions. Just design and publish your online store uh, as you want, and then put some code for COP24 modules, such as, such as product list and shopping cart, to give functions. Then you can have your own online stores. Based on this design flexibility, a huge number of very unique design themes are produced uh, by design agencies on COP24 Design Center. When building an online store, a merchant can have a, uh, can, uh, have a, um, uh, uh, can pick one of them or create their own by contacting a design agency through the design center. Highly flexible to customize the design means that you can amplify your online store effectively when you know AMP well. But if you don't, it would be very hard to do so. 
When general merchants are not familiar with AMP, how to make it easy for merchants to apply AMP to their own online stores? You may have noticed already we provide both non-AMP and AMP pages. It automatically generates AMP pages based on non-AMP page. Therefore, a merchant can uh, have AMP features without any extra effort. It was not an easy task to implement for AMP features when it has practically no design limitation. Every single online store on GAF24 has a different design because of design flexibility at the HTML level. If you just provided the AMP, uh, AMP pages with the same design for all online stores, um, the customers would have very different user experiences between non-AMP and AMP pages. So we had to find a way providing AMP pages that, uh, that which it just look like non-AMP pages. The solution is that we acquire the list of GAP24 modules and sequence of those and the settings of each pages and then generate AMP pages um, based on the data. So customers can get the almost the same user experiences on AMP pages. In addition, we provide various options to optimize AMP pages for better user experiences. Implementing itself is important, but it is also crucial uh, to provide the optimal environment to use AMP. There are many AMP features that require HTTPS, um, like video, iframe, and more. To ensure your AMP pages take full advantage of AMP features, um, you should use HTTPS protocol. We provide the HTTPS service using less encrypt so that an online store can learn over HTTPS easily. Here is a demonstration of comparison between non-AMP and AMP on GAP24 e-commerce platform. On the left, you see non-AMP page. Then now, on the right, you see AMP page. Well, it's not perfect yet. Um, for better user experiences, we are working on additional AMP-related projects. First, a new design mode, we call it as DND, will be provided for AMP. We provide both non-AMP and AMP pages, but it is not the uh, best user experiences in terms of AMP page is not exactly the same with non-AMP page. A new design mode provides uh, AMP-certified GAP10 for modules which is including HTML, CSS, and JavaScript uh, that AMP requires. It allows you to build an online store with AMP features um, keep, um, while keeping design flexibility. Second, as mentioned before, uh, you can make high-quality AMP pages um, on GAP24 by di editing di HTML, CSS, and JavaScript directly when you decide to apply it. To support the efficient implementation of AMP, uh, we plan to add AMP validator on GAP24 e-commerce platform. Third, design agencies uh, will soon realize the value of AMP and start to produce AMP themes. At that time, we will, pro we will support them to sell it more easily. For example, uh, we can provide AMP theme list on GAP24 Design Center. GAP24 e-commerce platform is expanding its business area globally. Uh, we already do our business here in Japan and have been expanding to Southeast Asia. Some countries have well-established internet infrastructure, but many countries, including Southeast Asia, do not have it. In these countries, AMP and PWA will be the solution that can improve user experiences dramatically. GAP24 e-commerce platform will continue to strengthen AMP and PWA to provide the best services to merchants and customers. These guys are key members for GAP24 AMP project. Thank you again for their effort, and thank you.
tell you how excited I am to see AMP appearing in more and more e-commerce um, platforms. So let's give a big round of applause for that. It's so exciting. <laughs> so switching gears just a little bit, um, I have the absolute pleasure and privilege of traveling around with the AMP Roadshow, which does a one-day developer event um, for places all over the world. And we like to go um, reach developers where they're at and understand what's going on uh, in, in their country, in their cities, and what struggles their users face and the struggles they have trying to meet those users. Um, and so I'm just so excited to introduce our next speakers, which is going to be Bala and Levy. And it's going to be called um, No Power, No Internet, No Support, How AMP Bridges the App Gap in Iraq and War Impacted Regions. And it's going to talk about how AMP is just meeting these uh, users' needs and how exciting that really is that our devel the developers can focus more on the users and not on all this implementation. So please join me in a round of applause as we welcome to the stage. Chonan Barizakan, as we say in Kurdish. Hello, everyone, in English. Shlama Elahun, as we say in Aramaic, and Marhabalar Usun in Turkomani. My name is Levi Clancy. I'm coming here from Erbil, the capital of the Kurdistan region of Iraq. My co-presenter, Bala Khadang, who, despite the great invitation of the AMP team to be here, was denied a visa by the Japanese government, will be joining us digitally. Let's start by hearing her say hi. Sla Google, that's how we say hi in Kurdish. My name is Bala, I'm from Koya, a small town in Kurdistan. But I've been working and living here in Erbil for over three years now. I work as a qualitative research moderator and an interpreter with YouGov. I'm also a totally self-taught web developer and an artist. I love to create, I love to design, to develop and build things. That's why I got into coding in the first place, specifically web development. Today, I'll be joining forces with Levy to tackle how AMP can bridge the app gap in the war impacted and developing regions, starting with our home, the Kurdistan region of Iraq. This was just a brief introduction about me, and you will hear me again shortly. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Bala. So we want this talk to energize you, to develop better experiences for war impacted and other vulnerable people. We want you to use AMP to do it, and we'll tell you why. But first, let me introduce why AMP is an amazing laboratory to explore all of these issues. Why Erbil is an amazing laboratory to explore all of these issues. A cynic dosh for the entire region and other war-impacted places, and all of their tragedy, complexity, and promise. Erbil. Behind me is a photo of the Citadel, the oldest continuously inhabited place in the world and the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan. Christians, Assyrians, like the woman above, Turkmanis, Jews, such as myself, Arabs, Kurds, Shabaks, Kakai, Muslims, Yazidis, call the Kurdistan region home, each with their own specific mother tongues, dialects, needs. The Kurdistan region, as well as the Nineveh Plains and other disputed territories, are achingly and mesmerizingly gorgeous. And I cannot stress this enough. Our home is not what you might be assuming. We have shopping malls, we have high rises, we have a great urban core with suburbs, highways. You go beyond that, we have mountains with rivers and waterfalls and flowing green hills. Kurdistan is so diverse 
that we actually celebrate four different New Years. There is Nowruz, the Kurdish New Year. There is Chwar Shemasor, the Ezidi New Year, which is actually taking place today. An amazing act of resilience after Yazidis in federal Iraq faced a genocide by the Islamic State. There's Akitu, the Assyrian New Year, as well as the regular New Year, of course, on January 1st. And there's a fifth one, if you count Rosh Hashanah at my home. We are also a region of refugee camps, filled with families mostly from Syria who are too poor to rent their own home, often arriving from cities you may have heard in the news, Kobani, Kamishlo, Afrin, and other places. They come with absolutely nothing except counting on both hands the number of loved ones who they have lost in the Syrian war. War impacted people who experience deep misery and from digital experiences are a lifeline. These people are at the core of our talk, at the extreme margins of the demographics that tech is usually optimized to serve. Now, before we dive in, I want to address the elephant in the room that I'm sure some of you are thinking. You may wonder, why bother? Why bother? OK, let me tell you why. You ask that because you have never been given an answer. But yes, you should put Iraqi Kurdistan and other war-impacted regions onto your development roadmap. Aside from it just being polite, Consider, for example, the acquisition of Egyptian ride-sharing app Karim by Uber recently for more than $3 billion. Precisely because it does not just work in perfect Dubai. It also works in places like Baghdad, for example, where business will always continue even in the darkest times. Iraq alone has tens of millions of people, opportunities to connect with and between. The GDP of Iraq is almost 200 billion US dollars. Imagine a product that works well there, which very few do. Iraqi people and Iraqi opportunities including Kurdistan, are kept on the far side of the technology ecosystem by what we call the app gap, the systematic exclusion of users due to false assumptions and incompatible choices about application design. The app gap happens when you're a developer and you choose that content will not load in the background. When the user goes to need it, their signal has been lost. They can't get it. It happens when you add an Arabic translation to your site, but it's horrible. It's done poorly. It's difficult to access. And then you just skip Kurdish and Aramaic. We're going to focus on these issues, internet, electricity, language, and how you can overcome these problems with AMP. But I want to emphasize one thing. When we're talking about all these issues, back home, I'm not living with bombs exploding overhead. The Kurdistan region is totally safe. Behind the border of the Peshmerga, the army of the Kurdistan region of Iraq, despite being surrounded by Syria on one side, federal Iraq on the other, Turkey, Iran, and for years, the Islamic State as well. But because we are a safe haven, we are in a special place to understand war-impacted people's needs. Our neighbors, our friends, our peers, the home next door, or the refugee or IDP camp up the street. Equal to us, and to you, and all manners of the soul. Unequal only 
and the prejudice that they experience that extends to everything from finance to travel and to technology application design too. The reason why Bala was banned by the government from being at her own presentation today and whose knowledge, wisdom, and capability would have been silenced if it were not for the support of the AMP team and having her here digitally. Now, a lot of these issues I'm going to talk about are going to be kind of familiar for some of you. There are people in America, homeless populations, who suffer from some of these issues. In India, in Kenya, there are issues with limited bandwidth there also. There are issues that some of you probably face of political persecution. Now, all of these issues intersect for war impacted people. And the sorest losers out of this are not the educated, the yuppies, the people in Kurdistan who maybe uh, can hide behind a VPN and are already fluent in English. It disenfranchises people who are already disenfranchised. Digital spaces present an opportunity for reversal of overwhelming existential threats for IDPs, for refugees, for Iraqis, trans women, minorities, these amazing communities that we have in the region, content creators with voices. After showing you these AMP solutions to these issues, we're going to show some examples of how we actually use it in Erbil and why AMP has become our preferred toolkit for myself and for Bala and for other members of our narrative.fyi collective community, including Dashni Morad, a feminist icon who's Kurdish and Iraqi, and people like Noor Mati, who I'll tell you more about later. These are people who are doing on the ground extraordinarily challenging work that requires digital integration. And we have decided to use AMP first. Now, back to Bala. Hello, everyone. I am back again. Now, you might be asking, why start off with language instead of discussing how simple and straightforward building an AMP page is, or all the flexibility you gain once you adopt the AMP format? All of this is amazing, but I would like to talk about issues that are relevant to my hometown and can be solved with AMP. I'll start off with a real life example. My mother's native language is Kurdish, and this is the only language she speaks. This creates issues for her whenever she goes online. It takes ages to switch languages. And even when she finally succeeds in switching between languages, the translations get all messed up, or the translation itself isn't really that good. We need to make switching between languages easier and smoother for both users and developers without any distortions of the text or the meaning of the words. One way to do this is by putting all translatable elements in a JSON file. And Livy will talk about that in more detail. So the problem of language switching that Bala described is actually huge. And it's neglected. And it's so obvious. Now, we found a great, easy fix with AMP. So the main thing, as Bali said, as Bala said, is that translations are often unavailable or just bad. And switching languages is difficult or forces a hard refresh. Now, using AMP, you can make an easy JSON file of translatable elements that then loads for the user to swap versions without even needing to reload the page. Now, you may be thinking that sounds really difficult. It's actually a lot easier. You can have all of your navigation copy in one JSON file, it's great for collaboration. You don't have to open your code base to get a translation done. You can even store it in a separate repository. Because it's very neatly organized, you can see if there's anything missing. You can easily run it for quality control. You can add new languages. It's going to look something like this when you have it ready. We're going to load it into an AMP state component. And then we're going to keep that same JSON around as an array, because we have to initialize uh, the initial state. It's going to look like this when it's all loaded. You're going to make some buttons. 
You can put these in like an AMP light box at the top of the page, however you like. We're going to make some buttons to switch between the languages. As you can see, it's just an issue of using AMP set state. And the code itself. You're going to have the initial value, then you're going to bind the text. Now, with this, you can be sure there's a consistent experience across all versions, and any updates to the translations propagate out seamlessly. Now, we're going to see an example here. We have English, and we have Arabic. And when you tap, it just changes effortlessly like that. One thing that I recommend is that you can set a default text direction, but also let your users change it themselves. You can see that in the corner. We have two buttons for text direction. The usefulness of that is that in a lot of places, people use a mix of different scripts and even different languages. You may have some English, some Arabic mixed together. And I have not seen actually any web application or any other type of application that allows users to set their own text direction so easily. But it's very important for legibility. Now, back to Bala. Now, on to the second issue. It's true that World Class Internet is now available in the Kurdistan region. But as you can guess, many cannot afford expensive internet services. You won't be able to view photos or watch videos since they will take up so much of your gigabytes and you will have to refill your balance in just a few days or even a few hours in case you are interested in watching a video that's 4K or an HD video that's only a few minutes long. Purchasing cheap bundles limits your experience to a great extent. Internet access can be so painfully slow that it would take years for a page to load, or it won't load at all. We call this khatikisal, the turtle connection syndrome. Poor loading systematically blocks many IDPs and refugees in particular. Once again, AMP is here to help. It helps us create web applications that are faster to load and are lighter in a sense that they won't use too much of your internet data. Or, even with a slower connection, the web pages will still load smoothly and almost instantly. This is all possible since AMP is designed to be a very accessible framework for creating fast-loading mobile web pages. Divi, yalla, show us how. Thank you, Bala. So, the key thing here it's design your web page to degrade gracefully. One of our favorite tools for this is AmpList. First of all, with an AmpList, less is sent over extremely limited bandwidth. Your page also can give really solid error messages if something fails to load. A simple request goes out, gets a reply of JSON with the list elements. That's all that's sent over the web after the page loads. This allows major improvements in accessibility in areas where connections drop or lag. And also, the list can automatically check for updates and even concatenate to the end. This example that we're going to show is something we built for folks to easily set up their own CV website entirely using AMP. It needed a few specific things for the Racky context. We fit as much as possible into a single web page to minimize page loads. And then we use AmpList with form inputs inside of it. You can pull one source and propagate many lists. We decided to silo them. You save, the form goes out, and the AmpList reloads with the new content at the origin. And with AmpList, you can even set conditionals. You can check if something changes. You can check if something's missing. And using CSS, we did a really nice little delete function. Save, that's it. This is actually a pretty standard AMP implementation. AmpList is a pretty standard AMP component. So what I want to emphasize is that the impact is major, though, if you use it correctly. It's actually less work, usually, than laying out your context statically with like PHP or Python, et cetera. So use AmpList aggressively, extensively, creatively. Use it for tables, use it for forms. And especially take advantage of meaningful error loading and success messages. So even if your user goes offline, they'll still know that you built your product with them in mind. Now, back to Bala. 
The third issue on our list is electricity. The Kurdistan region suffers from chronic electricity shortages. Power cuts happen all the time, even in the best places. It would be awesome to resolve electricity issue, but I don't think this is going to happen. At least not at the moment, since the region has been struggling with electricity for decades now. And I would say it would take a few more decades to overcome it. Whenever there's a power outage, Wi-Fi signal in the home or office is lost. The worst part is when you are almost done writing an email and the power cut happens, your precious data that you have been working on for hours can disappear in a matter of seconds. And that's just one part of the issue. Let's not mention how long it would take for the Wi-Fi to work properly again after the power cut and all the frustration that comes with that. Saving content in the background is the best solution here. It is the magic trick. I'm going to hand it over to Levi because he's going to explain how we can store content in the background to avoid losing data. So as Bala said, the power cuts unexpectedly all of the time in the Kyrgyzstan region. But with AMP, developers can really easily make forms that save in the background so that content is saved up until the minute of the cut and gives a response to let them know that the connection has been lost. By using AMP form, you can implement really graceful forms more easily than ever before. And standard operating practices are built right in. Now, I'm not the world's like, best developer, but using AMP form, I can build something for a wide range of devices and a wide range of use cases with a single effort. I never thought that I could so easily build a form that has all these features, like automatically saving drafts and making tidy responses to inform the user what is happening, with a single and largely off-the-shelf component. It lets me build products that work where I live. I'm sure all of you are familiar with AMP image. I just want to point out that it's extraordinarily useful in areas like the Kurdistan region. Obviously, it loads images in a very graceful manner. And even if the connection is not quite strong enough to load the full picture, they can still get everything else on the page. I also want to touch on building progressive web apps. Using AMP, this is something that we are exploring to deliver specific services in the lightest, quickest possible manner using available AMP components. You may say, OK, that's just optimization. It's not just optimization. Think of it this way. You could say a camera drone is the same thing as just a quadcopter with a camera strapped to it. But what separates, what differentiates those two is that you have quality, accessibility, availability, documentation, support, and timing with one framework. I think that's essentially what separates using AMP in war impacted areas from just using maybe jQuery or something else a lot of people are familiar with. The optimization, the effort, the responsiveness, the user experience is already so embedded into AMP. But ultimately, I think maybe one of the most vague but overlooked things that's also very important with AMP is simply put, community. So on that note, I want to show some examples from our community and Erbil of how we have used AMP. Behind me is Dashni Morad. She was born in Sulaymaniyya. She's Kurdish, and she's Iraqi. She uses social media, radio, television, every available technology to rally support with her hundreds of thousands of followers for human rights and feminism. But she challenges, she faces challenges on many platforms. The app gap, I was describing before, and getting her content out fully to everybody. Obviously, what about people who cannot afford any data package? So she, Perihan, and Narrative.fyi, including myself, 
developed the 100 Women Street Gallery to share the stories of 50 Kurdistani feminist icons and 50 international feminist icons and bring it to physical places around Erbil and around the broader Kurdistan region to provoke and to challenge. There are some figures in there who are widely respected, like Shifa Gardi. She was a young journalist who worked at Rudow and who was martyred by an explosive device while covering the war in Mosul. What about somebody like Don Wilcox, who founded Women Count USA to document femicide by men against women and to better understand the patterns behind it in America? What response would we get about her, including her in the street gallery in Erbil? What about Leila Bedirhan, the first ballet dancer from the Middle East and a Kurdish woman who to this day, as in her lifetime, faces backlash for expressing herself as she chooses to through her art? So we were really struggling with this and we're sitting around talking and I showed, uh, I showed Dashni the AMP website and I was like, listen, we can use these components and we can build this really cool app-like experience. What we finally opted to do was to have posters, to have messenger codes. You can scan it with your mobile device and it pops open a messenger bot that tells you the bio, opens this rich universe of content about these amazing figures. That is available on free basics, even without a data package in Erbil. Then you can tap on that message and open an AMP page that delivers this incredibly app-like experience within Messenger itself. It's really cool integration of different platforms together. You can see here the final artwork on display yesterday, actually. It just launched yesterday. You can see the women, the names, you can see the Messenger codes in the upper corner. We could share content that was really rising and controversial, challenging, we had a great turnout at the opening reception. Content that is really challenging, but within the safer cultural context of a digital space using AMP. Norma T is a radio and television host in Erbil for Babylon Media. He is a Syrian, and he pretty much runs almost all of the Shlomo Foundation's efforts to empower and to support the resilience and survival of Assyrian villages and towns in Kurdistan and the Nineveh Plains and Iraq. He's been developing a database for years of Assyrian, Chaldean, Syriac villages in Iraq. So we were talking, and by showing him about AMP components, we have decided to migrate his database over to AMP. It's gonna be both for visitors, the public can access it more easily. And it's also going to be for administrators. So by using these AMP features that we spoke about earlier, they can do data entry directly right there in the field, even in challenging network and electrical conditions. But it's not just about people who are creating things, it's about users. Users like Sheda, this amazing human being, a beacon for light and equality from Iran, living in Erbil, but who faces threats to her life, standing up for human rights off and offline, off and online. Mustafa, who's Kurdish from Kirkuk. He had to leave school to work, but when the barber shop where he was, was targeted by a terrorist attack, the bombing rendered his right arm largely quite weak and he could no longer work. He's rebuilt this new identity using social media as an influencer. Melinda, who does tireless work organizing the Assyrian community in Australia, America, Canada, everywhere, to come back to Iraq. It's a country of youth who have experienced things like multiculturalism, like Ivan, online. I just want everybody here to be comfortable reaching out. You can go to our website, reach out on Facebook or WhatsApp, ask any questions that you have, about any of the issues that we brought up in the talk. And if I don't have an answer myself, me, Bala, one of us, will get you in touch with someone who will. Thank you. Uh, 
ー、すごいディープでいい話だったかなというふうに思います。あのオープンなウェブだからこそですね、えー、全ての人がやっぱりアクセスして気持ちよく使えるそういった環境を、えー、ぜひとも作っていきたいなと思いますしそこでアンプがあ活躍するのであればもう素晴らしいことだなというふうに思います、えー、それではですね、えー、このあとセッションがそのその後に続けてパネルがあるんですけど、えー、最後のセッションになってきます、えー、セッションスピーカーはアンプの PM のルーディーになってきますのでタイトルは「What's Next in AMP」ですがあの AMP の次の,その未来っていうのをこう話してもらいます非常に、えー、毎年の AMP コンフで必ず d a y ンの一番最後にルーディーがするっていうのが恒例なんですけどあのそれがまた来てるということで非常に楽しみにしています OK so let's move on to the next session which is the last session、uh, before the panel、uh, so the next session will be What's Next in AMP please welcome Rudy Galfi Hey everyone, I'm Rudy. I'm the product lead for AMP at Google, and I'm also a member of AMP's technical steering committee. Today I'm here to provide you with a few、uh, peeks at the future as I tell you about what's next in AMP. We've done this talk for the past few、uh, years at AMPConf, and it's really thrilling to be back with you all here in Tokyo for our third edition. But this year we thought we'd do things a little bit differently because we have the other TSC members, and they're really eager to come out here and share with you all、um, their thoughts about the future of AMP as well. And so momentarily, they'll be up here on stage for the panel. But before we do that, I thought it'd be helpful if I came out and framed things up、uh, for that discussion. So let's get started. Earlier today in the keynote, you heard about AMP's vision and our mission. These statements are important、uh, for the project and important to us who work on the project to get aligned and have a good common sense of the North Star vision that we have and how we get there. So, AMP's vision is a strong, user first, open web that stays with us forever. I think encoded in this are the ideals of a web that benefits people and enables the freedom of expression, the exchange of ideas, and the pursuit of opportunities. Now, just as importantly, we need some basic agreement about how we're going to get there, and that's what our mission statement helps us do. We want to provide a user first format for web content that supports the long term success. Of each player in the ecosystem. Being aligned on both the vision and the mission are how we, as a technical steering committee and as a community, figure out how to do new cool things with AMP. So, as you look ahead to what's next, I thought it was actually、uh, you know, useful to take a look at where we were coming from. And I recognize that many of the same themes that have guided us as we get to today are also the keys to understanding how I think 2019 is going to look. To me, there s three major themes. The first is, We've been exploring some new frontiers with AMP. The second, I think more than we've ever had before, we're starting to think with a long term view about the project. This means thinking about how AMP's used as a technology that powers websites 5, 10, or even 15 years down the line. And along with this, we've also thought about how the web platform is going to evolve and how, how AMP will help lead that evolution. And finally, with all these new applications of AMP, with thinking about this long term vision, We've also thought about how do we best accommodate you know, collaborative approaches for contribution and engagement within the project. So let's take a closer look at each of these. So, to begin, I told you that last year we think was a really big one in terms of establishing some new frontiers for the AMP project. At the beginning of AMP back in 2015, our focus for AMP was on websites. We observed that the performance and usability problems that we saw across the web were pretty common. And we thought that the solutions that were needed were also pretty well established. Things like asynchronous loading of resources or you know, static declaration of image sizes so you wouldn't have content reflow. But a lot of this stuff's easier said than done. There's been lots of books and blog posts written about these sorts of things, and they're things that you just need to constantly be reinvesting time to do. And another observation we had is even as a developer, even if you get all these things right, often your experience can be affected by third party things like ads and analytics. So, it was no surprise that as we moved into 2016, we found that there was another application for AMP technology that came along,、uh, which was AMP for ads or AMP HTML ads. This idea that we could sort of put ad creative itself on good rails and provide a you know, format for advertising that is needed to run businesses, but that also on the user side ensures that they're going to be really user first and safe. And then at AmpConf last year, we introduced AMP for Stories and AMP for Emails, basically doubling the number of distinct applications for AMP that we have in the project. 
So all four of these things are really super exciting fronts for web-based content in the AMP. So I want to spend quite a bit of time talking about AMP for websites. But first, let me cover some updates about AMP for ads, stories, and emails. So first up, AMP HTML ads. The first thing we'd like to do with AMP HTML ads is related to coverage. We'd like to expand the number of places where AMP ads can appear. And one of the big ones that we see is within mobile apps. So there's going to be work happening in the coming year to support that. Um, and even just looking at the web, there's a bunch of ad creatives that aren't even supported yet. And so a key second theme is going to be around capabilities. This will be things like more animation support, support for gestures and the Canvas API. And of course, as we're doing these things, we also want to work on making sure that the runtime itself is getting thinner and that the performance for AMP HTML is improving. So there's so much more to cover about the world of ads in AMP. And so I invite you to come to the lead off talk tomorrow to learn more about advertising in AMP. So next up for stories. You heard the talk earlier today. There's a number of rich capabilities that we want to add over the coming year. And so these include things like embeds for objects such as social posts. We even want to explore making it possible to do live updating content within a story. We also want to introduce more animation capabilities so that you have the tools you need to make uh, storytelling more engaging with motion. And stories should evoke emotion. And so we're in the early stages of planning out how it would look to enable people to do things like reactions in stories. And finally, stories may not be linear. And so we want to explore how we can include a way for storytellers to do things with branching and AMP stories. You can imagine this being useful for things like quizzes or other really compelling narrative forms. And then next up for email. As the email ecosystem begins to grow, it's, it's quite nascent still. One of the themes is going to be to focus on compatibility. This is, means making sure that all the emails that are created look and behave the same way, even as they're served up in different clients. We're also exploring things like video support. We took an, the same playbook that we did with AMP initially, where we're starting with a small number of capabilities and then looking to broaden out over time as the use cases become clear. So that's true of both video as well as a whole host of other potential components that are in part of the core of AMP that we could look to bring to email as long as it makes sense and we can ensure that they're going to be safe in an email context. So we have a whole session about AMP for email on, on deck for tomorrow as well. So I encourage you to come in the afternoon to check that out. But as I said, I want to focus most of, the talk, of this talk on AMP websites. So let's dig in there. There's a lot of different things I could cover when it comes to AMP for websites. But I'm going to just call out a few for now. First, we continue to focus on e-commerce experiences for AMP. It's now possible to build almost every piece of the upper funnel uh, using uh, AMP, things like category pages as well as product detail pages. And we want to make it easier and possible to build out the payment part of AMP experiences. Um, so you can build really a full AMP-based website from the top of the funnel down. The next thing I'd call out, and this one really sticks out as an area we've gotten a ton of feedback on time and time again, and that's the 50 kilobyte limit for your CSS. So we've identified a technical approach that we think is going to work really well for solving this, and it aligns philosophically with what we're trying to do. Basically, we're going to introduce an adaptive approach to handling CSS limit. So what this means is as long as your utilization of CSS is high, then you can go beyond this limit. We think that this will improve both the developer experience as well as uh, enable us to maintain a good user experience from the AMP point of view. In addition, to build a nice, cohesive AMP-based website, we want to uh, think about how we can go from having individual pages to how we can offer nice, fluid transition bet transitions between those pages. And so we're going to be focusing on transitions as you know, a goal of how to make AMP feel more app-like as a whole. And then lastly, we want to focus more on statefulness. So continuing on from that last theme around transitions, imagine you're moving between the different pages of a site. So you could, for example, be on a filtered product listing view. And then you click and go to a detail page. Well, you know, it's quite natural as you're in this browsing mode on, a, on an e-commerce site, you might want to go back to that view that you were in before with the filtered list. But if you go back, you want to make sure that you're in the exact same state you were before. And that, so that's what we mean by bringing in statefulness. And so this is going to be an area that we work on improving in AMP in the coming uh, year as well. So much of the ongoing work for AMP websites concerns how we can best build out AMP to be a well-lit path for the most capable and performant websites on the web. We often think about this holistic idea as AMP as a service. And we have a whole talk tomorrow about this, which I encourage you to attend. It's happening at 10 AM. 
So why do we think about AMP as a service? Well, it really gets back to the second of those themes that I was talking about at the beginning. That's thinking about AMP in the long-term sense. So let's take a look at how we're investing in AMP and the web with a long-term view. As we've built out AMP over the last couple of years, enabling what we call AMP-first websites has been a priority. An AMP-first website is one that reflects the long-term view of using AMP. It's one where the pages, some of them, perhaps even all of them, are using AMP to deliver that core site experience. For instance, the developer website AMP.dev is an example of this. If you go to AMP.dev, it's built using AMP. AMP first contrasts with what's often called the paired mode of using AMP. This is where you have the AMP page, but it's paired to a non-AMP version. So if you go directly to the site, you're not going to get the AMP version. This model does have some benefits. For one, it's going to be a really natural state to be in as you're taking an existing HTML page and then building an AMP version of it. It's an important model for publishing to AMP. You'll be able to experiment and get going, and it's one that we'll continue to support. But we increasingly hear about how the paired AMP brings on extra development and ongoing maintenance, which of course is not the point at all. So it bears emphasizing that we think AMP first is the destination to reach. A lot of the new advancements that we're putting into AMP are about making AMP first more viable and easier for you to achieve. For instance, one of the insights we've gathered watching sites striving to go AMP first is that getting maybe 90 or even 99% of the way there is quite possible. AMP's components go a long way to unlocking the core experiences that you need, but sometimes there's that last mile that's just tough. There's something that you'll need that custom capability, the custom JavaScript to do. And so earlier you heard the really exciting news about AMP first going to origin or AMP script going to origin trials. And so we'd like to work toward a state where you know, these kinds of use cases that come up, that's perfectly fine. You can say, I'm not blocked. I can use AMP script for that. And so some of you may remember that we were really excited to preview AMP script last year. It was a big reveal during the same talk. And you might wonder, well, what's in store for this year? Well, as I said, we see AMP script filling this role where you get that last bit of something into AMP. But what about even getting going with AMP? Can we create a better on-ramp? Well, when you use AMP today, the mindset is that you build the page, and it needs to pass the AMP validator. Why is this the case? Well, AMP is like a tightly assembled engine. There's a core, and there's the various web components, and we expect them to kind of put together and work together in a certain way. And the assumptions can be broken in an AMP page when it's invalid. We don't know if those pieces will work together in the way we expect. There's really no guarantees. And so this all-or-nothing approach to building for AMP makes for a steep entry it's really reasonable to wonder, if I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get all the way there, should I even try? So one of the big new undertakings for AMP in the coming year is something that we're calling Bento AMP. With Bento AMP, you can pick and choose the parts of AMP that you want to use, and it'll work. You can use AMP as a web component library. So in particular, this means that the AMP components will work reliably outside of a valid AMP context. They'll also be able to interact with non-AMP components, They'll be able to interact with each other, even without the core of v0.js. And you'll be able to use them with client-side rendering frameworks. Now, as you can imagine, this is going to require quite the re-architecture of how AMP works under the hood. But it's one of the most audacious things that we have lined up for the coming year. We're just getting started. And so we're going to see if this all works out. And hopefully, we'll be able to tell you more about this at next year's AmpConf, if not sooner. We're excited about Bento AMP because it sets up this path where you can begin to use Bento AMP in your web pages, and that'll deliver these component level wins. That offers great usability, and it offers a starting point toward getting to full AMP bit by bit that you can build up toward. And over time, you can work toward getting to a place where it's a fully valid AMP uh, that gets the full advantages of AMP, like instant loading and embeddability. So Bento AMP represents an opportunity to take something that came from AMP, this rich library of web components, these things like super easy, easy to configure image carousels or light boxes, and extend it across the whole of web content. We've spent a lot of the last year, likewise, thinking about how we can take ideas cultivated in AMP and begin to figure out how they will uh, be able to be taken advantage of as web platform features. So one example of this is web packaging. It solves this idea of how can you scalably do instant loading content on the web, even across origins, while respecting a person's privacy. Well, this is a technology that will work even for non-AMP content. We're also excited about a new upcoming technology called Portals that takes this idea that something can be embeddable, as AMP is, 
And this is the property that we use to drive the AMP ad experience or make sure that we ha have AMP emails that can be secure across the web. So there's going to be a deeper dive on both of these technologies in talks tomorrow. But suffice to say that working on these things and making sure that we can bring them to the web platform uh, is going to be really relevant to the work in AMP over the coming year as well. And another area where we're working to grow out the web platform is around metrics as well. So there was a time we asked ourselves, you know, what are the core user experience uh, benefits that AMP is really trying to attain? So yeah, it's fast loading, but it's also preventing content from getting shifted around. It means making sure that content is ready for your interaction so you can tap or scroll on something and not have kind of weird jank and delay. But what we found is a lot of the metrics that exist aren't really good at capturing these user experiences that we were going for. And so there's been a lot of work going on to building out new metrics that will be able to capture these user experience benefits. OK, so the last theme for the year has been around how do we set up models to contribute to the project and engage with it more effectively. So one of the big new things here has been the updated governance that we introduced last fall. We've shifted to a model where we have a technical steering committee that's responsible for setting AMP's technical and product direction. Right now, we number seven people on the TSC. So then there's also an advisory committee. It helps do the, the TSC do its job by contributing many varied and additional viewpoints to the mix. And so right now, the advisory committee is about 15 people, and they represent things from news publishers to e-commerce sites to CDNs, publishing platforms, as well as some open web advocates. But the working groups are really where it's at. We have over a dozen different working groups spanning many of the different community and technical segments of the AMP project. And this is the key place where you know, the project roadmaps are getting set, the features are getting figured out and then built out, and the work is actually happening. And you can get involved here. You can join a working group and get engaged. We'd really love to talk with you. And if you do, we had our first contributor summit this past fall. And I'm really excited to say that we're going to do the same thing this year. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to see you this fall at our next AMP Contributor Summit. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And now join me in welcoming Crystal back up to the stage as we move on to the TSC panel. Thank you. Rudy, so many exciting yeah. things yeah. about what's next in AMP. So thank you for taking us through that. Um, so as we said, coming up next is the Technical Steering Committee, um, the panel. So we have a chance to answer all the questions you guys have about the new governance model. Um, and just a little quick thing about the, T um, the Technical Steering Committee is um, they are comprised of uh, developers or members who have a significant experience, experience contributing to AMP both technically and on the product level. Uh, they have a great vested interest in the future of AMP and making sure that it keeps the web open and engaging for everybody involved, developers and users and alike. So please welcome me as we welcome onto the stage, Chris of Pinterest, David of Patheon, Dima of Google, Malta of Google, uh, Paul of Twitter, Rudy, who is up here with me, and uh, Salo of Microsoft. Oh, and that's me up there again, too. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us up here on stage. It's been a really exciting first day at AmpConf, and I can't believe we get to close off by getting to have a, a conversation with all of you. So thank you so much. Um, so my first question is, what are the Technical Steering Committee members excited about um, coming up on AMP's roadmap? One of the most exciting things for me is the introduction of signed exchanges, because it addresses one of the hardest problems around the actual delivery of the page URLs for the sites so that publishers can actually have URLs that represent their own content and their own brands as part of the delivery of content going through AMP. Yeah, so uh. I'd like to add AMP for email. I'm very excited about it, even though it has been out there for a while. It's just now that publishers are getting into it. And it adds such a um, nice interactivity to emails that we never had before. And because it's a standardized way, it's like other email providers are, are, are onboarding to it. So I'm very, very excited to see what publishers are going to do about it. 
Nobody else is excited about anything else on the roadmap? <laughs> I would like to echo with emails. I've heard that that's um, one of the biggest things that happened to email in years is that we have dynamic content coming in. Um, what about the governance model? It's a big shift for AMP. Um, what's going on with that? What's that been like trying to adapt to this new way of AMP's future? I think it's going pretty well. Um, we've been meeting regularly every two weeks or so. Um, uh, we have adopted sort of a model where we, we want to delegate the actual technical decision making. Um, you know, the experts on AMP and what makes sense technically haven't changed. So we delegate that using the working group model to the actual technical experts. Um, you know, I think that's the correct model and we'll continue to do that. Um, as a decision making body, we've uh, kind of operated on a consensus basis. So, um, you know, that's going pretty well uh, so far as well. So, yeah, I think overall it's going pretty well and, and hopefully it'll continue. Thank you. Maybe maybe I'm gonna add a bit of perspective because, what well, I mean, from our Google's perspective, obviously there was a big shift because suddenly there's all these other people who get to make decisions, and I've mm. I've just personally really appreciate how this is actually going. So we um, we we have these meetings, and I think people are always really really prepared, and and they do provide more perspective and different viewpoints that is super super valuable and actually makes. Um, like decisions better than than we would have been ourselves. So right. I think it, it really adds like like very true value for me personally, which is which is um, really nice. Yeah, I'd like to add Microsoft perspective on this because before the open governance model, there was a lot of hesitancy around the company to adopt AMP, invest on AMP, uh, work with Google because Google was like the the owner, the maintainer, the sole decision maker. So when that shift came and we were part of the committee, like the whole company started seeing AMP with a different set of eyes, such that we were able like, to integrate with our search products, with other products inside the company. So it, it was really great for us and has been great to partner with Google and other companies on it. So, so it's really great to hear as it sounds like um, the governance model is really in, shows like that we're really truly embracing the community. And that leads me into this next question is the, open, uh, the opening the governance is a really great first step in the correct direction, but it seems like the project is still formally owned by Google. Um, can I see, can our, my fellow Googlers raise their hands on this hand? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of us still here. Um, so has there been any discussions uh, on what the next step is going to be like? Yeah, uh, let me get into that, give, give some background. So you just saw uh, three hands going up. So it's definitely the case that, um, as, as Chris mentioned, we, we make decisions as a group and we try to find consensus. And so far, that's also every single decision has been done in consensus. But there is a method to um, force a decision when consensus can't be found. In that case, um, the majority gets to decide. And obviously, Google does not have a majority on this panel. Um, the the, well, this, this question, what, what it go, comes down to is that there is the, the ownership of a copyright, um, which is um, owned by Google. And if you make a um, contribution to AMP as a pull request, you have to sign a so-called contrib contributor license agreement where you assign your own copyright over, over to the project, um, which is incredibly annoying, um, but really important because it sets up um, like intellectual property to be um, easily understood and, and very straightforward so that all of you who use AMP can be sure that, um, that it's in good working order and that you can actually use under the, the, under the license that it's published. So um, that basically gives you Google this perspective of the copyright owner. Of course, that means very little because the software is open source, right? So, but um, I think it's, it's important from a, from a um, philosophical point of view to change that. And so um, we've actually had for, for a long time um, looked at transferring the copyright over to a foundation, which will then also be like the, the institution from which the, let's say, the, go the governance emanates. Um, and that's definitely something that we're looking at. So um, it's, but moving to a foundation also means a lot of bureaucracy and so forth. So we wanted to front load the more impactful thing, which is to actually change the governance. And then, you know, at some point when we say that's working well, um, move the you know the, the copyright over to a foundation as a more of a um, ceremonial step at that point. All right, that's that's super exciting to hear that there's there's still so much more to come with with keeping this open. 
Um, speaking of keeping things open, uh, well, what does the panel have in mind for efforts to broaden the diversity of the Technical Steering Committee membership? Uh, yeah, I think uh, AMP from a very large perspective is open to content creators and consumers worldwide. And if you look at our panel right now, we're not very diverse and frankly geographically very similar. Um, and one of the things about the uh, TSC that was envis envisioned from the start was to have at least nine members, and currently we're at seven. So we're definitely looking to diversify um, the representation across the panel um, with at least two more people, um, and hopefully geographically as well. I know that makes a big difference in terms of, of what we're looking at. Awesome. Um, so a couple of like AMP specific questions. I have one where it says, um, can we use AMP partially? And Rudy, um, that sounds like it has to do with Bento AMP, um, which you just presented up here. Can you talk a little bit of, to that? Yeah, so it's, as you saw in the, the talk I just gave, um, we've, we've seen this in the community. There's been a lot of times when people are using AMP, but they like add invalid things. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in this. And so that's been the inspiration behind Bento AMP. And so we're really excited to start taking that step of figuring out architecturally, like how are we going to achieve this? Um, actually, Dima, you've been working on this a little bit. Maybe you want to add a little bit about like kind of what it's going to require? Yeah, sure. I think uh, we expect composition probably be uh, the most difficult problem we'll have to solve here. Uh, those uh, parent-child relationships are actually critical to create high quality components. Uh, and uh, ironically, we've, you know, web comp Components APIs themselves uh, address this very, very little. Um, so that's where initially AMP stepped in, and we defined these APIs between parent and child components to be able to do things like um, effectively create elements when they're needed. Um, in many cases, a uh, user may never see a component, so there is no reason to overtax the platform. Um, also, you know, from UX point of view or functional point of view, we have to be able to start playback and post playback, you know, start animations and pause animations as user goes from um, you know one part of UI to the other. Again, th this kind of relationships are really really important to have a high quality components. And ARM does it today by layering its own API layer and also controlling the document environment, which of course in the open um, you know web case we no longer can do as easily. So um, web act, um, communities actually started looking to this a little bit. Uh, for instance, uh, there, there is a display locking API in, a, um, in the works, but we still have a lot of work ahead of us. <laughs> Isn't that always true? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this was a question originally asked in Japanese. Um, so thank you so much for our team for translating it for me. Um, so we've talked a lot about publishing and media, but there are so many advertisers here working with AMP and in the audience today. Um, what are the things that the Technical Steering Committee um, is thinking about to do in the future to satisfy these advertisers? Um, and are we is there any representatives of, um, here today for uh, the advertiser side or any plans to um, include them as well? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I talked about AMP HTML ads. We're super excited about that. Like, that's basically our vision in terms of the, the ad space. We want to basically re remake that space by thinking about how we can uh, go at it from a user first and secure a approach from the, from the get go. Um, there's also a number of things that we've done in terms of just monetization inside of AMP pages. So just running regular display ads inside of AMP pages. There's been a lot of advancements there over the years as well. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to hear if there's like more specific feedback around things that we could be doing there. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of AMP HTML ads, we're really excited about that. Um, in tomorrow's talk, you're going to hear more about some of the case studies and, and the stuff that's been happening in that space, which I think has been really great. On the representation point, I think it is, it is pretty valid to call out that um, our advisory committee, for example, could have you know, more representation of the many different constituencies within the ad space. I think what's interesting about ads is like that's its own whole ecosystem. And so there's a lot of complexity there. There'd be a lot of like, different, um, different viewpoints to accommodate. And I think that's one of the things that we could look at doing better is figuring out like, how do we bring that into the AC? while still balancing that we want the AC to sort of be a reasonable size. You could go through the same thought experiment, I think, for email as well. Um, but we do have some publishers in the AC who are 
pretty you know advertising and monetization minded, so we at least have a viewpoint coming from that side. And um, the AC is the advisory committee. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I wanted to add one point, which is that there is an AMP ads um, working group, obviously. Right. And and so this this is where like people do focused work on this topic, and it's where. Um, people who really care can come together. And I think this is actually, as a model, has been working particularly well for folks who are really financially interested in, in something and that in the ad space, I mean, it comes with a you know, field. And so, for example, companies like Adobe who are working on the tooling side and so forth, that's, that's really the place for them to come together. Yeah, so maybe better to actually go to the ads working group. Um, so you can check more about that at, our, at the governance and you can find out like there's a specific person who's leading that group. Um, and you can go to them and discuss more with them. Yeah, there, there is a page on amp.dev under community for governance, which discusses all this and breaks it down and um, will help you find where you want to go for working groups and stuff like that. Um, so this is a question uh, I would also love to know the answer to. And um, why is amp.dev no longer an amp-only website? Ampproject.org used to be amp-only. What happened here? What switched? <laughs> This is a great question. You're going to hear more about the answer to this tomorrow. So basically, um, there's an AMP toolbox optimizer. So we have a tool where if you're serving AMP from your origin, we actually suggest you use this tool, and it'll, like, it'll make that better, um, make it better than just kind of default AMP out of the box. Um, however, right now, when it applies all these optimizations, it causes the page to be invalid. And so because of that, Basically, adopting that, which we suggest, puts you into a state where you basically have to use the paired AMP model. And so one of the things that we're going to be working on in the coming months is to support the optimized version being considered valid as well. And so once that happens, then we'll be able to uh, actually have AMP.dev work the same way that you were used to seeing AMPproject.org work, which is that you just go there, and I don't know if you all like have the extension installed, but you see the green light up, and it shows that it's valid. Thank you so much for such a great answer. Um, next one uh, is in this um, asker's opinion. The vast majority of web webmasters can't implement signed exchange. They would use, they wouldn't, um, and they wouldn't use Cloudflare either. So, how do you think you can make signed exchange more available? This is a great question. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that signed exchange is confronting a rather challenging problem of presenting the original URL rather than the URL for the AMP cache, or specifically the domain. We, we're still in the very early stages of signed exchanges, and uh, we're looking at following some of Cloudflare's example on their implementation in the sense that they've made it extremely easy to implement signed exchanges for a site. And I don't mean to say that um, we would expect everyone to be using Cloudflare as the only uh, way to, to implement signed exchanges, but, the, it's, but we, can, we, we still need to be putting out a better, brightly lit path for the implementation of these technologies. At the same time, we are trying to ba carefully balance the security implications of this rather substantial change to the way that domains get displayed in a web browser, which is disconnected from the actual server that's delivering the content for the page. So we just have to be very careful, and we are interested in making this as easily available as possible without actually introducing risk to users. Yeah, sometimes um, change and moving things forward has little bumps in the road, and we're, we're working our way through it. A follow-up to that one is currently signed exchange is only supported in Chrome. Is that going to be brought to other browsers, such as iOS, Safari? <laughs> so uh, I'll answer it specifically for iOS, Safari. And I mean, obviously, there, so there's no one from Apple here. <laughs> and if there was, they would say that they don't com comment on future product launches. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that's... <laughs> That, that's just the, the reality. Um, on the other hand, I think um, one year ago when we first talked about that we wanted to support signing exchanges, uh, we committed as the M team to actually, um, as much as possible, support other browsers in, in, in um, overcoming that substantial lift in, in doing the signing exchange um, uh, implementation. And that is actually work that's already going on. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's also important to recognize that signing exchanges do present a change in 
in the web architecture, and um, it's it's really reasonable for for you know browser vendors to like deeply investigate this and not just say like hey here's a pull request can you can we merge it and they're like <laughs> cool right so this is not you know um, it, like we're um, we're, tr we're trying to engage with browser vendors as much as possible and 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 when I say we that actually so it includes the the M team but even more importantly um, folks on the Chrome team who um, work on the standardization side and on the implementation side. And and to want to uh, and to want to get this done, and then the IETF, which is the standardization organization, who is handling this. Complicated detail, but because it's a networking layer thing, it's not the W3C that usually does web standards. Um, so that's that's also ongoing. Um, so this is there's lots of moving parts. Um, we're optimistic about this, but also you know we have to obviously recognize that it's up to these browser vendors to make the decision um, which features they want to ship. Awesome, that was such a great answer. Thank you. Um, so today we unleashed the Kraken of AMP script, and there's been tons of questions rolling in. And one of those is, what's included in the 150 kilobyte limit in AMP script? And do I need to consider the size of any frameworks like React, Preact, or Vue when working with that limit? This, uh, this question is very near and dear to my heart. Um, <laughs> this is what we talk about when we talk about performance budgeting. Um, a lot in, in my world, um, as well as with the, the Chrome performance dev team. Um, yes, everything is included. That's the, the short and easy answer. Um, and, and very much keep that in mind when you're using something like React, which is actually my go-to. Um, you're talking about 109 uh, kebabytes when, um, uncompressed, which means you have about 41 left for the rest of your application. Um, so definitely put that in, into perspective and, and use, use your tools wisely. Um, see what's available, something, something else that you could maybe switch out for or something that's maybe a little bit too large. Um, it never hurts to shave off, shave off bits here and there. That's all we have to say about AMP script. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so CSS still tends to be hard in AMP. And what do you think is the best way to use CSS? And as the technical steering committee, is there anything you would want to do to make CSS better in AMP development? Uh, yeah, so I, I talked about this. I'm assuming this question is kind of getting at the 50 kilobyte limit. Um, and so yeah, as I said, we're, we're taking an approach where we want to think about CSS like, adapt, like adapting the, the threshold. And so, it'll be based on the idea of utilization. So in other words, if you have high utilization of the CSS, then you'll be allowed to go above the 50 kilobit uh, limit. We initially baked this into AMP, and it's been pretty successful at what we set out for it to do, which is really to kind of get people to think carefully about this stuff. We didn't want sort of CS to, CSS to be added, and then over time you just forget about it, and you keep adding more, and you keep adding more. And that's basically just like stuff that you're making users download that they're never going to have to use it all. Um, and so that's the approach that we have uh, defined. We've actually had this sort of design laid out for a little while, but I think this is going to be the year where we hopefully make this happen. So I actually have a follow-up question for Dima. <laughs> um, <laughs> with Bento Amp, are we going to be able to use um, Bang Important in CSS? Yes. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> uh, that must be very important for some of us to hear. <laughs> oh my god, thank you for laughing. Um, <laughs> So uh, when AMP was first uh, announced to the world, it was built on um, this notion that the web is not very fast. And AMP is uh, based off of its speed. So of course we want to know, will AMP become faster? And how? And how do we measure this speed? I'll try this one. So will AMP become faster? Yes. Um, how? We have several projects ongoing. Um, in particular, I think we really want to get AMP's JavaScript size down, especially the part that um, blocks page rendering. Uh, there's a few things going on, but that's, I think that's the, that's the main one. Um, the, the measurement, so we rely on the same kind of metrics that browsers expose. Um, and, and adding a few on top. So one, one of our key metrics that's um, basically application layer for AMP is that what we call um, first viewport complete. So um, that's a metric that measures for all the AMP components on a page with the exception of ads because we late load, late load those and don't really care when they come. Sorry. 
uh, the, we, we wait for every component in the first viewport to load, and then um, that's like the key moment that we want to achieve as fast as possible. And um, that's something we, we measure and track and has been remarkably stable over the life of AMP. Obviously, AMP has gotten like, drastically more complex in the last three years. And um, those numbers have uh, basically stayed flat and, 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 but also reflect a little bit that infrastructure is getting better over time, uh, which is obviously really nice to see that overall worldwide, the web is like, getting a little bit faster. Um, which is amazing. So speaking of speed, what's going to happen to AMP when we reach 5G? <laughs> so yeah, I'd like to take a, a try to answer this one. I don't think it changes so much because you're still going to have people with limited access to high-speed bandwidth and limited hardware capacity in some places. So as AMP was built for everybody, I don't think we, as a committee, see that changing in, in the near term. So a short answer is nothing changes. <laughs> but uh, of course, it, it, this can be changed in the future. But uh, I think, I truly believe AMP, AMP's purpose is still going to be there for even with higher speeds. I, I think this comes back to the last question as well. Um, what happens when we get to 5G is, well, we keep making AMP faster, um, especially because we, we have to realize that not everyone has access to 5G. Um, there are many parts of the world that are even just emerging onto 2G at this point. Um, and so we're not a single serving, um, we're not single serving um, different markets. We're, single, we're trying to serve everything around the world. Um, and so reaching everybody everywhere is definitely important. As well, there, there are many other things that we need to consider that come with different networks is the latency that provides between them. Um, is 5G actually faster than a stronger 4G connection? That we'll only know when we, we actually measure that and see it in the real world. I think the, oh, sorry. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, with AMP, we were really going after a really differentiated user experience. So not just fast, but instant. And so there's a lot of stuff around AMP that we've just done in service of that mission of how can we try to get more content across the web to be instant. And so signed exchange, we're really excited about that space because it lets us do this in a way um, where you still have like the URLs and things like that uh, from that are from the publisher. Um, and so, you know, yes, 5G is great, but again, like instant is just like this different quality of experience as well. And so we're always going to be thinking about how to invest in AMP to, to get to make sure that that is something that we have being more ubiquitous. I was just going to add that even in places with the most advanced infrastructure, with once that 5G is even widespread in availability, there, are, there will still be widespread impacts to people's user experience, even walking down the street to the actual connection quality that they have. And so a, a slow or lower quality connection is going to be a persistent problem or challenge in the space of wireless connectivity for loading web pages. And I think uh, one, one final point is that um, we're bound by the speed of light. And, <laughs> and the, uh, well, I mean, if you, if you calculate how far away from here a server in the United States is, um, a round trip is about 200 milliseconds, right? It will, we can, I mean, you know, wormholes, blah, 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 but like, it will not get faster than this. And so, um, with 200 milliseconds, if you have n round trips, you very quickly get into very large numbers, right? So the same underlying design that minimizes um, the number of round trips that you need to, to do meaningful progress, um, I think it's here to stay. And it's, it's, it's forward compatible. Um, I was earlier joking about going to Mars, but mm -hmm. like, you know, we'll will, and then um, we'll have the right technology for it. I find it uh, really funny that you say we are bound by the speed of light. Um, and I mean this with all pun intended, that the lightning speed of AMP is quite shocking when you consider that I believe in everybody's lifetime in this room, we all experienced dial-up. <laughs> so uh, I'm very excited to see what the next couple of years will bring. So uh, let's th give a big round of applause for our panelists um, for giving us such great time and great questions.
Uh, and I want to uh, thank all of the audience members here for submitting such great questions for everyone. And I'm so, so sorry if we didn't have time to get to yours in today's panel. Um, you may have another chance tomorrow at the Google panel. So please keep submitting questions to that. Um, a quick reminder, we are going to be back in this room tomorrow at 9 a.m. I know we started at 9.30 today, but there's no registration this time. You're going to come right in. And um, please stick around, because just across where we were serving food, there's going to be a fantastic party. And our panelists will all be available um, for you to speak to and maybe get those questions answered. So thank you so much for coming and giving such a wonderful day one of AmpConf. All right, let's go.